The encounters in this book come with names attached. Tell us a celebrity run in where you're afraid to name who it is. I'm almost positive a certain beloved daytime talk show host once had me kicked out of the backstage dressing room at the Primetime Emmy Awards. I can't prove it, but this person who has short blonde hair has kind of a mean streak that I think all of Hollywood knows about. And now you do. Who didn't make the cut who should be grateful? Neil Patrick Harris. Which entry was the hardest to write about? All right, in all seriousness, I've never told my Night Stalker story before. He's not a celebrity in any positive way, but that case was really well known, and my participation in it is something that has been nothing but embarrassing until now. But what can I say? I was glad to get out of that one alive, and I really mean that one. Alan, Woody, director, writer, actor. I was seated next to him at a small dinner party in November 2014. First impressions. He's quite feeble in person. He mumbles. Obviously, he has been so swirled in controversy. I had my eyes on him the whole evening. The two takeaways are as follows. First, 95% of my time near him that evening was shockingly boring. And second, he said a couple of things that were genuinely shocking. Prior to the dinner, I expressed my discomfort regarding how to handle myself in Alan's presence. Let's just say that while professionally... I'm a fan. Personally, I believe Mia, Dylan, and Ronan. Get it? I know you would. When he walked in with his wife, Soon Yi, he announced, I'm Woody, and this is my child bride. Hmm. Okay. All right. That was a pretty upfront opening joke, I thought. You know, I do love a great opener from a comic. Maybe he'll have a sense of humor about everything in his life and be as candid about it as he was with that entrance line. We all sat down, and the bitter truth was that his child bride remark would be his opening and closing joke. I had questions about his career, like his use of stand-up comedians in various roles, Louis C.K., Ender Dice Clay, Lily Tomlin. I asked him, what was it like directing stand-up comics as opposed to traditional actors? He seemed pretty perplexed by this question. I mentioned that Louis C.K. was great in Blue Jasmine. It was as if he had just been reminded that Louis C.K. was in Blue Jasmine. I wouldn't stop throwing the rod and reel and trying to hook him with any of 20 different topics related to his incredible body of work and all the brilliant people he's worked with. But he sounded more engaged talking about his soup or chicken pot pie, neither of which were particularly funny or interesting. How was I going to get anything insightful out of this living legend? He did describe a typical day to me as essentially getting up, eating, writing, and falling asleep before the end of a Knicks game on television. Reality shows were a no-go as a topic. Smart television didn't work. I mean, supposedly friends with Leah Schreiber, he said he'd never seen a single Ray Donovan. At the end of my rope, I decided to give up on my fishing expedition and just pretend he was completely up on my act regarding pop culture and celebrities and Ask him about things that, like, I knew he would have no clue about. You know, at least I was going to make it fun on my end. So I turned to him, and I said, So, Woody, you obviously asked to be seated next to me so you could gossip about everything going on with Kylie Jenner and Miley Cyrus these days. I mean, I was ready to let fly with another name when he responded to me after a beat that he'd seen every episode of Hannah Montana. Yeah, I'm going to let that sink in a bit. Every episode of Hannah Montana on the Disney Channel. Not only that, he continued by expressing concern about what had happened to Miley regarding her current rebellious phase. Yeah, pick your jaw up off the floor and let that nestle somewhere uncomfortably in your stomach. As I was trying to digest this information, Woody has seen every episode of Hannah Montana, the conversation actually morphed into current events. By the time I had fully recovered from the unexpected Miley bombshell, the dinner was coming to a close. Yes, I know that Woody Allen went on to cast Miley in an Amazon series. Fine. At the end, get ready. Woody said to me, with what seemed to be complete sincerity, and now I have to watch my friend Bill Cosby get railroaded by the media. Abrams, comma, JJ. Professional nerd, needs a hit. Okay, all you straight male geeks and straight boyfriends slash husbands, 
secretly leafing through this in the bookstore or sneaking a peek while your better half, because she's a fan of mine, is out of the room, guess what? I'm on to you. All right, so I put your precious J.J. Abrams in here so I could talk to you directly. Put your robot toys away and turn off your damn Ashley Madison browsing and wise up. Now to your good stuff. Your precious J.J. was my student at the L.A. Improvisational Theater Group, The Groundlings, before anybody knew who he was. We even used to double date. (laughs) No, that doesn't mean that your precious J.J. got anywhere near my girl parts. It meant that we were the third wheels in trying to get his buddy Greg Grunberg to find true love with my buddy Nancy Dye. That connection never happened. But since J.J. went on to marry someone named Katie, which is pretty much the same as Kathy, it's obvious he's still in love with me. (sighs) Just deal with it. It happens a lot. The best thing about knowing J.J. back in the day before he became a screenwriting wonderkind in his 20s, and then his brain and talent became clouded with meaningless shit happening in space, or whatever he does, was that he used to work for his TV producer dad, Gerald W. Abrams, at his dad's company, Phoenix Entertainment Group. And J.J. was the um, phone girl. Yeah, the phone girl. I would call him there back in the day just to bust his balls. Ring, ring, Phoenix. Hi, it's Kath. I'll take a coffee, black, two cubes, have it on my desk in five. Do you have a tight dress on today? I would call him Junior Jer, even though he wasn't technically speaking a junior. By the way, I call him Junior Jer to this day, even though he's insanely wealthy and influential and a big deal with galaxy-worshipping losers like you guys, I consider it my duty to give him shit about his big movie directing jobs. In December of 2015, I referred to his new Star Trek movie, and he wrote back, It's Star Wars! (laughs) Like, there's a difference. Isn't that cute? I also regularly chastise him for not making movies for Lifetime, since they're actually about important topics like suburban sexting and Christmas weddings. Stop almost vomiting and get this. He's so super nice to me anyway that he routinely sends me emails saying he hopes I'm doing well and to give his love to my mom, Maggie. And after my last New Year's Eve telecast on CNN, he wrote the sweetest note in which he said, man, nobody can carry four and a half hours of live TV like you. That means he's watching me on New Year's and not wasting his time with a movie about some dumb shootout on a planet made of, you know, lucite or whatever. No, I haven't seen Star Trek The Fierce Awakens yet, but, all right, I know that's not the title. I love that title, Star Trek The Fierce Awakens. Anyway, I'm sure it's very good, and J.J. was always talented, but when Friendship Kills Good, which is an excellent Lifetime movie, I I don't know if he has the chops for Lifetime just yet. Good luck, J.J. Allie, comma, Kirsty, actress, Scientologist, fluctuator. I've known Kirsty for a while. She even cast me on her TV Land show playing myself, and we had fun. But I will always cherish the moment we shared backstage at the Today Show. She had yet again secured another contract with Jenny Craig and had lost 50 pounds. So she was skinny Kirsty once more. Not my favorite Kirsty, by the way, if anyone cares. Anyway, we're in the wings together, and I was scheduled to go on after her. And whenever she sees me, she calls me Kathy Griffin. She talks really fast. This time she decided to play the nervous celeb. So she goes, what are you going to say about me now, Kathy Griffin? God only knows what you're going to put in your comedy routine now, Kathy Griffin. So I sat next to her, and when she pulled out her iPhone, I noticed it had a big spider web of cracks, and I, I knew I had something. Well, your cracked iPhone isn't helping. My God, you're Kirstie Alley. You can afford to have one of your assistants or Martians from your so-called religion get you a new iPhone before Matt Lauer sees it. Because guess what the first sign of crazy is? A cracked iPhone. Admit it, whenever you see a friend with a cracked iPhone, you instinctively think, hmm, everything okay at home? She immediately began yammering, oh, why did I let Kathy Griffin see my cracked iPhone? Grr. So she turned it on, and the first thing I see is the weather app showing the temperature in freaking Clearwater, Florida for the next seven days. Okay, in case you didn't know this, Clearwater is the hub of Scientology. Not the weather where she lives, mind you, but where her, you know, nutty, culty religion operates. I said, wow, you're in deep, babe. You got to know the weather and clear water on your cracked iPhone every minute? If you don't, what happens? You clean toilets for a month? Kiersey was watching my lips move, but I'm pretty sure she doesn't really pay attention to anything I say anymore, period. She had an exasperated look on her face and may have uttered a slight sigh of despair, but she was in game mode for her interview. I got the impression she neither had the time nor the inclination for any lengthy banter with me at that moment. Yeah, you know what I do? I get them while they're vulnerable. 
I don't censor myself around the likes of a Sai Tai like Kirstie Yell anymore. And by the way, Sai Tai is an expression I stole from my friend Kristen Chenoweth. She kind of invented it. Anyway, what's the point, really? I mean, Kirstie just guffaws along with it now. You know, I guess when you're in a alleged cult that makes you do manual labor for a week or whatever to atone, what Kathy Griffin has to say is seriously not your biggest issue. Anderson, comma, Pamela, Baywatch babe, platinum Canadian. Many people assume that celebrities all know each other, and there's a slight truth there in that two famous people who've never met but who obviously know about the other because they're famous can oftentimes jump right into a familiar-sounding rapport. In my case, when I'm presented with a chance to talk to a celebrity, I do what I call pulling a Pam. No, not that, you perverts. It comes from this. One night at a fundraiser hosted by VH1 at the trendy, but now closed, Hollywood Eatery Geisha House, I was looking for a place to sit, and I noticed Pam Anderson and Kid Rock in a booth. It must have been that one, you know, happy day in their tabloid-covered, tumultuous relationship. Remember, they did get married on a yacht, and Pam was in a bikini wearing a sailor cap. I'm not sure if Kid Rock was wearing uh, Confederate flag boxers or briefs. I think it was one or the other. Anyway, there they were, and I said to myself, Oh, Pam's here. I'll go sit with them. I squeezed in next to her, and I said, Pam? She said, Oh, hi, Kathy. Good to see you. We hugged. She said, Do you know Bob? I said, Of course. Hi, Bob. Kid Rock turned to me and muttered, Hey, Kathy. We had a perfectly pleasant evening. As I went home, I thought, Oh, wait a minute. I've never met her or Bob. In my twisted mind, I had taken the fact that Pam and I share a business manager as a form of knowing her. Well, I mean, I knew her about as well as you know Pam Anderson, and you certainly wouldn't walk up to her and go, Pam? Well, what do I know? Maybe you would. I was unconsciously playing a form of that celebrities know each other game. I'd close some formality in my head. We share a CPA, so we're pals. So I could just go, hi, Pam. Hi, Bob. I mean, I didn't know Kid Rock even went by Bob. His name, by the way, is Robert James Ritchie. By the way, that would not have been a very good opening for the rap mega hit, Bob da Ba. But since nothing happened, Pam and Bob didn't kick me out of the booth. So now I just think pulling a Pam is a perfectly reasonable way to insert myself into the orbit of a famous person I want to meet. All right, let's play this hand out. Barack? Your holiness? Malala? Great to see you again. Baldwin, comma, Alec. Actor, intellectual, and Joshua Rush from Knott's Landing. I have so much gratitude for Hollywood Squares, I can't even quantify it. Don't be hating on that show. How else are you guaranteed to meet eight celebrities a week? Whoopi Goldberg was the center square for a lot of the tapings I did, because the center square is reserved for the biggest star, right? So one time I did it, and Alec was the center square. And when I met him, he initiated what I now call the A-list celebrity preemptive strike. So Whoopi was on vacation. Alec is there. All right. So the nine of us squares were backstage waiting to be introduced so we could walk out and climb the truly rickety ladder onto our box in the squares, right? I felt as if it were the same ladder that Paul Lind may have vomited on decades earlier. I hoped, but I digress. Suddenly, Alec Baldwin pulls me aside. It's already disarming enough when a gorgeous guy grabs you and whispers in your ear. But then he said in that delicious baritone of his, I think you're both one of the sexiest ladies out there and one of the funniest. You got me. I mean, he laid it on thick. Well, of course, I melted. And then I realized, hey, he thinks by saying that I won't turn anything he says and does into material. <laughs> so I pulled myself together and I said, you know, thanks, but you're still in the act. Now when I see him, he like practically noogies me. He makes no pretense about it. I go, Baldy, what's up? He'll say something like, hey, the corner's missing a hooker. You're late. He doesn't even try to be the seductive gentleman anymore. He's like, hey, honey, how much you make last night? What's some fair market price for uh, between the legs going? I mean, it's, I guess it's horrible and inappropriate, but he's so funny. I just, I can't help it. And he's so crazy smart and he's such a good actor. I'm not going to be offended. It's certainly not lost on me that he's probably given that exact come on to countless women for various reasons. In my case, hey, he was a good-looking movie star trying to use his charm to score some points and hopefully, you know, keep me from skewering him. Instead, he gave me the phrase, the Alec Baldwin preemptive strike. Take that, situation room. Barrymore, comma, Drew. Actress, Barrymore. This is one of the examples I often give about how I kind of walk the line between deepening a friendship with a celebrity or not. 
Several years ago, during the years of my life on the D-list, out of the blue, I get a call from Drew Barrymore's gay assistant, who probably got my number from the gay phone book, letting me know that Drew was having a theme party and I was invited. It was at her home, which I remember thinking was surprising. I was being invited to an A-lister's house. But she was apparently a fan or at least didn't loathe me, so I was excited. Excited but apprehensive. After all, it would be packed with stars. Probably from my act. And if I were to go to her party, I mean, whatever happened there wouldn't stay there. This was, if I recall correctly, an 80s prom theme, and I vowed to wear as little as possible that was theme-oriented. I probably had, you know, a cardboard tiara or something. Areas were cordoned off, which is a bummer because, of course, I wanted a self-guided tour. Anyway, the celebrities were indeed there, including, oh God, it was packed. Parker Posey, Molly Shannon, Eva Mendez, I mean, too many to remember. Courtney Love was there with her prom date, the famous photographer David LaChapelle. I mean, it made me not want to leave, I can tell you that. Well, eventually Drew came up to me and she said, oh, I'm so glad you came. And I said, I'm actually surprised you're letting me loose around all these celebrities. She goes, look, we should have dinner sometime. I love you. This is a big party, but I have these eight-person dinner parties and I'd love for you to come. We hate all the same people. And I said, yeah, but I actually say their names on television. Drew gave a quick giggle and turned and waved a Parker Posey. I mean, she was in full-on hostess mode. While I appreciated her declaration that she and I hated all the same people, I actually hear that a lot from celebrities. What they don't realize is, due to my stand-up comedy disorder, when I'm dishing the dirt with someone, whether it's, you know, my mom Maggie or Drew Barrymore, my brain processes everything we talk about as potential material for my act. It's just how my brain works. So now when I run into her, she's super friendly, but I never got that dinner invite. And I think she and I would agree it was probably the best outcome for both of us. Beatty, comma, Warren. Shampoo, rinse and repeat. I've been invited to birthday parties, and I've been invited to birthday parties. At Jane Fonda's epic 75th birthday, I knew it was going to be wall-to-wall legends, so I hoped and prayed my table would be well-stocked with screen legends. Now, at catered parties like these, in which you can choose where to sit, I like to go for the one right near the buffet table. That way, I basically have a ringside seat because, hey, everybody has to eat at some point. And then Barbara Streisand walked in. Mm Mm-hmm. For me, even in this room filled with celebrities, Barbara Streisand's presence alone conjures three thoughts immediately. She's unapproachable. She's royalty to me. And yet when I looked at her, she's like a real person. And I almost fainted when she sat her real person ass down at my table. Gasp. Eva Longoria, who I've known for years and who has also seen me, um, in action— was seated next to me, and she gave me a look she likes to give in social situations in which she is worried about my behavior. It's a serious stare that just says, behave, it's dry sand. So, you know, I just turned to Eva, and I kind of give her like, I know, I know. Catherine Keener, the great actress, was also at our table. So the three of us started up some, like, easy chatting. And what do you know, dry sand threw out a, hello, what? Now that that gate had been opened, I darted in. Look, It's not like I taped this conversation or something, all right? So just so you know what follows is to the best of my recollection. I turned to Streisand, and I go, you know, I'm trying to make a laugh, right? Look, Barbara, I said, here's the thing. I know you want to sing People, and Happy Days Are Here Again, and that one from Yentl about your dad, if he can hear you or not. How about if we all just get the night off for once? You know, I know you only show up at these parties if you can sing for free, and then, you know, you make us wait, and then we have to resort to begging you and reassuring you that you'll be just fine without the band. But for God's sake, honey, give me a minute before we have to get you up on this cocktail table so you can start doing your uh, funny girl medley. And then I paused. And then the fear set in. Eva morphed her warning face into a much more threatening, you're going to die look. And then Streisand laughed. I couldn't believe it. Oh, sure, you know me. I just turned to Eva, my eyes all triumphant, my smile saying, is there a problem? Then Warren Beatty strolled up, looking like the movie star that he is. I couldn't resist acting like I knew him, you know me, and I just went, Beatty? Hello there! He was wearing jeans and a shirt as if he had just stepped off the set of shampoo, albeit 30 years later, but just as gorgeous, still rocking the feathered hair. And he said, what's going on at this table? And I said, well, Barbara is rehashing that story about how you always claim to have hooked up with her in the back of a car. Beatty took the bait. I thought we did. Streisand starts shaking her head. Warren, I'm not going to have this fight with you again. 
We never hooked up. No, Barbara, I think we did, Beatty said. I think we're coming back from that little club in the Catskills. Well, I realize these two have probably known each other since the early 60s. I mean, he's going way back, and he's bringing up all these details like it happened yesterday. And then Beatty says, no, no, I think there was a time when you got a little handsy with me in the back seat. He says that to Streisand, right? And she's casually eating, just adding a little, no Warrens, no, no Warrens. I'm sorry. Then freaking Sean Penn appears. And of course, I turn to him and I go, Penn? Warren is bragging about his conquests. When are you going to start rattling off your list? So Penn goes, well, I'm not going to start with my (laughs) ex-wife. So I just go, well, that was your fuck up. I agreed. He chuckled a little bit. In all seriousness, no. The rapport between Beatty and Streisand was absolutely adorable, with him trying to start a rumor that he banged her, because, you know, that would only make him look good, let's face it, and her gently beating back his insistent remarks like an expert fencer. And Penn's presence officially kind of made us the cool table for a brief shouting moment. Look, it might have been Jane's birthday party, but all I kept thinking was, happy birthday to me. Fines, comma, Amanda. Actress person of interest. In 2005, my friend Lance Bass produced a movie called Love Wrecked, a cute romantic comedy in which he asked me to take a small role. The movie's big get was Amanda Bynes, who at the time was trying to break out of the tween TV world and into features that would allow her to grow up and be a sexy 20-something. I remember Lance telling me her bikini-clad screen test went really well and she was all grown up now. I didn't get a screen test in a bikini, incidentally, although... I asked for one, like, 42 days in a row. The movie also starred Jonathan Bennett, Chris Carmack, then on The O.C., and Jamie Lynn Siegler, riding high from The Sopranos, and was directed by Randall Kleiser, Grease the Blue Lagoon. So we were going to be spending three weeks in the beachy Dominican Republic, the DR, and the movie took place mostly at a resort. And Lance Bass promises a good time. So knowing his social director skills, I trusted him. And it was really, really fun. Jamie Lynn was put up in this great pad, so her place kind of became like the gathering house. I remember once sitting in that house's master bedroom in front of an old-fashioned vanity mirror, and Amanda and Jamie Lynn stormed in, all high energy and really cute, and started asking me all about facelifts and plastic surgery. So feeling a little bit like their den mother, I said something along the lines of how it was okay to get a little work now and then, but neither of them had the facial structure that would ever require serious face work. I remember them dancing around the house afterwards yelling, Kathy Griffin says we don't need face work. Kathy Griffin says we don't need face work. And she knows all about that. (sighs) It's good to be king. Anyway, Amanda's parents and sister were there, and they all stayed in this incredible house with a housekeeper, a chef, and a pool. We only ever really hung out there maybe like twice, but what I recall is that Amanda was the consummate young professional, working very long hours, long days, and being all business. The thing that struck me about her had to do with a local village puppy that she took in, which was really great, right? I went to her house one day, and she introduced me to a six- to eight-week-old puppy by saying, have you met peanut butter? I said, um, no, how did you get a dog into the country? Aren't there quarantine laws? She explained that peanut butter was a stray, and she seemed happy to have this adorable puppy keeping her company. I said, great. I mean, hey, dogs are wonderful to have around and have been known to calm many a stressed-out actor at the end of the day. Amanda kept peanut butter at her rented mansion while she filmed all day. And I remember how attentive Amanda and her family were toward the puppy. It was all about peanut butter. Then, after my last day on the movie, I said goodbye to Amanda. And I said, so, how are you going to get peanut butter from the Dominican Republic to your house in Hollywood? She told me she was just leaving peanut butter there. Hmm. So I asked her, well, who's going to take care of that eight-week-old puppy? She told me she left peanut butter with the housekeeper. I guess I should have said something to broaden her animal sympathies a bit. (laughs) Maybe something like, Amanda, what do you think is like really going to happen to peanut butter? Do you really think that the temporary housekeeping woman hired for a movie is going to continue nurturing peanut butter for the rest of his life? (laughs) You don't think maybe that dog is headed, you know, straight for a DR puppy mill? When I brought this up to her in a softer way, it didn't seem as if this question had occurred to her. 
that was a you know a little bit of a red flag for me that you could love and care for and feed and bond with a puppy for weeks and then just leave it behind for the housekeeper, which let's be real, probably wasn't going to continue to live in that fancy house. So yeah, at the time, a fun girl, hard worker, and talented actress, but dog rescuers might need to put her on a watch list in Santo Domingo. As for peanut butter, his whereabouts are unknown. Cher. Singer, comma, actress, comma, Cher. You're going to get a call from Cher. That was Rosie O'Donnell's phone call to me. Just a few days prior, Rosie O'Donnell had taken me backstage at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas to meet the one-of-a-kind superstar. When you meet someone who is not only one of the most famous people on the planet, but also famous in part for the way he or she looks and presents themselves, you kind of tend to give that person the once-over. Yeah, that's right. Little, freckly, pale Kathleen Mary Griffin from Forest Park, Illinois, is standing next to Cher. And she did not disappoint. Cher was in her full, just like Jesse James, getup. Blonde wig, Navajo belt, puffy shirt. You know, believe it or not, when I meet a star of this magnitude, like sometimes I'm not the obnoxious trouble starter that you may think I would be. On this night, I was happy to just sit back and observe. We sat on a cozy sectional backstage in her dressing room. I was impressed by how quickly Cher was able to go from show mode into real person mode. I know you're laughing at the idea that I just called Cher a real person, but damn it, she was relaxed and laughing and eager to chat about politics, touring, and a little showbiz gossip on the side. There's something I'm going to call the Cher factor. Not to be confused with anything resembling the Fox News Bill O'Reilly show, because Cher would hate that, which means you really can't forget that it's Cher when you're in her presence. You don't even want a reminder of Fox News, frankly. Anyway, it was a great way to meet Cher and spend time with her. But now she was going to call? Oh, God, did I say something? I asked Rosie. She said no, that Cher wanted my number because she wanted to get together. Then Rosie goes, just remember, no matter what, she's always fucking Cher. Many years into my friendship with Cher, I can tell you that Rosie was right in the best possible way. Sure enough, my phone rang, and then somebody was doing a very good Cher impression. Kathleen, this is Cher. To which I responded, um, yeah, hi, uh, Cher. Um, this is awkward. I'm too famous for you to call my cell phone directly, so would you mind having your assistant call my agent first? She laughed. (laughs) And a friendship was born. The first time Cher invited me to hang out with her and watch a movie at her house, I'm sorry, her castle, She instituted the signature share policy. Okay, so if you come over to my house, it's a no makeup and sweatpants kind of night. I don't feel like getting all done up tonight, even though I am fucking share. By the way, when you hear this, just know that my share impression is a great source of embarrassment for share. I think it's great. But anyway, to be friends with her is to know that she is going to proclaim, I'm fucking share, several times in one sit down. Ever since that first phone call, I've always been cognizant of wanting to make her giggle. I can't help it. I believe I responded with something like, well, I'm fucking Kathy fucking Griffin, fucking Cher, and I'll come over in my sweatpants fine. I just don't want you to lose your shit when you see me arrive in my very expensive and paid off Maserati. Without missing a beat, and this is one of my favorite things to do with Cher, she returns the volley every time. She said, oh, okay, I'll alert the staff. There's a crazy bitch named Kathleen coming over. Cher likes to call me by my baptismal name. Look, there's so much I can tell you about Cher, and I know you want to hear everything, but let's just get to my arrival in her bedroom. I mean, I can hear her now. Bitch, you did not just tell people you were taking them into my bedroom, Kathleen. But let's turn back time, shall we? There I am holding a gift bag in one hand and my phone in the other. I was left to wander her Cher Vatican-like compound, yelling, Cher, Cher, where are you? At the top of my lungs. It's me, Dorothy. I'm here to see the Wizard of Oz. All of a sudden, I hear, Kathleen, is that you? I'm up here. I walk up the stairs, and I was blinded by the reflection, bouncing off her Academy Award and Golden Globe Award on the shelf outside her bedroom door. I'm coming, I said. I just don't want the Oscar to hit me on the head on the way in. I heard, Cher's laugh is delicious. It's a little bit of a combination of a hacking cough and involuntary exhalations of joy. I walked into her bedroom suite, 
which is her sanctuary and is also larger than most people's homes, and saw Cher in sweatpants and no makeup. Guess who's still very, very beautiful without makeup? Yeah, and has the body of a 25-year-old and loves a casual pair of sweatpants with a matching bedazzled lime green hoodie. Fucking Cher. The first thing I noticed was her hair. It's real. Thick, long black hair that's parted and halfway down her back. So naturally I said, nice wig, very natural. Her response, this isn't a wig. My wigs are way better than this. What? Her real hair is Cher hair. And that's not the only thing that's real. She's real. Dare I say normal-ish? Well, as normal as you can be when you're Cher calling C-SPAN at three in the morning as, quote, Cher from Malibu, I suggest you look that up. I brought her a re-gift that night. You know, when someone gives you something, you leave it wrapped, then you give it to someone else and tell them you bought it. I said, here, this is a re-gift. I don't even know what it is. It's probably nice. She goes, what's a re-gift? I laughed and I said, how did you survive all these years without my expert celebrity guidance? She responded, because I'm fucking Cher. Another time, she invited me over to try to watch a movie again. Um, by the way, you can watch a movie with anybody, but I'll be honest, if I'm alone with Cher, I want to talk. So by now, Cher had become a Twitter darling, and that meant that pictures were on the table. Yes. So in response to our followers, we decided to live tweet our visit. You're welcome, America and Indonesia, where I'm very popular at four in the morning. This was going to be a case of the blonde leading the blonde, or for our purposes, the blind leading the dark lady. We're not exactly IT experts, but, you know, we knew this wasn't going to be a makeup-free night after all. So I said to her, our fans demand glitter right now. Do you happen to have any? Cher responded, you know where to find it. Cher was referring to her bathroom. Bathroom's the wrong word. Hold on. Um, it's basically a second bedroom with a sink in it. That's how big it is. I ran down the hall past the walk-in closet and attacked her makeup department. Yeah, I use the word department because hers rivals Sephora. I pulled out one drawer and <laughs> there were hundreds of pairs of eyelashes in various sizes. I yelled at her, do we want natural or full drag? At the same time, we responded. She said, natural. I just went full drag. All right, perfect. I pulled out the drawer below the eyelashes, as well as the drawer below that, and I yelled, slight shimmer or full glitter? Once again, we responded in unison, saying different things. She said, shimmer, and I said, full glitter. I re-entered the room with two arms full of gay, I'm sorry, two arms full of LGBTQIA. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I dumped the makeup on her nightstand, and I said, have you ever applied what's called theatrical makeup before? I mean, do you know what you're doing? She said, Jesus, Kathleen, you emptied my whole sparkle drawer. I said, don't worry. I've already tweeted to the world that you have something called a sparkle drawer. You're ridiculous, she replied. The light's better if you lay down. I blurted back, I want to look like a gypsy, a tramp, and a thief. <laughs> As Cher was doing my makeup, we alternated between giving each other crap for no reason and Cher dropping pearls of wisdom in her inimitable style. Like stuff like... No matter how old I get, I still feel 21. That's always stuck with me because I truly feel the same way. Anyway, we talked humor, politics, history, people we know in common, men, and when men are boys. What it's like to be a woman in show business, a woman of a certain age in show business who's still fighting the good fight. After Cher finished my makeup, she proclaimed, Okay, Kathleen, you're very sparkly. And then I said, Your turn. Well, she didn't go for it. I do my own. I'm not letting you do my makeup. I said, fine, but at least do the full moonstruck. Once the final lash was applied, I raided her closet. She said, of course, her warning, don't steal anything, bitch. I said, just a couple of furs and two pairs of shoes, that's all. We live tweeted our photo shoot from her bedroom. She even let me wear the original fur vest from the I Got You Babe days with Sunny. Come on. Of course, the conversation went back to that era, and she said that whenever she hears a ghostly creak in her house, she'll just go, oh, Sonny's here. I've been there. We'll be sitting there, and there'll be like a noise, and she'll just be like filing her nails, and then she'll go, it's Sonny. And I disagree. After hours of modeling, friendship, and fabulousness, I headed for the door to say goodnight. Cher had one more pearl of wisdom for me before I left. Remember, Kathleen, no matter how old you get, your boyfriends can never be older than 35. And those are words I live by. 
Sometimes I reach out to Cher if I have said something in the press that will, you know, get me in trouble or let her know that I've done something again that's considered too far. She'll text back something like, keeping your cool isn't your most fabulous attribute. Blowing it is. Come on. Now I can say anything. By the way, we never did get to, like, watching the movie. And I kind of hope we never do. Call for comma Chris. Actor, author, hope for gay mankind. Chris Colfer is so wonderfully talented, deserving of his Golden Globe and Emmy nominations and wins for Glee, and I just love that he's also a best-selling author. He's a great kid, guy, man. But he and I share something else that I especially cherish, which is we love people over 80. When he was a guest on my talk show, I asked him if he could be on with anybody else, whom would he choose? And he said, Angela Lansbury? He openly mourned the loss of Elaine Stritch, and I was like, okay, This kid respects the greats, and he knows his classics. He's working on a frickin' Noel Coward biopic, for God's sake. I wasn't surprised then to show up at his house for a backyard pajama party movie screening decorated with outdoor sofas and a popcorn machine and see one of my favorite octogenarian stars, June Squibb, Academy Award nominee for Nebraska. So she's there wrapped up in a blanket. Hi, June. Hi, Kathy. The movie that night was the memorable 80s campy wet dream Mommy Dearest, with Faye Dunaway chomping everything in sight as the legendary Hollywood diva Joan Crawford. Colfer had indicated that talking to the screen and editorial comments were encouraged. Great. I saw Jane Lynch there, so I walked up and I said, Jane, let's be the Greek chorus. These kids here don't know what they're in for. Let's show them how it's done. Jane and I had a blast yelling out mystery science theater style jokes. When it was over, Colfer comes up to us. And with absolutely no irony in his voice, he says, Can you believe that when this film came out, it got a Razzie? Razzies, or the Golden Raspberry Awards, are the notorious prizes given out each year for the worst films, and Mommy Dearest pretty much swept in 1981. Jane and I looked at each other and then realized he wasn't kidding. Uh, yeah, Colfer, I can believe it, because this movie is terrible. Colfer was having none of it. I mean, is Faye Dunaway not amazing? Jane and I could not stop laughing, but you have to love Colfer's enthusiasm, you know, misguided as it was. He probably hosted, like, glitter parties where all his young pop culture-obsessed friends openly bemoaned it not having won a dozen Academy Awards and maybe a Peabody. (laughs) Incidentally, Colfer is so freaking charming, he probably could have gotten Faye Dunaway herself to come over and cuddle with you and Squibb. Then he would have had at least one more in his corner defending this hot mess of a movie. Collins, Jackie. Author, confidant, panther. I miss my friend Jackie. I just loved her. We became close after she appeared on My Life on the D-List, and the clincher was just after I'd gone through a really rough breakup, and she magnanimously agreed to give this sobbing red-haired girl some time at her home. I mean, she became that kind of friend. That day, she told me, You can't have your heart broken by one man, darling. There's a man for every occasion. There's not a void that can't be filled with one or more. Don't feel you ever have to fall in love with just one person again. Fall in love with two or three or four people. Have boyfriends for different occasions. You could have a traveling boyfriend. I mean, she was so great that way. Whether we were sitting one-on-one in her backyard or out on the town at Craig's restaurant, Jackie was always in full hair and makeup. She really did live the drama of her characters, and she was the real deal in that way. She was also my world traveling friend. One night, I had a show in Melbourne, or Melbourne, Australia, and she happened to be on a book tour, one of her many book tours. So she came to my show, we had dinner, and we laughed the night away down under. Wait, wait, I don't mean that. Although, if I were a genuine St. Angelo, it probably would have been like, you know, down under. Another time, my boyfriend and I went to Hawaii for Christmas, and coincidentally, Jack-Jack, as she was known, rented this gorgeous house on the beach with her kids and grandkids just down the shore from the hotel we were staying in. I thought I might see her, like, you know, once during the vacation, because she was the type of person, whether it was Australia or Hawaii, sometimes we would just find out we were in the same place, like, on that day, right? So I thought if I just run into her once, I'll be lucky. Well, she basically ended up adopting my boyfriend and I. I think we went to Jackie's house four times in one week swimming, laughing, gossiping, and she was always the first to whip out her cell phone camera and start taking pictures or video at will. I had no idea, truly, that Jackie had been battling breast cancer for years at that point. 
I'm so glad she posted those photos on her social media of the two of us at Christmas. Of course, I have several more of my own. One time when I hosted a dinner party at my house that included Jackie, Sidney Poitier and his wife Joanna, Suzanne Summers and her husband Alan, I marveled at how they had all known each other for so long. You know, I even turned to Jackie and I said, how do you guys all originally know each other? I'm obviously kind of the new one in the group. Without hesitation, Jackie joked, oh, darling, it was the 70s. We all knew each other from three ways. Well, everybody at the table laughed, including the globally renowned trumpeteer Chris Bodie, who, by the way, looked back at me as if to say, are they being for real? I was like, yeah, I think so. When I saw how long Jackie's friendships with people were, it gave me a secret thrill because I wanted to believe that she and I would have a relationship like that, deep, lasting, real pals. And guess what? We did. Right up until the very end. Cooper, comma, Anderson. Newsman, partner, catalog model. I know you want to hear what really happens off camera and during the commercial breaks with your beloved Anderson Cooper on CNN New Year's Eve during our live broadcast. I call it CNN's Kathy Griffin, soon to be Emmy nominated for Best Variety Special with special guest Anderson Vanderbilt. Special. Nothing made me prouder than when Anderson was asked about doing New Year's Eve Live with me, and his response was, I sweat more with Kathy Griffin than I do when under fire in Jalalabad. (laughs) Oh, feel free to look up any of our greatest hits moments online, but keep reading and feel free to tweet him, at Anderson Cooper, to confirm what you're about to read here. I met Anderson in 2001 when he was a guest, not once, but twice, on my MTV Way Ahead of Its Time series called Kathy's So-Called Reality, and we've been friends ever since. Now, in those days, I had my mom and dad as regulars on the series, because you guys know they're funny. So when Anderson showed up, he didn't even have his full silver fox gray hair yet. Yeah, I knew him before his hair was gray. He was shy and sweet and especially respectful of my mom and dad, so of course I instantly fell in love with him. My mother was nervous to even talk to him because she is such a fan of Anderson's mother, living legend, Gloria Vanderbilt. I admit, I didn't even know he was a Vanderbilt the day I met him. But don't worry, I have reminded him of it ever since. Yes, yes, he's Anderson Cooper, newsman extraordinaire. He's the guy you expect to see on location in a war zone, in the tsunami, rescuing a child in Haiti after the earthquake. I get it, he's the real deal. But once a year, purely for your amusement, I'm pretty much the Hannibal Lecter to his Clary Starling. You know, I mean, in a good way, because they did, like, love each other in that movie in a way. Anywho, back to New Year's Eve. It's all about the trickery. So, for the 2015-2016 show, my objective was to wear this Vanderbilt Cooper down to the nub. You know that Anderson has the NYPD pat me down before I'm allowed to get on the riser with him. Yeah. I hope this is not because one year I innocently handcuffed myself to him and threw the key below into the crowd of 500,000 people. I also hope it's not because one year I wanted to make it rain with $5,000 in singles which the producers and the police said would, you know, cause a riot. Whatever. I am far too much of an artiste to be bothered with these details. Anyway, I put a ton of prep work into the New Year's Eve broadcast. Anderson actually finds this hilarious. On air, he's admitted that he just kind of shows up and hopes to survive. I actually think about our show all year long. In fact, I'm plotting right now. My plan couldn't have worked out better for the 2015-2016 four-and-a-half-hour live broadcast. First off, rather than sharing a room at the Marriott with Anderson as we did the previous year, I mean, to get ready, I don't mean sleeping there, (laughs) I insisted he wishes. I insisted on getting a different room to hang out in just to, like, be a diva and see if he would even notice. There's no entourage with Anderson, by the way. It's one of the things I love about him. I've often caught him sitting around just reading, you know, Nietzsche, although I think one time the book was upside down. Anyway, I got a jump start on messing with his mind, knowing he was in the next room, wondering what was going on. I purposely waited in my own room. I swear I would have stayed there until about 30 seconds before we went live if I could. Sure enough, a production assistant came up to me and they go, um, Anderson is just alone in the other room. And I go, good, is he crying? And they're like, no. So I wait 10 more minutes and the production person comes back and they go, Anderson wants to know if he can come over. Well, I finally allowed him into my hotel boudoir. This is maybe a half hour before we're going to go on the air live. He goes, are are we good? Are we cool? What's going on? We got to catch up. All right. So naturally, we had a fast and furious gossip session. 
and I made him call my mom Maggie and say hi. She heard about half the conversation, which also made him uncomfortable, so I'm priming him. I teased him about how challenging his life is and reminded him to just never forget he's a Vanderbilt. He started grabbing his hair nervously. I could tell we were getting into the groove. And then I said, look, I don't think it's a big secret at this point, but I'm going to do something to you on air. And he just said in a defeated way, yeah, I figured. Look, I said, all I'm asking is that you just laugh. All right, I'm not going to, you know, hurt you per se. It's just silly, okay? And if you laugh, you're going to look like a hero. Are you in? Yes, of course, you know I'm in, he said. Then I said, fine, just don't embarrass me. See, I like to like flip it on him. So for our big live on-air walk from the Hotel of the Platform, which CNN had never done before, I had planned to wear a big heavy winter coat and then whip it off and walk through Times Square in, um, I'm going to go with hooker boots, a bikini, and body paint. I was so proud of that moment, especially because I think Anderson, who naturally got embarrassed, thought, oh, okay, well then this is her surprise, so we're done now. Phew! (laughs) So I do my bikini thing, and he thinks we're done with the surprise, and I'm thinking, hardly. I had managed to sneak past the NYPD pat down a couple of plastic spoons from the hotel room for a little something later. At the point in the broadcast when I felt like I had gotten Anderson to a nice and comfortable place, I simply asked him to close his eyes, put these two plastic spoons over his eyes, and simply trust me for 10 seconds. And he did. Yeah, I couldn't believe it either. Then I took a can of the darkest, J-Lo, Dancing with the Stars, shimmery, tanning spray out of my bra and sprayed his gorgeous face live on the air. He took the plastic spoons off his eyes. By the way, even I'm not such an asshole that I'd want to, like, blind him, so I had him put the spoons on, you know, so he wouldn't get sprayed. Okay, so he takes them off, and he looks into the small monitor in front of us where we can see ourselves, and the reaction he had was so genuine. It was epic. He just kept going, wow, Jesus. So I'm thinking, mission accomplished. I also got a little bit of the dark spray tan on his silver hair, which he himself has called his hair the (laughs) moneymaker. But the most important thing is I got the giggle. And you know, that's why you watch. That's why I do it. I'm not going to stop until I get you the giggle. So here's the best part. During the commercial break, my curiosity got the best of me. Now, I want to remind him, you, and the world, once a Vanderbilt, always a Vanderbilt. So I say to him after I've sprayed his face, I go, are you mad at me? You can tell me. Come on. Did I make you mad? This is the commercial break, right? So he assures me he's not mad. And trust me, I love him for that. But of course I had to push it. And I go, all right, well, now that I know you're not mad, I have to ask you. And I know we're coming back live in 30 seconds, but what were you thinking when you had your eyes closed and you knew I was spraying you with something and... I made you cover your eyes with spoons. I mean, I have to know what was going on through your mind. What did you think I was doing? To which he answered, I thought you were hydrating me with Evian spritzer. Now that is some Vanderbilt shit right there. Cowell, comma, Simon. Music impresario, Prickly Brit. Who didn't fall in love with Simon Cowell when he unwrapped those brutally helpful critiques on American Idol? Well, Clay Aiken, probably for one. By the way, who knew Clay Aiken was using American Idol as a springboard to becoming a future politician? A politician, I might add, who ran for Congress as an openly gay Democrat who chose to distance himself from both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. How'd that work out for you? I digress. Back to Simon. When you watched American Idol, I mean, you practically tapped your watch, waiting for Paula Abdul and Randy Jackson to finish so Simon could tell it like it is. Thankfully, I've had many encounters with him, and every time I see him, I try to make sure I get private time. When we were both on the set together for a day-long, non-idle television shoot, the show sent every one of its stars to the same area so we could all sit together and eat lunch, right? So I took him aside and I said, you and I are going to eat alone, sir. In just 30 minutes, I found him to be smart, honest, funny, and dare I say, inspiring? I point this out because often I'm asked about certain celebrities with a certain tone as if to say, oh, that person is so mean, or, oh, you've met so-and-so, how do they sleep at night? These celebrities are the types of people who often turn out to be surprisingly generous or serious or even kind. Simon will let me bust his balls, but he can give it back to you, obviously. I think we kind of speak the same language. The accent almost puts a rosy tint on any of his insults that he tosses off, but, you know, he'll just say things to me like, 
Good to see you. Hideous color dress. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. Boyfriend still lacking a high school diploma? Who doesn't love that? But he's also been like the TV Simon call to me, too, you know, when he's actually in like a legit advice-giving mode. So one time I had just gotten in some kind of trouble for some bullshit, you know, whatever I'd said, and I was simultaneously up for a, like a real job. So I was worrying about the repercussions, and I sought his counsel. And he said, here's the thing, Kathy, what's unique about you, what's going to keep you unique, is that you never hold back, and you must never hold back, ever, no matter how much you get banned from talk shows. You know, he knew I'd been banned, so I was like, all right, he's up on my street cred. And no matter how much a studio head is mad at you. And by the way, Steven Spielberg was mad at me for a year, which I wrote about my last book. And then he goes, you should only ever take jobs where you can be 100% yourself. I never want to see you watered down in any way. That's the thing I want you to keep doing. Keep being fearless and don't worry about being in trouble because the people who are successful are always in trouble. Well, what I loved about that was that, you know, it wasn't the blind, like, you get him, girl, say whatever, support that you get from, like, a friend. It was advice with context from a kingmaker who knows something about why people succeed and why other people don't. And he ended his advice with, the last thing you should be is just anybody. And then he went off to count his money. I mean, I can't prove he did that, but I think I saw thousands of gold Krugerrands just flying out of his ass as he walked away. Cranston, comma, Brian. TV dad, TV drug dealer, unaware source of lasting personal embarrassment for me. The year was 2008. It was my third year in a row as an Emmy nominee for My Life on the D-List. The year after, I won it for the first time. And I was feeling pretty good the night of the ceremony. Being a previous Emmy winner will do that for you. I highly recommend it. I was in my seat, and I looked across the aisle, and who do I see but Brian Cranston? Now, I've known Bri since he played the dad on Malcolm in the Middle. As long as I've known Brian, he's been respected and known as a hardworking actor's actor who people are always pulling for. Only now, that year, I look across, and he's bald. He's wearing this ridiculous hat. He looks pretty skinny. And I'm thinking, oh boy, Brian Cranston has really let himself go. As in, clearly, you know, this guy has not worked in a long while. I mean, I felt terrible. If he's sick, that's one thing. But did he go through all that Malcolm money so quickly he can't even afford a toupee? <laughs> Ouch. You have no idea where my mind was going. Is he living in Jane Kaczmarek's spare room? Will I see him at the Laugh Factory soup kitchen next? You know, on the other side? Did the Emmys look at him and think, we've got to give him a pity ticket? You know, I started thinking about what I should say to a colleague who's clearly on the skids and frankly looking awful. Or can you say anything? You know what? I should go over and just hug him, I guess. Although, I'll be honest, I didn't want my top of the world vibe to make him feel bad. I ran through an approach in my head. Hey, hey there, Brian, it's Kath. Good old Kath. Can I give you my number? Look, I know things didn't pan out for show business, but I'm a friend. You call me, because friends are there for you in the down times. All right? And just remember, you were the dad in Malcolm in the Middle. The dad. No one can take that away from you. Those reruns will always be there. Don't hide. That was my speech. And if I'm being totally honest, I thought, you know, maybe he turned down a spinoff or something. Maybe he got lazy after Malcolm. I mean, that's what separates us Emmy winners from the one-and-done Cranstons, hard work. You know, it's sad. Maybe it's a baby daddy situation he's got. Oh, God, he's probably going to cry in my arms. I've got a designer gown on, so I'm going to have to get a hanky from Leah Michelle, lay it across my shoulder. But you know what? That's what you do for the down and out. We stars are not heartless people. Anyway, I won another Emmy that night, and I left without getting a chance to say anything. Is he okay? Anybody? All right, I'll come clean. I now know I was the only person in that room, if not the world, who didn't know that Brian Cranston was in the intense process of playing the iconic role of Walter White. All right, all right. Believe it or not, at that time, I had not even heard of the groundbreaking, multi-award winning, globally watched and beloved series Breaking Bad. I had not seen a single episode. Okay, hear me out. I make a living watching crappy TV. I don't always have time to get to the good TV. I know I'm backpedaling here, but cut me some slack. I get it. 
He is the danger. Crystal, comma, Billy. Oscar host. Comedy legend, Harry. Back in the 1990s, I was relatively unknown. I had a talent manager at a hotshot management house that also handled Billy Crystal. That means this esteemed management company at the time represented the very known Crystal and the very unknown me. One day I was at their offices and I had to use the restroom. My manager said, do you want to use the Billy bathroom? Well, I didn't know what he was talking about. So he goes, we have a bathroom in the office that's just for Billy Crystal. (laughs) I believe my answer was, hell yeah. I was led to a private lavatory just off one of the partner's offices, accessible only with a key. It was relatively small, but it was beautiful and pristine as if it had just been built yesterday and never used. Using it, I did feel extra clean and special. I don't remember if I went number one or two, but I can tell you this. I was a hell of a lot funnier after that bathroom visit. Not long afterward, I was in Aspen at the U.S. Comedy Arts Festival, because at the time, festivals were easier to book than regular gigs. And at one point, I walked into an elevator, and who should be in this tiny, motorized enclosure but the great Billy Crystal and the equally great Bob Costas. I believe Bob was moderating a panel that Billy was on. Now, Billy, he's a super talent, a movie star, and a beloved comedian. He succeeded at everything. All right, but I'm going to keep it real. Billy is not the most approachable star in the world. And yet, sometimes, even he has to deal with sharing a six-by-six-foot hydraulic-operated moving machine, a.k.a. an elevator. And there he was now, arms folded, looking forward. And before I could even say anything, because, you know, I'm usually first, I hear Costas, who I've never met, say, Hi, Kathy. Oh, well, that was super charming and encouraging. Because while it's one thing not to be able to read a room, it's another thing... Well, I didn't really read the elevator right. Just keep listening. So I say hi to Costas, and then I took on some of the frost that was coming from the northwest corner. (laughs) So, of course, I think Billy's a little chilly, maybe. So I decide to do one of my famous icebreakers. Billy, I took a shit in your bathroom. Well, I expected the entire elevator to erupt in laughter. Nothing. No reaction. Billy Crystal is seriously acting as if what I'd said didn't even happen. Like, he's just looking forward. So Costas bursts out laughing, thank God, because, you know, it's outrageous and it's out of context. And it's the last thing obviously expected to hear, so I thought it would be funny. (sighs) Anyway, I'm trying to explain it in case you're not laughing, because Billy wasn't laughing. So then Costas goes, what are you talking about? And then I go, Bob. You didn't know that Billy's got his own freaking private bathroom in our manager's office? And it's gorgeous. I turned to Billy. Billy, I was there just the other day. And I just continued as if the When Harry Met Sally star were actively even participating in our conversation instead of looking straight ahead and ignoring me. Um, you know, Billy, I'm not making the big bucks like you, but I had to use the restroom like anybody else because, you know, when you got to go, you got to go. Hope you're not mad. All right. I was so bad at reading this particular elevator as well as thinking I was being hilarious at the same time. I mean, I did everything just short of saying to Billy, am I right? I mean, it was bad. I might as well have just, like, tried to do a high five that never would have been returned by him. So we got a couple floors to go, and Bob Costas, God bless him, is trying to, like, make this work, right? Because facilitating conversation is, you know, his skill set. So he's saying stuff like, Billy, did you know this? Tell me more, Kathy. I go, well, Bob, you get a key, and off I went. So it was as if Bob thought that this unknown, obnoxious comic was in some way equal to the funniest person on the planet. (laughs) Billy, meanwhile, was still in character as um, the guy who thinks only Bob Costas is on the elevator with him. So when the doors opened, we all exit as if nothing unusual has happened. (laughs) All right, so I got to be honest, though. Chilly Elevator Billy, as I came to think of him, was actually not at all the Billy Crystal I encountered years later when I filmed a cameo for Jason Siegel's Muppets movie. A cameo, by the way, that was regrettably left on the cutting room floor. Okay, that's another story. But later, I get to spend the day with Billy Crystal and Ricky Gervais. And there was a lot of downtime because setting up the Muppets, you know, takes Muppet time. But Billy Crystal could not have been nicer. Shooting the breeze, we're talking comedy. He's letting me take selfies with him. And wouldn't you know it, every time I've seen Billy Crystal since then, he's been incredibly gracious and friendly. So I'm thinking there's no way that he remembered when Billy met Kathy. 
you know, when I think back on the elevator, I think it was more like when Kathy met Bob. Cyrus, comma, Miley. Singer, human wrecking ball. Did you know I could have been on Hannah Montana? Yeah. One of the executive producers was a guy I knew from the Suddenly Susan days, and he came up to me one time and he said, we want to write a really juicy episode for you. It was a giant show at the time, and I was thrilled. Then on national television, when I um, won my first Emmy, I said in my speech, suck it, Jesus. This award is my God now. And all of a sudden, the Hannah Montana people just said, yeah, after that, um, I wouldn't expect the call. <laughs> you know what? Screw you. It was worth it. Damn it. All right. All I can say is post Hannah Montana Miley would have totally gotten the same response from them, you know, with her rebellious phase, if she had had to go back and appear on her own show. All right. This is torture logic, I know, but I don't care. Miley officially made it into my act with that stripper pole while partying in the USA performance at the Teen Choice Awards, which I saw up close and personal, by the way, as a guest. And, believe it or not, a nominee that year. Okay. One time I crashed a pre-performance prayer circle of hers backstage at VH1's Divas Live. And if you haven't heard her pray, it's something like this. Dear Lord God! All right. I don't know why she talks like that. But the point is, she and I have a real history, okay? We did a Rock the Vote campaign together in 2012, and my publicist shrewdly engineered the schedule so Miley and I would cross our paths at the shoot, and we would actually get to do one together, all right? So this would be like real face-to-face time with someone I'd kind of called every name in the book in my act, you know, lovingly. And Miley had just then cut her hair really short and dyed it platinum, right? So I decided to break the ice. I walk into the chute for Rock the Boat, and I see her, and I'm going to make a Susan Powder joke, referencing the self-empowered icon who first became popular when, like, Miley was born. I said something like, what's up, Susan Powder? And then she just responded with, who's Susan Powder? What's that? Hey, it's me, Miley. By the way, she always announces herself, which I find super charming. Like, you could just walk up to her, and after a couple seconds, at some point, she's going to go, hey, it's me, Miley. Anyway, I told her that Susan Powder was a lady who had been wronged by a man and had gotten revenge by getting fit and becoming a motivational speaker and, you know, stopping the insanity in general. And I told her, I said, she had a haircut like yours. And then Miley goes, that sounds really cute. She was really sweet and spunky, bragging about the ring that Liam had gotten her, you know, the first time around, if you know what I'm saying. And I wanted to say to her, look, you're too young to get married to that fucking stiff. I did want to say you should be banging the one who's Thor. He probably has more money. But I didn't. I was on very good behavior, keeping the teasing to a modest level. Better still, I can probably say I saved our photo shoot when it became patently clear that Miley's see-through top was making every picture basically unusable for Rock the Boat. That's right. I turned into Kathy Griffin, Miley Cyrus' savior. At one point, I just had to say it. Um, Miley, honey, no one else is going to tell you this, but none of these pictures are going anywhere because we can all see your nipples. So either put on your effing jog bra or accept that these photos will never get out. So Miley lifts up her top and starts doing a shimmy. Wouldn't you be proud of these if you had them? And by the way, that is how you get me to fall in love with you. So we got the pictures eventually, which is great. And honestly, Miley was super nice the whole time. Then she said the thing that I really thought I was going to avoid. So this whole time, like, when you've been making fun of me, you're just making jokes? I look around, I kind of shrug, and I just go, yeah. And Miley goes, so all those things you said about me, like, you're just trying to make people laugh? And I go, yeah. And then she goes, all right, we're cool. And I want you to know, we've been cool ever since. When I met Hannah and she was still from Montana. Frankly, she wasn't very interesting to me. I have since come to respect her tremendously. I've even seen her sing live several times, and she has a great voice in an industry filled with contemporaries that, you know, don't really have the chops. I just think she's a smart, creative nut job. One time, she squeezed my butt on a red carpet in front of several photographers. You know, because that's what friends do, right? I mean, I am cool with that. DiCaprio, Leo. Actor, activist, manslut. When you have the opportunity to call Leonardo DiCaprio a man whore, you take it. At the Directors Guild of America Awards in 2016, I had the distinct honor of presenting an award, and let me tell you, 
That is some Oscar level shit when it comes to stars. I have never had an encounter with Leo in any way, much less seen him across the room, but there he was at a nearby table with what appeared to be four bodyguards or handlers, and he's glued to his damn phone. So I decided to use my table mate and friend, Lily Tomlin, as my wing lesbian. Wingman. Wing lesbian. So anyway, when Leo walks by, he's got to go backstage to get ready to present an award, right? So I stood up next to Lily Tomlin and I go, Leo, don't be a douchebag. Get off your fucking phone and say hi to the great Lily Tomlin. He either didn't hear me or chose to ignore me. You decide. So I repeated it until he finally turned his head, put his precious phone down, and kindly said hello to Lily. And by the way, he really is gorgeous. Like, he's just as gorgeous in person. All right, so now I have his attention, and I go, Jesus, Leo, don't be a douchebag. So he walks away with that adorable smile, and he looks at me, and he goes, I am kind of a douchebag. Touche, Leo. But agreeing with me only makes me stronger. Lily Tomlin then foolishly asked me to accompany her to the ladies' room. In the backstage hallway, we see DiCaprio with two of his handlers practicing his speech, and I say very loudly for his benefit, I swear to God, Lily, if I see that fucking ass Leo DiCaprio, I'm going to give him a smack in the face. He did manage to look up for a second with an expression of, how should we say, irritation mixed with bewilderment, but I wasn't done yet. You know those movie scenes in restrooms when the timing of a stall door flying open is everything? Well, I emerged from one of the stalls at just the exact moment when the women's room door was opened and Leo DiCaprio is walking right past and accidentally turns his head and looks in. So I flip him the bird and Lily Tomlin's next to me and I just go, Stop staring at us, Leo, you pervert! And the door closes. But I want you to know I was saving the best for last. When my big moment at the podium came and all eyes were on me, and this was a very star-studded room, and I was giving an award to my friend, the great commercial director, Joe Pitka. It was a career achievement award. But I couldn't resist busting Leo's balls because he was pretty much sitting directly in front of me. So I kept stopping my presentation to yell at him to get off his phone and stop swiping Tinder, lovingly referring to him as a man whore. So finally, DiCaprio looks up at me with those gorgeous baby blues, and he does the two hands, the, like, bring it signal. I mean, it's basically as if he just said, bring it, bitch. I continue to let him have it about his damn phone, reminding him that all the women that, you know, you always see him on, like, that boat with will gladly wait for him. I did some slut shaming. I did. Anyway, he took it really well. I mean, he, he actually took it like a champ. He's a brilliant actor, which is why he makes a great target. You know, he's gorgeous. Great target. Obviously, I won him over. I just wish he'd stop calling me. It's getting uncomfortable, and he's a little old for me at this stage of the game. Dickinson, comma, Angie. Ring-a-ding-ding-ringer. Policewoman. Those of you who are old enough might remember Angie Dickinson's memorable ad campaign for California avocados. I do. Her fantastic legs took up most of the billboard as she lay on her side in a white one-piece bathing suit, the caption underneath reading, Would this body lie to you? It made absolutely no sense regarding avocados, but I hear it sold a lot of them. For the longest time, that ad was what sprang to my mind when her name was mentioned. Not her movies or policewoman or even the heartbreaking struggles she went through raising her daughter until I actually met her. Then something else about Angie replaced her visual appeal in my consciousness. I was doing that series. You Remember Celebrity Poker Showdown? So it was a reality game show, and it was on in the mid-2000s, right? So playing at my table were Penn Jillette, Jeff Gordon, Ron Livingston, and the still-smoking-hot Angie Dickinson. I actually call her Dick and Dog. What's funny about me being on competition shows is that I actually try to win instead of approaching it like a chance to have fun. I practiced playing poker around the clock leading up to that taping in Vegas. I don't know why. It was such a stupid waste of time. I mean, what am I going to do? Become a poker player? But in those weeks of prep, I was talking to all kinds of friends of mine that were big poker players and played in regular games. And one of them said something really interesting. One of my bros said, you need to be afraid of Angie Dickinson at that table. I was surprised. The sexy movie star? Not card magician Penn Jillette? or a diehard competitor like stock car racer Jeff Gordon, or a bro actor like Ron Livingston. And he said, think about it. All those nights with the Rat Pack, 
all those times when she was probably the only girl in the suite and how much freaking poker those guys played. I'll bet she's played countless hours with Frank and Dino. If that isn't a masterclass, I don't know what is. Well, guess what? My buddy was right. She was a frightening poker player and she kicked ass. I even said to her right before taping, Dick and Dog, you're the one to watch, right? I mean, did you play with those guys in Vegas back in the day? Angie has always been super sweet to me. She replied that day, though, with no emotion, almost with a frightening tone in her voice. She simply said, every night. Chills went down my spine, as if I'd met a mob boss. Angie Dickinson has more poker experience than Phil Hellmuth. No more avocados and gams when I think of Angie. It's a stone-cold, honey-haired killer staring down some quivering weekend warrior across the table and turning his meager bluff into an excuse to take him for everything he has. Dog, comma, Beethoven the, the shaggy diva, comma, my co-star. I appeared in a Beethoven movie, and if you think I mean the composer, then you don't really know about the kinds of movies that get made nowadays. This was the fifth movie in the eight-film franchise starring the trouble-causing St. Bernard, and the last one to, you know, be any good. How do I know that? Because they put me on the DVD cover, even though I had, like, maybe three lines. We didn't even have Judge Reinhold, who had starred in the third and fourth ones. All right, you know what? That doesn't matter. Because from what I saw on the set the days I shot, the lovable and full-figured pooch got more star treatment than Jennifer Lawrence in The Hunger Games. It was hilarious. Okay, that particular day in Los Angeles, it was a scorcher. And the way it worked on the set was that Beethoven would shoot for, like, 45 seconds at most, and then the director would go, Claire! Clear the set! And then the Beethoven Wranglers ran up to him because, you know, he needed to look perfect all the time. Now, if you didn't know, St. Bernard's are titanic droolers, and frankly, it's their nature. So one guy was on drool towel duty because the director would routinely yell out, I don't want one frame of film with that drool! Not one frame! Another member of this doggy pit crew was the wet towel guy for when BTD, that's what I call him, needed to be cooled down. What's his temperature, damn it? Another wrangler was on brush patrol. Let's go, people. Those ears don't brush themselves. And four others were needed to walk him into a shady part of the universal backlot between takes so he could rest up and gather his, you know, motivation for the next scene. Everyone, please, out of his eyeline. I mean, no disrespect, BTD, but we're not talking like a genius dog here. This wasn't even some specially trained canine who could do tricks. I've worked with those. They can bark three times at a signal. They can tilt their head on cue, play cutesy, whatever. This was a big dopey dog who drooled like a spigot, took craps the size of Montana, and panted louder than a broken air conditioning unit, you know, at Nakatomi Plaza. I mean, that was his acting. Then again, St. Bernard's were bred to rescue people in the Alps. So Beethoven probably took one look at that blazing Southern California sun and just thought, you know, this is crap. Of course I wanted to pet him, right? But honestly, he was treated so royally, I thought I would get thrown down by the Wranglers if I even went near him. I didn't know the protocol for actor dogs, but someone's finally said, sure, you can pet him. I did, and I was slathered in saliva. And then it became, clean up Griffin! Clean up Griffin! But how is Beethoven? How's his temperature? And more importantly, how is his mood? I can only imagine that this is exactly what Francis Ford Coppola had to deal with on Apocalypse Now with Brando. I mean, Coppola's got to have the same exact stories. Efron, comma, Zach. Actor, high school graduate, 12-pack. Sometimes in the excitement of any pre-Hollywood red carpet arrivals process, I need to give myself like a side project. And by project, I mean a new and exciting way I can think of to turn this event into potential material for my explosive, award-winning, and ever-changing comedy act. Go to kathygriffin.com for tickets now. The quest to get pictures with celebrities, or simply to extend my lingering on the red carpet in the glare of the media, is a never-ending strategy of cajoling, cleverness, and outright deceit. One night attending the 2011 People's Choice Awards, as a nominee, I might add, I made it my mission to get super hot guys to let me, um, touch their hair. Oh, <laughs> why do I have to be the one that keeps coming up with these genius ideas that make celebrities fall in love with me even more? I needed a ruse, though, so I came up with this 
crazy story that a fancy art gallery had asked me to contribute to a very high-profile exhibit. I saw the 23-year-old Zac Efron coming toward me, and he was in a perfectly tailored suit and he looked gorgeous. He was even sporting a new haircut, short and buzzed. Perfect. Someone like that, at the height of their fame, wanted by every girl, is a snapshot catch, right? But I needed to be careful with the approach. So I started with a simple, hi, Zach. To him, I'm basically this like old lady he probably feels he needs to be respectful to. So he just goes, hey. And I told him, I'm a nominee tonight. You look great. <laughs> Sticking with the Boy Scout patter, he just goes, yeah, hey, you look good too. I go, of course, lying. I'm doing this art project where I'm supposed to get silly pictures of me petting the heads of some really handsome guys. Can I pet your hair? Beat. He just goes, yeah. The picture was perfect. Zach even gave it this regal sort of like poised touch by looking upward. I knew that my Twitter feed would go bananas, especially from the boys who like boys. I continued my reign of terror. I mean, hilarious comedy hijinks for no one other than myself on True Blood star Alexander Skarsgård, which, by the way, was fun because he's at least around 10 feet taller than I am. So I asked him, you know, about my art project where I can touch his hair and take a picture. He was aloof. Typical fanger. I said, uh, I just finished, Zach. He didn't even say yes or no. His hands were in his pockets the whole time. I just reached up and touched it. Thanks, Eric Northman. And I just moved along. Zach Efron owes me more than a muffin basket. I mean, I truly believe the mere gesture of Ms. Kathy Griffin gently touching his hair, and yes, there are pictures online to prove it, was the night he truly became a man. Yeah, I made it possible for Troy Bolton to become the ripped, shirtless hot guy who barely remembers high school. Emmanuel, comma, Rom, Chicago mayor, ex-White House chief of staff, scary guy. A Washington reporter friend of mine invited me as her plus one to a Washington, D.C. event called the Radio and Television Correspondents Association Dinner, which Vice President Joe Biden hosted. It's not nearly as star-studded as the White House Correspondents Dinner, which I believe I'm currently banned from, which I'd like to host. But anyway, the room was still filled with hundreds of D.C. figures. So, I mean, to me, it looked as if everybody just goes to both events because you kind of saw the same people. There's always a comedian hosting, and the vibe is pretty loose and satirical, so that's fun. All right. Anyway, I was seated next to then-Republican Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown. So Brown, who had just taken the late Ted Kennedy's seat earlier that year, he kind of pulled the Alec Baldwin preemptive strike with me, saying about the comedian that was hosting, Oh, I'll bet this guy's funny, but I wish you were hosting. I'm not fazed by that compliment, nor was I dazzled by his model looks. He actually was a model at one point. But <laughs> remembering how he was referred to by detractors, I did have to give him a little shit about being a model. And I said, it's Ken, isn't it? Or Mr. Doll? Anyway, you should really be happy I'm not up there because, you know, I'm going to give a pretty good performance at this table and it's going to rival anything on stage. I'm going to kill at this table. My reporter pal looked a little nervous, as if she were thinking, oh, God, I am representing my global media outlet. Anyway, I bragged to my table about how I, too, was a legitimate journalist, based on my hard-hitting New Year's Eve coverage on CNN. I gave Scott Brown so much shit, I was, like, practically writing my whole act that night. I noticed at a nearby table, Obama senior advisor Valerie Jarrett was sitting next to Fox News chairman Roger Ailes, who resigned in shame. Well, I can't resist this. So I had met Valerie once before. So I was going to use her as my inroad to confront that fucking scumbag Ailes. So bold as brass, as my mom would say, I went up and I go, hi, Valerie, it's Kathy Griffin. Remember me? So then she goes, of course. Oh, my gosh. Meeting you made me cool to my teenage daughter. The short version, by the way, is at a women's conference. Katie Kirk and I banged on Valerie Jarrett's hotel room door and we were in our pajamas. Katie wanted to interview her. I was just trying to start trouble. The point is, it's all Katie Kirk's fault. Anyway, so I say to Valerie Jarrett, why don't you tell me about your friend sitting next to you? So Valerie goes, Kathy, this is Roger Ailes. I go, hi, Raj. He goes, hello. I go, how's everything going over at the propaganda machine? And then, like an awakened guard dog, a nearby Rahm Emanuel got up and stood right behind me as Valerie Jarrett nervously said, Oh, Kathy, you're so funny. I know what you're doing. You're being a troublemaker. 
Roger Ailes tries to start in on me. He goes, I remember when you were a friend of Fox and Friends. I shot back with, yeah, and I remember when your show, Fox and Friends, was uh, cooking segments and Richard Simmons and I doing jumping jacks. And Steve Ducey was the weather guy and Brian Kilmeade was a sports guy. It wasn't you calling the dogs to war every five seconds. Way to go, Raj. At this point, Valerie tried to escape because I was going in on Ailes pretty hard. But then I felt the firm hands on my shoulder of none other than Rahm Emanuel physically pivoting me away from the table and saying in a very firm way, we are not doing this now. (laughs) I'm laughing, but I was actually kind of nervous. He struck me as a man who was obviously in a position of power in that room and at that moment, you know, and I got the impression he was a seasoned pro at encounters like this. And that would include, you know, the president's advisors, or maybe me and Roger Ailes. To this day, I can't tell you if Rahm Emanuel is like a prick or just a guy doing his job. It happened so fast, I barely had the chance to say, Hey, Rahm, tell your brother Ari Emanuel I said hi. I'm his star client. Estefan, comma, Gloria. Cuban diplomat, diva, para, siempre. Gloria Estefan keeps trying to improve me. She thinks I'm going to change. She's like the hot girlfriend who thinks that her boyfriend, Kathy Griffin, will change. Ladies and gay men, people don't change. Here are some photos that prove my point. Okay, in this picture, Glow is putting me in the doghouse because of my rather free-spirited hair don't. I think she secretly wishes I would just learn how to scrunch my hair properly in the way she's been doing for decades to her own hair in a rather signature way. She was even willing to do it (laughs) <laughs> in a moo in her own home in Florida. And here she is that same night at a fancy dinner party in Miami, still, like, trying to get my hair right. Gloria Estefan, in addition to being arguably one of the rulers of all things Latina, she's been an incredibly generous friend to me. So let me give you an example. One time when I was on tour in the Miami or Miami area, whatever, she let me stay at one of her homes on Star Island. Yeah, you heard me, one of her homes. Not a guest house, not a spare room. She was in the kitchen, and I, of course, was on a mission to embarrass her and make her regret the decision to let me stay at one of her homes. I decided to try to make her laugh by dancing around the dock area without my pesky bikini top. That's right. I was very proud of myself running around the dock of her property with just my bikini bottoms on, white, real titties, flapping and flopping in the air, flailing, my arms, and just yelling, look at me, look at me. I'm getting on my feet and making it happen. The rhythm got me, the rhythm got me. To which she dryly shouted out the window, you know, the paparazzi are stationed across the bay with those long lenses. You know, (laughs) like I care. A few days later, my first and last genuine candid paparazzi shot surfaced online in all the weekly rags, topless, pale, wiry hair, and makeup free. Trust me when I say this was not a staged photo in any way. (laughs) It's a little too real. I was just trying to make my friend laugh while she was just trying to be a friend and save me for myself. Glow, don't worry. Someday I'll change. Everyone does. (laughs) Feral, comma, Will. Actor, former student of mine. Yep. You may not know this, but my day job for several years was teaching improv classes at the famed Groundlings Improv Theater Group in Los Angeles, of which I was a long-standing company member. Prior to being on Saturday Night Live, Will Ferrell was my student. Both he and Sherry O'Terry were my students. So yeah, I was there when they invented the cheerleaders. It was great to watch Geniuses in the Making because they were so talented. The thing people don't know is that When I was Will's teacher, before he was famous, he and his brother lived in his mom's basement. You know, like Silence of the Lambs. Well, you can imagine how much I enjoyed teasing him long after he became a star. Hey, how are you and your brother doing in the basement? You guys have your own beds now, or you guys sharing one? I mean, your movies seem to be doing pretty well. You know, I think you guys would at least have separate beds. (laughs) All right, the other thing about Will is that he's kind of an example of what I affectionately call losing someone to fame. Let me give you an example. One year, I was a red carpet correspondent for the E! Channel, and Will Ferrell walks onto the red carpet, and I swear I couldn't get his attention. 
So he's surrounded by publicists and security, and everybody wanted a piece of him, right? So I get it. He was at the height of the Anchorman frenzy. I mean, good God. Straight guys love that movie, by the way. It's like their go-to. So I innocently shouted his name. Will, Will. Well, he and his posse blew by. Okay, fine. Then he probably didn't hear me. Or maybe they heard me and just had to move on. Was he purposely being rude? I doubt it. I'm going to be honest. I used to take it personally, but he's like so out of the stratosphere now with his career that, you know, I don't think it occurs to him to like go out of his way to say hi to me. All right, fine. He's probably met a million people. And every time he goes to an event like this, like the Emmys or something, he's on the clock. But I'm just telling you, like, I've known a lot of people from before they were famous, and I call it losing someone to fame. Yeah, I don't get like a bad vibe from him. Doesn't bother me. I mean, he was always a really funny, nice guy. But there are some rocket ships to stardom that you just don't necessarily see coming. And Will, sweet, hairy, suburban Will, <laughs> was one of them. Hi, Will. Fonda, comma, Jane. Movie star. Works out. Kathy's personal chef. Jane Fonda made me the worst quesadilla of my life, and I was never so happy to eat it. Of course, I've always wanted to get to know the great Jane Fonda. I mean, what a life. A true feminist, a wildly talented star of stage and screen, a survivor, and a victor. So I initially reached out to Fonda through Lily Tomlin in 2010. Lily was a guest in an episode of My Life on the D-List where she and I called Jane on speakerphone. Once I had her contact info, we emailed back and forth casually. She wanted me to host an event for her organization in Atlanta, and I was hoping that she would be a guest on my show. Months later, I changed the course of our budding friendship. Here's why. I was smack dab at the wrong end of a breakup. I was crushed. I was devastated. I mean, I was a wreck. So I was desperate to talk to someone who had, let's say, been through the fire. Jane Fonda was the perfect person. I wasn't messing around here. At that moment, I needed real advice from a woman who we've all seen go through extreme ups, winning Oscars, creating a successful fitness empire, and downs, high-profile breakups, media backlash, but is able to keep it moving, always. So I sent her an email asking her if we could just hang out one-on-one. Jane invited me to her house where she was staying and living with her boyfriend and told me not to bring anything and asked if I had any dietary restrictions. It was so nice. I was so looking forward to spending time with this American legend and getting to know her as a friend more than just a fan. Jane greeted me at the door in casual clothes. She wasn't wearing any makeup, but her hair was perfect. Now, here's someone I've idolized my whole life, and here I am in sweats and tears on her doorstop. I opened with, I'm out of my mind right now. She responded, I can tell. Come on in. We went right to her office work area. She told me that this was a writing day for her. Her office, by the way, is a room off the kitchen where she sits in a Barca lounger with her laptop. (laughs) Jane said, pull up that other recliner. We can talk. I'm shacking up here at my boyfriend's house for a while. Her office was more like a traditional man cave, which I thought was hilarious. This is working, I thought. I'm sitting here in Jane's office, boyfriend's, you know, den, and she seems perfectly happy. I mean, I was hanging on her every word. I asked her to give me some advice about how to best deal with emotional turmoil while still working in the most public of fields. She whipped off a grocery list of advice, and I actually took notes. I mean, I had a pen and paper and took notes. I was truly a wreck. I'll give you my knee-jerk reactions in a different voice or something, because I was in a frame of mind that was, let's say, questionable. So Fonda goes, don't make any major decisions right now. So I'm thinking, so I shouldn't join Doctors Without Borders like I was going to? Then she goes, don't sell your house. But I'm pretty sure I could get a hundred billion dollars. And then she goes, and don't buy a house. But I'd be perfectly happy in one of those really tiny houses I've seen on those HGTV channels. Don't move across the country. What? But I could pull my tiny house on the back of a U-Haul and drive to... Bangor, Maine, or something, and start a whole new life. Don't jump into a new relationship. Well, what about, like, a late-night booty call with one of those, um, adorable Backstreet Boys? Then she goes, don't do anything dramatic at all in your life for one year. To which I thought, I'm hungry. So then we moved to the kitchen, where she made me a quesadilla while continuing to rattle off advice. I sat at her cozy kitchen table and watched her as she got a tortilla from the fridge, pulled out some cheese, and casually said, Do you eat chicken? 
<laughs> she confided in me about several of her relationships and why she had come to the conclusion of waiting a year before doing anything substantial. I never knew I would get to know Fonda in this way. I mean, she was so nurturing and kind and helpful and just really had a good like sense of what I needed at that moment. It was a window into her world that I think few people get to experience. Look, there were plenty of jokes. I teased her about reading an article one time where someone asked her if she ever binged on junk food, and her response was, sometimes I have too much peanut butter. We laughed, but she was always focused on bringing it back to the simple task of like a new friend being there for a friend. Jane plopped down the quesadilla on a plate in front of me, and I couldn't resist saying, um, I'm not going to lie, it's a little bland. I mean, this quesadilla is terrible. It's a very waspy quesadilla, hoping she would laugh. And then I go, no wonder you're so thin and fit. <laughs> she came back with, yeah, yeah, whatever. Look, kid, stay the course. Steady as she goes. Make sure you stay super active and put yourself out there. Keep reaching out to friends, girlfriends, guy friends. Check in with me and let me know how you're doing. I got in my car, I drove home, and I thought about everything she told me for a year. That's right. I took Jane's advice because she was absolutely right. I think about that day and how content she seemed just sitting in her boyfriend's rec room, writing and juggling television and film roles while still being able to tap into her own experiences and offer me such thoughtful support. I think I owe Jane Fonda a hell of a quesadilla. Ford, comma, Gerald, former president. Ah, that should be enough. Only once have I ever been glad to be ignored by the media regarding a big event. In 2001, my pal Cameron Mannheim took me as her plus one to a charity fundraiser called A Family Celebration that was so celeb-packed it blew my mind. We're talking super-duper A-list. Okay, so this is 2001. Elizabeth Taylor, who I'd never even seen in person before, Calista Flockhart, and the entire Allie McBeal cast, which was, you know, the show at the time, in sync performing... At the height of their in syncness, Britney Spears was just the girlfriend at the table. Michelle Pfeiffer, David E. Kelly, Sylvester Stallone, and even a couple of former presidents, Gerald Ford and Bill Clinton, who were seated together. <laughs> at one point, Cameron jokingly whispered to me, oh my God, Bill Clinton is sexy. I was nervous about shaking the hand of a world leader because I wasn't like a big donor. I'm just a, you know, comedian, sitcom, co-star, plus one. But Cameron set me straight. If Bill Clinton wants to shake your hands, you shake hands. Because I was nervous, right? So then I just panicked and I shook President Ford's hand too. <laughs> he was older, of course, but he was like very distinguished. A nice, strong, presidential, respectable handshake. I went home on a total high. Like I actually remember thinking, Someday I'm going to tell people I shook Gerald Ford's hand, and you guys are the people. Anyway, cut to a few years later. I'm sitting in bed, watching my news magazine shows, and there's a whole piece on the person who organized this very event, some guy named Aaron Tonkin. You can look him up. Well, that some guy turned out to be a gigantic con artist, stealing millions from these fundraisers, and he went to prison for it. So when I say I was glad to be ignored, that meant I was watching this ABC News piece, which featured red carpet footage of that family celebration event, and I'm actually thinking, oh God, don't show me, don't show me. Well, thank God I wasn't famous enough to make the cut on the ABC News list of A-listers who they thought would be more newsworthy. And also these A-listers, by the way, thought they were attending a legitimate charity event, including two frickin' presidents. Oh, I fly. But sometimes I fly just under the radar. Freeman, comma, Morgan. I cannot wait for him to read this. I think Morgan Freeman is one of those guys that people truly want to know about. What's he like in real life? Well, I can tell you. Morgan Freeman is a stately dude. There's a presence about him. Everything about him just reeks of a man of a thousand experiences and stories. I think that's part of the Morgan mystique. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of jokes about him, you know, being God, and he's even parodied him playing God. I mean, I actually saw him one time give a really funny interview about how he was jokingly bitter about not winning the Academy Award for Best Actor. Although he did win the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for Million Dollar Baby. But I like a man who is openly bitter. So I'm happy to report to you that I have seen Morgan in several different settings. 
And he's kind of everything you would hope he would be. He looks you directly in the eye. He plants himself on the ground when he speaks. And the minute he opens his mouth, you turn your head because that voice is so iconic. But what I love the most is he has a great sense of humor. I was at a dinner thrown by Beverly Hills heavyweights Arnold and Ann Copelson, and there was Morgan Freeman, Academy Award winner, you know, voice of God, living screen legend, favorite actor to so many, on and on and on. I was at a great table. I was seated with Sharon Stone and the great Don Rickles. Morgan approached a sitting Don Rickles from behind and threw his arm around him. Don turned around and gave him a a friendly, hey, you bastard. Morgan goes, Don, I've been waiting all night for you to call me a hockey puck. Uh, let me stop for a minute. Obviously, if these two old pals are joking around with each other in a way that you can only do with someone you go back a really long way with, then I just want to watch with eyes wide open, and I just want to prick up my ears and see the show. I want to be honest with you and tell you, like, at that moment, I was quietly losing it inside just to be, like, watching this, right? Freeman is joking around with Rickles. They're both legends. I can't be cavalier about my run-ins with Morgan because they're always significant to me. I mean, not him, of course, but he'd probably laugh at this, but I'm just telling you, like, he's one of those big-time stars that would just stop anyone in their tracks. Of the many times I've had brief encounters with Morgan, there's one he probably doesn't even remember, but it sticks with me. So I was hosting an award show, and he was picking up an award for his film with De Niro and Michael Douglas and Kevin Klein called Last Vegas, which I love that movie, by the way. When he came on stage, in like the second it took him to come up to the stage, I halfway went to meet him with the award, and he simply said to me, Hey, Kathy, how have you been? And I went, Great, Morgan. Good to see you. Okay, it may seem like nothing to you. And I bet I've told that story about that little exchange to like 30 of my friends. (laughs) It has engendered every response from, Oh my God, he knows your name, to What's he really like? Is he really cool? To, Oh, that's cool. And I agree. I mean, I was giddy like a schoolgirl because Morgan said my name. Anyway, back to the party. Morgan continued to Rickles. What's going on? You off your game? I've been here two hours. I'm waiting. He wanted Rickles to call him a hockey puck. Witnessing that exchange, it was kind of like I got this hopeful glimpse of what I hope starts right now. When you've put in as much time as I have, I mean, watching these two actually gave me hope that I might be reaching a place where these folks that I put in my act actually come around and have a laugh at it. I'm looking at you, Jacob Tremblay. That's the kid from Room. Anyway, Morgan was laughing at everything Rickles said, and Rickles was on a roll. And that's how it should be. The guy we think of as God, wanting Don Rickles to bust his balls, was, for me, a sign that if I keep at it, I can still do this when I'm their age. Morgan and Don's rapport spoke of a longtime friendship, mutual respect, and a bond over whatever makes you laugh, regardless of the tenor. It reminded me of seeing Don in his documentary, Mr. Warmth, and how Clint Eastwood just lit up talking about Rickles. Ball busting will never get old. And since it's what I do, I'm planning on sticking around until celebrities beg me for it. Let's just say, when I'm 90... The goal is for me to have my Morgan Freemans, whoever they are, chase after me at an event and say, Kathy, I'm right here. The night's not over until you, you know, roll your eyes at me, say something rude and flip me off. I have dreams. Garcia, comma, Andy. Cuban royalty, movie star. Oh, those eyes. The greatest joy of my career has truly been introducing my beloved mom, Maggie, to some of Hollywood's best and finest. But no good deed goes unpunished. In 2014, I concocted a scheme I was very proud of. Gloria Estefan, my pal, who I met originally, by the way, when I hosted Bette Midler's Huluween charity event in 2008, she wanted to make my mom, Maggie, a very special invited guest to her Hollywood Bowl concert. So Glow was promoting her album of standards, which is fantastic. And since these were classic songs from my mom's era, Glow thought that Maggie would have a particularly good time. But you can't entice Maggie Griffin merely with private box seats and backstage access to Gloria Estefan. Oh, no. Mostly, she wants to be anywhere that's close to a bathroom. Or she calls it a john. I gotta be near the john. So I had to trick and kidnap my own mother. Here's what I did. I invited Maggie to my house, and then I just made something up like, hey, let's go to church, and then bingo for a glass of wine, or whatever. 
We threw her into the back of my car, and as we approached the Hollywood Bowl, I heard Maggie go, oh my goodness, that looks like the Hollywood, and then I just said, great, let's check it out. And I swerved into the entrance as if it was Maggie's idea to go to the bowl, and I, of course, went right up to the back ramp for the VIP entrance. Before we knew it, Team Estefan had arrived with a wheelchair at our car, and I just want to say that was incredibly touching how sweet it was that Emilio Estefan, Gloria's husband, like, he showed up to take care of my mom for a Hollywood Bowl concert. Glow took time to say hi to us before the concert, and my mom, who's met Glow several times, still kept referring to her as the girl singer in the band. <laughs> I kind of wanted to throttle her, but Glow thought that was adorable, so that's fine with me. So then they escorted all of us to our awesome box seats, and then my mom requests a bland turkey sandwich. And Gloria went on to give an amazing performance, but before the show started, I swear to God, they somehow sent my mom a bland turkey sandwich. My talented friend Gloria had something special in store for Maggie. She dedicated the song Young at Heart to Maggie from the stage. She even referenced my mom's girl singer comment, which I loved. Before the show was over, we wheeled Maggie backstage so she could watch Glow close out the concert from the wings, and it was so magical. Gloria literally waved goodbye to thousands of people, walked off stage, and just goes, Hi, Maggie! It was too adorable. We then went to Glow's dressing room for a tiny get-together with her, Emilio, their daughter, Emily, who's an amazing singer, by the way, and a couple of Team Estefan members, and Andy Garcia. That's right, the movie star had made a surprise appearance during the concert as a bongo player. I go, Mom, I have a surprise for you. Look who's standing right behind you, Andy Garcia. So my mom turns to him, and then Andy, just piling on the charm, took her hand and said, What a pleasure to meet you, Mrs. Griffin. Don't you look wonderful? I swear to God, I'm thinking, oh, Andy, you have no idea what you're in for. Let's get this shit fest started. Maggie promptly said, oh, you're the one with the bongos. You were terrific. And you know what? That is a good line of work, too, because every proper band needs a bongo player. Andy Garcia's eyes narrowed slightly. I said, Mom, uh, it's Andy Garcia, the movie star, who came out as a special guest to play the bongos. He's not, you know, just some percussionist on the road. He's like a big-time movie star, Mom. So my mom goes, "Mm, I don't think so. Oh, Jesus. So I panic. I go, Andy, tell her some of your movies. (laughs) He goes, "Uh, The Godfather Part 3? Maggie was drawing a blank. He goes, uh, When a Man Loves a Woman? Maggie goes, No. Okay. Andy was now starting to look at what he thought was a sweet, fluffy old lady was something closer to the hardened stare of some of his um, darker roles. I go, you got to do better, Andy. Ocean's Eleven, he said. Maggie's eyes lit up. With Angie Dickinson? I love her, he clarified a tad dejectedly. Uh, I was in the one with George Clooney. My mom, oh. I shook my head. I go, way to go, Andy. You were in the shitty later one? Try harder. She's 95. Mention a co-star, an older person she'd be impressed by. Finally, he goes, Sean Connery? Maggie brightened up again. Oh my goodness, Sean Connery. That must have been something. I hear he was quite the ladies' man. You were in one of his films, huh? So now I'm just digging in. I go, yeah, Andy. Uh, What were you in with Sean Connery? What was that movie again? I can't seem to remember, Andy. Andy Garcia, who now looked like he wanted to kill both of us, goes, The Untouchables. I go, speak up. (laughs) He goes, I was in The Untouchables with Sean Connery. I was the rookie cop. And Maggie, unaware of the dagger her words had become, just simply said, oh, isn't that nice? Gifford, comma, Kathy Lee. Christian doppelganger, comma, TV hostess. When I first subbed for her on Live with Regis and Kathy Lee... I took a real liking to Kathy Lee's hair and makeup person, Eve, to the extent that on a different day, when I needed to go to an event, I asked Eve if she could do me up for it. She said yes, but only if I showed up early, like when Kathy Lee wasn't around. So we arranged a time, but it didn't matter because as soon as I settled in the makeup chair, Kathy Lee barged in and in a very flamboyant way barked, and she was kidding, I know, but she goes, there is only room for one redhead in this chair. I was laughing, but Eve had a look on her face that said, really, get out now, seriously. 
I know <laughs> Kathy Lee has disliked me for a long time. She thinks I'm vulgar, blah, blah, blah. And even when I'm on TV with her, there's laughter, but she's always got to get in some sort of like a chastising comment. I've always thought, though, she might have a legit sense of humor because she was legit friends with Joan Rivers. But even when the opportunity arose at a Broadway premiere for us to get a picture together, something, by the way, that the ever hyper and talented Mario Cantone was clamoring for, Mario Capone, this is a picture everybody's going to want. Well, she just wouldn't do it under any circumstances. All right, fine. As for the name confusion, we both had to deal with it. I've been called Kathy Lee. She's been called Kathy Griffin probably too many times to count. But it reached a really surreal apex one August day in 2015 when I began receiving a string of cryptic tweets with a Christian tinge that were inordinately heartfelt and often came accompanied by the hashtag blessings and hashtag heaven. Here's one. Quote, Sending you hashtag blessings, end quote. Quote, he's in hashtag heaven, end quote. Quote, dear at Kathy Griffin, you are a hashtag blessed lady who loves the Lord, end quote. Jesus-y statements like hashtag love is patient, love is kind, end quote. Okay, don't tell my mom this, but I think I may have uttered the words out loud, Jesus, who writes this shit? And then I wondered what strange prank one of my comic friends was up to when I noticed a few of the tweets mentioned condolences. It got me thinking. So then I went straight to the Google, and yes, on the day that Kathy Lee's husband, Frank Gifford, passed away, legions of her fans sent well-wishing tweets to me, a foul-mouthed, gay-friendly atheist, for a day. I was bathed in the holy love of grieving religious, probably much, much older social media newbies who didn't know Kathy Lee Gifford's actual name, and they were tweeting me by mistake. I'll admit it, there was a tug of war in my dark soul, something between, oh, and this is hilariously wrong. If I say that tears were streaming down my face that day, I'm going to let you wonder whether they were from sadness or uncontrollable laughter. Although, of course, I'm genuinely sorry for Kathy Lee's loss, I would like to believe, since time heals everything, that she would find this Twitter support hiccup amusing in some way. I'm guessing not. For all I know, she's had to erase hundreds of mean tweets from crazed Levotics or Believers or Swifties that were really looking for me. You know, maybe she and I should do a PSA together about the pitfalls of social media. Or maybe Kathy Lee Gifford's superfans should ask themselves why they couldn't take at least one moment to check the spelling of her handle. I get it. When you're typing into Twitter, auto results will come up. And obviously her fans did not mean to reach out to at Kathy Griffin, because I've often wondered if at Kathy Bates had the same surreal experience that day. Gomez, comma, Selena. Singer, actress, Taylor Swift Girl Squad member. She's a good sport. I like her. I mean, it couldn't have been easy to get caught lip-syncing at the Jingle Ball concert and then have a hot mic capture her saying, What the fuck? in response to the screwed-up sound issue. By the way, I encourage you to look that up. I'm okay with cutest-button Disney girls cursing on stage. You know, more please. Anyway, I'm even more impressed that she survived dating Biebs. Look, at the height of that craziness, I saw her on the red carpet at an award show. And this is when the believers were so out of control, some were sending her actual death threats. She had an insane level of security. I mean, it was that bad. So she walks up to me, we say hi and hug, and then I sort of casually go, Jesus, there's more bodyguards for you than President Obama. What's going on? You getting assassinated tonight? Her response was like, ha, 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 don't say that. I think my joke might have been a little close to the bone. Grande, comma, Ariana. Singer extraordinaire, ponytail extraordinaire. Local radio station Kiss FM throws a big star-studded holiday concert every year in LA at the Staples Center. And when I attended in 2014, I was determined to get a photo with Ariana and Jesse J for like a bang-bang reunion. In which, in my mind, obviously, I'm Nicki Minaj. I could only secure pictures with them individually, but when I saw Ariana backstage, she could not have been nicer. 
I found out why. She confided in me that years ago she had sent me a fan letter that I read aloud on an episode of My Life on the D-List. You probably don't remember it, she said, but I love you and I'm your biggest fan. And because we were in the same hotel once, I wrote you a letter and put it at your door of your hotel room. I was your psycho stalker. So you can't imagine what it was like for me to be watching My Life on the D-List and see you read it. (laughs) Like I remember every fan letter. What am I, Bobby Sherman? So I lied. Of course, Ariana, it's my favorite fan letter. Now let's get the selfie and get out of here. What cracked me up, though, about the photo was that this 20-year-old with flawless features was obsessed with the angle and the lighting. She was like a little Barbara Walters, and she wanted to be from up here, and I'm just nervous because she's going to go sing, so I'm thinking, well, I'm the old dame. I should be worried about this. And she wants it to look this way, and eventually I just had to come clean. I go, trust me, Ariana, um, not only do you look gorgeous in this photo, but I'm going to be photoshopping it so much that when it's done, I'm going to look 20 and you're going to look around nine. Green comma, Brian Austin, actor, rapper, 90210 boy. In 1998, I hosted the Billboard Music Awards in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. And afterward, there was a party with hundreds of people. I don't know what I was thinking by going, but (laughs) this was the age before cell phones. Nowadays, if I were hosting something big like that, I would probably just go for a more private and controlled wingding afterwards, rather than some free-for-all that basically anybody could sneak into. But I was naive. Also, there was a hot young guy there named Brian Austin Green, and I had my eye on him, and I intended to make out with David Silver for 90210. Yeah. This was no unattainable dream, either. I had actually met him a couple of years earlier when I was a regular on the short-lived Roseanne sketch show that Fox scheduled to compete against SNL. It was a great gig. I got to meet all these cool people. But anyway, when we met then, he was a guest star, and backstage, we had a fun, impromptu, half-kidding, half-not-for-me makeout session. You know, for camp value. I tell my boyfriend that now. I just go, hey, it was the 90s. That's my go-to. Anyway, this time at the Billboard's party... Our eyes met. He said hi. I touched the lapel of his outsized suit. We stepped behind a large fixture and started kissing. Anyway, it was going well. He was moving down to my neck. He's kissing it. Kissing it. And then, ow! He fucking bit me. Yeah, that was an artery, thank you. All right, there was no blood. I'm exaggerating, as I sometimes do. I mean, Twilight had not even been written yet. I guess second base for Brian Austin Green isn't touching my tits, an appropriate next stage of intimacy, but branding me by leaving a mark, behavior which should be left behind in high school. Ah, you bit me, Brian, I yelled. He may have been a little tipsy. Once I got away from him, I locked eyes on Lance Bass from NSYNC, and I thought, hmm, he's cute. And while for some reason nothing happened there, you know, for reasons I didn't know at the time, The point is I would have been better off just playing board games with Lance Bass than fending off the skin-ripping jaws of a ravenous B.A.G., which is his rap name and how he wanted me to refer to him. Enough said. The day after the Billboard Awards, I had to show up for a table read at Suddenly Susan, the show I was on at the time, with a fucking turtleneck to cover my giant hickey from a 90210 cast member. And then for a show taping, I had to wear what's called beard cover makeup to cover it like I was a freaking extra in Planet of the Apes. I don't know what happened to him. I heard he married some hot chick. Good for him. Time heals all wounds. Griffin, comma, Maggie. My mom, comma, American treasure, comma, boxed wine connoisseur. Wherever I go, people want to hear the latest Maggie story. They don't just want to hear that she's fine. They want to know what she said, what she did, who's on her shite list, If I could just put her on stage in her muumuu and collect the check for her, I swear to God, I would. She's that beloved. Very recently, she came over for a lunchtime visit and a nice, bland turkey wrap. The only other alternative to that is a nice, bland turkey sandwich. I asked her if she wanted a glass of her treasured boxed wine, and she said, no! Huh? Kathleen Mary, I am sick and tired of you spreading the word through your unfair comedy routine that I... Drink too much goddamn wine. People think I'm a wino. I said, Mom, first of all, no one uses the word wino anymore. Everyone just thinks you're, you know, adorable. Fine, I'll have a glass of ski. Whoa. Maggie just kicked it up a notch. 
For some reason, she's always called whiskey ski. I guess she thinks it's code or something. You know, like someday we're all going to call coffee fee, right? As always with Maggie, the conversation moved from politics to pop culture, and I realized there was an opportunity to broach a certain topic with her. You know, Mom, everyone wants to know, since you're such a fan of the Kardashians, what are your thoughts on Caitlyn? What surprised me at first about her response was that she tried to evade the premise. I don't watch the Kardashians anymore. That show has just gotten too ridiculous. And I don't want you telling people that I do watch it anymore because that is another lie from your comedy routine. And I don't appreciate it. Pause. Fermented. Distilled truth juice kicking in. But I might have watched one of them on Saturday. Aha. And, wait for it. I do think it's probably better that Caitlyn decided to just go back to being Bruce. Um, this is the part in movies when you hear the needle scratching a record. Um, Mom, I, uh, I don't think uh, Caitlyn went back, as you call it, to being Bruce. I said a bit worriedly. She said, no, no, I saw it Saturday. Bruce was back to being Bruce with the ponytail and the whole thing. And they were all fighting, you know, like they do on that show. And I just thought, it's probably better that he went back to being Bruce. You know, it's probably just less fuss and muss with all the hair and makeup and what have you to put on every day. All the dresses and the goddamn high heels. I can't even walk in those anymore. And Caitlin is no spring chicken. So it's probably just easier for everybody. Glug, glug, saltine crackers, glug. That's when it dawned on me that she had been watching a marathon of reruns of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. You know, a programming concept, by the way, that immediately brought to mind what I believe our military refers to as enhanced interrogation techniques. I tried to tell her that she'd been watching an old episode, that Caitlin was absolutely still Caitlin, and she said, no, no, see, this is where you get in trouble, Kathleen, because I saw it with my own goddamn eyes on Saturday. You of all people should have known this. Oh, gosh, Maggie was right again. Yes, why hadn't I been made aware of the stunning reversal that took place in only a week? Scooped again by Maggie. Mom, I said, do you really think Caitlin could have transitioned back in a week? Well, I don't know all the details of that newfangled modern medical hocus pocus, she said. End of discussion. All right, fine. I couldn't help but imagine Caitlin Jenner stomping into Cedar sinai along with, you know, Candace Kane, Kate Bornstein, Shandy Moore, Jenny Boylan, and maybe the other Kardashian kids, Candle and Francine Jenner, whatever their names are, laying down the law to the hospital staff. Hey, fellas, uh, I need to be back to Bruce by episode 12. Uh, we're shooting 11 now, so hop to it. Let's get the reassignment team back together. Or the re-reassignment, you know, I should say. <laughs> Thank God I can return all those dresses to Tom Ford. Look, I think we can keep this hush-hush until it's revealed on the show. Right, guys? High five. Oh, Maggie, please never change. That's why we love you. Groban, comma, Josh. Singer, player, chosen one. I'm a big nerd fan of Grobes. He knows it. I'm his fan base. It's not young girls. I mean, they're part of it, sure, but the meat of it is middle-aged ladies, and we're obsessed. I'm the fan who sits and cries while watching YouTube videos of him singing The Prayer with Celine. Really. I even love watching the videos from his tour, where he does this bit where he goes on stage and he says to the audience, would anyone like to do a duet with me? And then some nervous girl gets up, and then she sings like Susan Boyle. I mean, it, it's a shtick, but I love it. So I remember when I first heard him, and this is going way back. It was at this 2001 charity event. This is before I shook hands with President Ford and President Clinton. Music empresario David Foster came out and introduced this kid he discovered, whose debut album hadn't even come out yet. And frankly, you know, he kind of looked like he just lost his yarmulke. I always tease him now, by the way. I love saying to Groves, you know, that first night I saw you, I wondered if you were, you know, just told that you were leaving your bar mitzvah early. I mean, you didn't exactly look like a traditional up-and-coming pop star. Well, of course, he started to sing, and then that incredible voice came out. The other thing about Groves, though, is that as long as I've known him, he's gotten the hottest pussy of anyone in Hollywood, besides Michael Bolton. Natch. You don't hear about this a lot because he's not like a John Mayer, right? He's just always been with a gorgeous chick whenever I've seen him. And God love me, he always has a great sense of humor about it. About his popularity, how shall I say? He's a little bit of a slut, but he can take a joke, right? And he's also too rich and successful to be bothered by the likes of me. 
So one night, he brought a date with him to see me back in my comedy club days. He came backstage to say hi. I was at the Laugh Factory on Sunset. And I'll never forget, I mean, he's with this gorgeous girl. And then he says, this is years ago. This is my girlfriend, January. As in Betty Draper. Like January Jones before she was January Jones. I mean, I couldn't resist. I just look at her and I go, Groves, how did you get her? She's way out of your league. So the good thing is now, every time he has a new girlfriend, we both agree that whoever it is is out of his league. When Jimmy Kimmel hosted the Emmys in 2012, Kimmel invited me to his post party at the Soho House, and Groves was there. So of course I start teasing him. I go, you're out of control. And I brought up his stage bit, bringing audience members on stage to sing with him. I said, Jesus, Groves, how bad has it gotten? You're on tour, but the pickings are so slim that you got to screw some poor chick in the crowd who maybe can't even sing the prayer. All right, so I'm busting him pretty hard, and he's, of course, taking it like a champ. So he looks at me without skipping a beat, and he goes, Look, honey, this cock isn't going to suck itself. Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Groban. Ham, comma, John. Actor, nemesis. You'll never convince me to like John Ham. I admit it, he was great on Mad Men and deserved the Emmy that they finally gave him on his last season. But that's it. You know, and I get that this makes me the loner. I know it, that she stands alone. Pretty much in any group I've ever been in, when I start bitching about Hammy, people act as if I've just strangled Jesus or Jesus' puppy. But I've known him since before Mad Men. See, he's bros with some of the comedy guys I know, and I have to say the vibe I've always gotten from him is cold, kind of disrespectful in general, in particular towards me. But you know what? I'm suggesting... He's one of those hot guys who's, like, mildly funny, but actually thinks he's comedian-level funny. You know the type. There's probably one in your office or your family. He just, like, reeks of that. It's like a little bit of an entitled air. So when Hammy wants to be funny, he's, well, you know, not. And again, I'm not saying he hasn't been good in his comedy appearances on 30 Rock and stuff, but in my experience, the harder he tries to be funny, the more he's not funny to me. Case in point. A dinner at the legendary talent agent Sue Menger's house, in which I was privileged to be invited. It was, I think, only eight people there, and one of them was the great Jack Nicholson. So when Hammy showed up, I swear to God, inside I was like, oh, great. He even says to me, he goes, what are you doing here? I go, uh, I earned my seat at the table. What are you doing here? All right, so <laughs> he was still in hair and makeup. He had just come from the set of Mad Men, and he was directing the episode as well, as acting in it. And yeah, I know he's talented, blah, blah. Anyway, he proceeded to get very drunk during the coffee table portion, and then it was time for dinner. Sue sat hammy next to me, which was uncomfortable, but I wasn't going to bother her. But at least Jack Nicholson was there, and I could focus on hopefully getting to know one of the great actors of our time. Then Jack, who usually directs whatever he's saying to seemingly like the world at large, he actually focused on me, and he went off on this tangent about Rupert Murdoch almost getting a pie in the face during a parliamentary hearing in England. You can look up the clip. Anyway, I was asking Jack about why he was so interested in this, and he started doing an imitation of Murdoch, the right-wing media mogul, and I was in heaven. And then Hammy picks that moment when Jack Nicholson is talking to me to start whispering like boozy, stupid, yammering attempts at jokes in my ear. So the first one was, you know, your Emmy isn't a real Emmy. I was like, whatever. So I <laughs> kind of just ignored him. Then the next one, he just goes, you're so old. I just swear to God, I sat out of the side of my mouth. I go, not now. And then he kept going. Stuff like, do you know how old you look? Finally, I just fucking snap. I just turn. I go, look, you can't keep up. You're outclassed. Zip it. Jack's talking. <laughs> I laid down the law. Nicholson kind of noticed, by the way, which was really funny. <laughs> he said this funny thing I'll never forget, because every so often I would sass back at one of those dinners, and one time Nicholson goes, wow, you got balls. I've been at these dinners before where it doesn't work out for the person, <laughs> which I thought was funny. All right, but the impression I got from Hammy was, it was almost as if he was thinking, like, I'm not going to let her have this moment, and I'll never forgive him for stealing a moment with Jack Nicholson from me. And look, you know, I've been told I'm too old and not funny by lots of people, including hot guys. But, you know, don't do it when I'm in an intimate conversation with frickin' Jack Nicholson, an opportunity I figured I'd probably never get again. And that's probably the real reason I can't stand Hammy.
The double whammy of cruel but not even playful comments and just bad timing. Look, he's not a comedian, folks, okay? Hopefully done with the drink, but probably still, you know, a little Don Drapery. I'll always admit that I get a perverse joy in making him a nemesis because it simply hasn't been done by anyone else, all right? I have cornered the market on convincing the jury that there is at least reasonable doubt regarding Mr. Ham's character. Hasselbeck, comma, Elizabeth, my best friend. It's easy to forget that years before we had our Bring It exchange on The View in 2010, Hasselbeck was a survivor, runner-up. And by the way, you probably didn't know this, but she expressed to me several times in her earlier View days that she just loved it when I came on the show and that I could get away with saying things that she couldn't say. All right, how quickly they turn, especially when they don't have an identity yet and they learn that spouting odious Republican talking points becomes the fastest way to earning the drooling love of old white Fox News viewers. Anyway, I distinctly remember an early view appearance when I was trying to persuade Barbara Walters that she should have Gloria Steinem on, because I believed that nobody had really taken up the mantle of feminism for the younger generation in the way that Steinem has. And you ready? Hasselbeck didn't know who Steinem is? Fair enough. Wait, did I just say fair enough? It's not. I was distracted by one of my dogs who started chewing on a cushion. Okay, what I meant was, how the hell do you get a seat on the panel of View with the great Barbara Walters and keep your job after having just admitted you don't even know who Gloria Steinem is? So I described Steinem to Hasselbeck and said something like, but for your generation, Elizabeth, I don't really know who that person would be now. In my opinion, it would be great if you or your sisses or sisters, using a real word from the real movement, could find someone to take on the baton. And then she said, and you know I live for shit like this, she goes, oh, you mean someone like Mandy Moore? Uh, I was so thrown by that, I had to clarify. I go, you mean the singer who sings Candy? And the gal from A Walk to Remember? Or do you mean there is some other Mandy Moore somewhere in Berkeley right now teaching pro bono classes to disenfranchised single moms while she lives in a tree while researching her next appearance before the Senate trying to get equal rights for women? No, she meant Mandy Moore, the pop star. Really, over my course of time at The View, Hasselbeck's stupidity never ceased to amaze me. As she became the right-wing mouthpiece, I personally saw and heard her getting the Fox News Republican Party talking points for that day from one of the EPs. Hasselbeck actually used to be friendly to me. Then she just became a mean girl. There are people who aren't bright, but who are at least aware of what they're good at and what they don't know. (laughs) I like to think I'm one of those people, by the way. I mean, I think I'm bright about some things, but then I'm always kicking myself over the things that I don't know, right? So Hasselbeck struck me as someone who, while she deserves credit for being ambitious, before my very eyes became someone who was a perfectly nice person that then morphed into someone who was a strident yet unabashedly armed with Fox News fed sound bites person who's trying to make a name for herself in this way. I'm sure she's a true believer in many ways. And I'm a true believer also that she's a a moron. Look, I don't care whether you're on the left or the right. You shouldn't be on a daily television show that purports to offer news if you don't know who Gloria Steinem is and think Mandy Moore is the modern equivalent. And by the way, nothing against Mandy, incidentally, who is a lovely person, but an icon of can-do activist feminism? I I don't think so. Of course, our dust-ups have been popular with our respective fans, and the aforementioned bring-it moment makes for a very audience-energizing part of my pre-show clip reel, but I also know how much being on television adds to the spice of a feud. I was at a very small charity event recently, and I was hanging out with uh, Allie Wentworth and Jessica Seinfeld, so we see Hasselbeck walk in. They're teasing me. They're like, "Uh uh-oh, here comes trouble for you. And I go, no, 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 it's not like this. I may not get along with her or somebody publicly, but ultimately, like, we're pros. People like her know that off-camera, we're all going to be civil. I go up to Hasselbeck to say hi. I'm standing there patiently waiting for her to finish up a conversation to the point where it just got really, really awkward, where you're kind of standing there like, and you're like nodding and she's not looking at me or saying a word. (laughs) So she just walked away. So then I had to go back to Allie and Jessica and sheepishly just go, yeah, I was wrong. She's uh, really like that. WWMD, what would Mandy do? Han, comma, Goldie, actress, giggler, activist. 
When my former beloved assistant Tiffany worked for me, she started an unofficial assistance union. I don't even know if that's legal. And through that, became friends with Goldie Hawn's assistant Iris. When I heard about this connection, management, me, contacted labor, Tiffany, and demanded a sit-down with the legendary Oscar-winning comic actress, Goldie Hawn. It was years in the making. In late 2014, the opportunity finally presented itself. Oh, I will wait the divas out. Goldie wanted to know if I'd host her inaugural charity fundraiser called Love In for Kids, which I know sounds a little shaky, but in reality, it was a benefit for her Hahn Foundation Mind Up program, Transforming Children's Lives for Greater Success. Yeah, that's a mouthful, so I'm just going to call it H-F-M-U-P-T-C-L-F-G-S, or Hupfamunglfgz for short. I sent word through Goldie's assistant Iris that I wasn't doing it until I got FaceTime with the legend. I knew that Goldie is something of a recluse, but this was the deal, so she had to take it or leave it. Well, she took it, and we agreed to meet at a Melrose restaurant called Fig and Olive, which is, just so you know, not a place where you, like, show up in workout pants, which is what Goldie wore. Her hair looked like she had just rolled out of bed with Kurt. Hopefully she had. Based on her attire, I had to start teasing her. Um, do you have a yoga mat with you? Where the fuck's your ball gown? She just cackled. She goes, oh, I don't do that stuff. You're a riot. Sit down. Oh, ballsy, those legends. I love it. She started talking about the event, and I cut to the chase. Look, honey, I don't give a crap about your event. Do you know how many of these I've done for you people? What do I get? She looked confused. I thought this lunch was it. I continued to tease her and kiss her ass at the same time. I've always wanted to meet you because I think of you as a unicorn, I said. To me, a unicorn in the Hollywood sense is a mythical being that one does not often see and is someone whom, after seeing such unicorn, makes you want to run to your phone and tell all your loved ones about the sighting of a unicorn, like Goldie Hawn. So then she goes, I am a unicorn. I'm the unicorn. She immediately responded while simultaneously pointing to herself. It was her lack of hesitation and utter willingness to agree that she's a unicorn that made me fall in love with her. So I still had to set her straight about one thing. I said, unless you have $300,000, we're not done. Give me the lowdown on the sequel to The First Wives Club and who I'm going to play. I'll call Bet. you call Diane. She just laughed and laughed and... Iris initiated our Twitter pick, which I insisted be taken only after Goldie put on at least a measure of lip gloss. Iced tea. Wrapper. Cop. Refreshing drink. In the days when I was getting my sea legs as a stand-up and working at the Groundlings, I became a staple on the radio show Love Line when Ricky Rackman and Adam Carolla were hosts along with Dr. Drew Pinsky. I've actually done that show through, like, I think all the hosts. One night, the topic arose of rapper Ice T's admitted past as a pimp, and I launched into a rant that amounted to, what's so great about that? And I went so far as to accuse him of lying. I was saying things like, you know, that's the type of thing you say when you want to have, you know, street cred. You really think Ice T was basically Huggy Bear from Starsky and Hutch? I don't buy it. Keep in mind, Ice T was already, like, a very wealthy music guy at this point, so I just didn't think twice about it. But he responded in a newspaper article. I don't think I'd even ever been on television at this point. He called me out by name with like a lot of how dare she and she doesn't know me and doubling down on his claim that he was in fact a badass pimp before he became a rapper. So that was one of my earliest experiences in which I realized, uh-oh, the person I'm talking smack about heard it. Cut to 15 years later, if not a little more, and I got cast on one episode of Law & Order SVU in a guest star role. So Ice-T is like a middle-aged dude now, and in my mind, I'm foolishly thinking, well, I better be ready, because he's been waiting for this day to put me in my place since 1994. It's probably all he thinks about. We were filming in the streets of New York, and during a break in filming, we ended up sitting at the same table at a restaurant the production had rented out. He just starts talking to me, and he's essentially acting like a really nice uncle, asking about stand-up, if I was having a good time on SVU, whether I wrote all my material, complimenting me on doing my own thing. I mean, he was as nice as can be. So, of course, I had to bring up what was going unspoken. What else could I do? Remember when Ice-T had that rap feud with LL Cool J? In my head, his watch list was, number one, LL Cool J, number two, Kathy Griffin. It's in my nature to break the perceived tension with, remember when I pissed you off? Well, let me remind you if you don't. So I just said to Ice-T, come on, have you forgiven me yet? 
It's been long enough. We need to make up now. Are we cool after that whole thing? Of course, he just looks at me and goes, uh, what are you talking about? So I filled him in because he has, after all, filmed 600,000 episodes of SVU and maybe can't even remember a time when he wasn't doing that show. Oh, that's funny, he replied. You said that? Oh, man. And I responded, oh, that's too much. Girl, you're crazy, he chuckled. I mean, I could tell this guy brought to the table the kind of demeanor you can only get from decades in the music and television industry. Here we were having a nice actor conversation, but no, I had to wind the clock back to a comment on a radio station. You know, when people were buying CDs, if not records, and Clinton was president. Contrary to the Academy Award-winning song in the film Hustle and Flow, maybe it's not hard out there for a pimp. Ice, comma, vanilla. Home improvement star, rapper, Madonna One-Nighter. I pride myself on bringing my comedy to the real America, damn it. So naturally, I booked a gig in Stewart, Florida. <laughs> don't pretend you don't know where it is, because I didn't. But they had a theater, and people there wanted to laugh, so I went. By the way, that's my business model, people. The theater was nice. The backstage was a little small. The night I was performing, one of the theater employees says to me, Hey, Vanilla Ice is here. Okay, when you're on the road as much as I am, you live for words like that. I said, what do you mean here? He goes, he's here at your show. He lives nearby. Everybody around here knows him. Vanilla Ice bought a ticket for the Kathy Griffin show? I wasted no time. Get him! Then I clarified for this startled poor man. Tell him to bring his wife back here. We'll get a backstage photo. An exclusive. I don't know why I was speaking in a rapid-fire style as if I were in an outtake from Newsies, but it was minutes before showtime, and damn it, I was on a deadline. Seconds later, Rob Van Winkle, Vanilla Ice, and his then-wife appeared. Uh, by the way, he looks the same. Just so you know, he looks the same as Ice Ice Baby. Besides his head, he was casually dressed like a Florida-type dude. So the head looked like Ice Ice Baby. The body looked more normal. <laughs> he just goes, hi. And I go, hi. I assume your wife wanted a picture? He goes, yeah, she loves you. I was like, of course, I'm used to it. So we did the picture. I made my small overture. And I go, um, so, you know, I would love it if you would be willing to, like, bring me out there and introduce me before I start. Without missing a beat, he goes, sure. With the ease that can only come from surviving an alleged one-nighter with Madonna, allegedly, where he and Madonna allegedly had vaginal sex. I, whatever, I think she banged him. Anyway, I said, look, you don't have to, like, rap or anything. I'm just saying it would be, like, really cool, and it would be really nice if you would introduce me. Super flattered you came to the show. You know, all you have to do is, like, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big Stuart welcome for the hilarious Kathy Griffin. I just knew it would be, like, fun and kitschy, right? Even though he had just started his new TV life as a home improvement show guy, I just knew the audience would love it. Like, a great road moment, right? But it was even better than I hoped because he actually went out into the mic and he started with, stop, collaborate, and listen. And he freaking starts to sing Ice Ice Baby, but he's freestyling new lyrics and using my name. And then ends with, so give it up for Kathy Griffin. Everybody went crazy. I went crazy. I kind of forgot I had to do a show for a minute. I kind of felt like I was at his show. And I had to remind myself to put one foot in front of the other and actually do my show. Because that moment, it was just delicious. The vibe in the room was awesome. I thought it was so cool that he knew what everybody would want and just gave it to him. It's Mr. T knowing not to lose the mohawk and chains. God love him. I mean, to this day, it's one of the greatest intros I've ever had. Maggie would have to wrap Anaconda at Carnegie Hall to top it. Irons, comma, Jeremy. Acta. Borgia. French lieutenant. In 2010, while dining with a friend at the Wolseley, a fancy restaurant in London, I spotted Jeremy Irons at a pretty big table. It's not exactly proper in the UK to walk up to celebrities and, you know, bug them, so I just kept watch and waited. When he stepped outside for a cigarette break, I paid that frickin' check mighty fast. I grabbed my friend Derek and bolted for the door. Thankfully, the only people out there were a puffing Jeremy Irons, dressed, by the way, in a vintage but elegant suit, kind of like he had just stepped out of a Merchant Ivory period film, and <laughs> leaning against the building like a menswear ad. And there was the restaurant's fancy greeter slash guard who was just basically crammed into a red coat. It was like a freaking British postcard with these two. As for approaching the Oscar-winning actor, I thought it would appear less threatening if Derek and I acted like we were a couple. No, we didn't make out or have a screaming argument. We just looked quite familiar with one another. 
We also hit upon the idea that instead of making the fawning, aren't you so-and-so approach, we could just pretend like we didn't know who he was. Be patient, people. As always, I have a plan. Don't worry. Since Derek is 20 years younger than I am, it seemed more likely that he wouldn't recognize Jeremy Irons. So I got him to walk up and very innocently say, I don't mean to bother you, sir, but would you mind taking a picture of us? Irons is like, sure, no problem. So he's got my phone. He's taking pictures of Derek and I. And then Jeremy Irons suggests that we get a photo with the guard. So we're all like joking about like, oh, is it okay if we take this picture? Ha ha ha. Very collegial. So then it's my moment. So I say to Jeremy Irons, like as if he's some like random guy, well, you might as well get in one too. He freaking smiles and obliges. So he just walks into the photo and he's posing with me for the photos. I'm feeling very proud of myself because my scheme has played out in my favor. Jeremy Irons, who went to the Sherborne School in Dorset, yeah, I looked it up, was outsmarted by this sassy fire crotch as if, well, they're all going to be if I stick around long enough. Anyway, Finally, I go, by the way, I obviously know who you are, and I just want to acknowledge that you've been so gracious. I'm a comedian in America. And then he interrupts me. He goes, of course I know who you are. I recognized you immediately. All right, horrible accent, but I swear he said that. Oh, my God. The star of Reversal of Fortune and the voice of Scar from The Lion King knows who I am, and he's just been playing along the whole time? I realize at that moment I'm really famous, and I have a global reach. I mean, this little ploy turned out all right. I asked if we could just get a photo together, and we did a funny pose. Naturally, Jeremy, or Jer, as I called him now, wanted a funny pose with one of his all-time favorite comedians. I get it. Suddenly, we were chatting like two people in the biz, and it was really cool. As we parted, I said, well, I'm glad I finally came clean about knowing who you are, and thank you so much for indulging me. And then he turned to me, and he said, so long, Jackie. And back to earth I tumbled. Screw you, Scar. Jacko, comma, wacko. Dancer, singer, regular dude. In 1991, I was cast as a background dancer in Julie Brown's Madonna spoof for Showtime called Medusa Dare to be Truthful. I was the only non-dancer amid real ones, some of whom had actually worked for Madonna, so to rehearse, they booked us into a dance studio in Hollywood. And because I was simply the worst dancer, I was there to be funny, not wow everyone with my moves. I needed a special dance captain, much to the amusement of my temporary fellow actual dancers. Two male dancers, in those days I could say two of my favorite gays, because they would call me heifer. So I say it's all fair game. <laughs> and I believe I would then make fun of them right back accusing them of being the ones who had maybe gained a half a pound over the weekend, and that's how you become friends. One day, we didn't have parking spaces because moving into the rehearsal room next door was Michael Jackson and everyone doing the black or white video shoot. Suddenly, the place is buzzing because our choreographer was a very talented woman named Smith Wordies who had worked with Michael Jackson in the past. She worked with him on Captain EO, and she was the main dancer with him in the Smooth Criminal video. So the feeling was there might be a chance to meet the King of Pop. Being an actress, a comic, I was just as excited to meet the video's director, the comedy filmmaker John Landis. And yet the first day, Michael Jackson didn't show up at all. This was a big budget video, all right? I remember walking past Michael Jackson's set. I look in and I see Landis sitting on a folding chair by himself reading the LA Times. So I guess that's what you do when Michael Jackson's a no-show. The whole day, their choreographer and frequent Michael and Madonna collaborator, the great Vince Patterson, kept coming over to our set and ended up, like, helping us. Okay, especially me. And then he goes, do you want to see the ography? That's what they call it. He goes, do you want to see the ography for the music video? Hell yes! So we all got to go over and watch Vince filling in for Michael Jackson and all the dancers do the full black or white choreography, as it was supposed to have been taught to Michael that day. By the way, it was one of the most dazzling dance performances I have ever seen because our dancers knew their dancers. The whole vibe was really fun and positive, and truly, it was a privilege to even watch it. The next day, Michael Jackson shows up. I heard they lost a million dollars because of his absence the first day. 
A good portion of that might have been on the catering. I've never seen anything like it. Our chips and waters had been transformed into a super vegetarian display. By the way, I even became a fan of grilled skewered tofu from that point on. Then Smith dropped the bomb on us. Oh, you want to meet Michael? Hell, 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 yes, 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 yes. So a group of us, Julie Brown, me, the four dancers, we went to the catering room. What follows is a series of things that actually surprised me. Michael was in the room by himself. No bodyguards, no entourage. Okay, there's one. He and Smith hugged, and you could tell that their relationship was warm, genuine. But my impression of the legend himself went as follows. Number one, I don't know why, but he wasn't as surgerized looking as hype and photos had led me to believe. I don't know why, but in person, he didn't look as surgerized. I guess I expected to see a nose like halfway falling off. But instead, I would say he looked a good 60% himself, 40% assembled. Number two, he exhibited a thoroughly normal sense of humor and conversational ability. That was shocking to me. I remember that he joked around with Smith, and he never gave off that weird, timid affectation where he looks like if you say pee or poop, he would just giggle and put his hand over his mouth. He was talking like dancer shop talk and didn't act shocked by anything or like shy. Number three, this is the big one. His voice register was nothing like his high-pitched acceptance speeches and, you know, mousy interview moments that we've heard. It was lower and not at all airy or wispy. Dare I say normal? If my back had been to him on the street, I wouldn't have even known it was Michael Jackson talking. I mean, that's how different he sounded. Standing in that room, watching and listening to him chit-chat and catch up with Smith, completely unfazed by total strangers being close to him, I was quietly flabbergasted. He was in his element, working, talking with colleagues, away from, you know, prying cameras. It was actually revelatory. And yet he'd been a no-show the day prior, costing the production a million dollars because, here we go, a newspaper revealed, and there were photos, he'd been at the mall that day, all day, with Macaulay Culkin. So um, I can't say he was totally normal. Jackson, comma, Michael. King of pop, comma, I was there. I, Kathy Griffin, was an extra in the infamous Michael Jackson Pepsi commercial in 1984 where his hair caught fire. I have two points to make. Point one. You know what a Forrest Gump moment is, right? It's when you happen to witness or be present during an iconic moment in history, good or bad. And I've had a few of those. And this was one of them. Back then, I did as much work as an extra as I could because it was the closest I could get to even feeling like a part of show business. On a side note, by the way, not only was I never destined to be an overnight success, but I just want you to know I spent years as an extra for $35 a day just to have the opportunity to even try to get my foot in the door. I did this while I was taking acting classes and improv classes and keeping my day job and whatever nine to five office would have me considering I have absolutely no office skills. Needless to say, I was excited when I got the call late in January for a two day shoot in downtown Los Angeles at the Shrine Auditorium. Two days at 35 bucks a day is $70. Not only was the money fantastic, but when I learned it was a commercial with the Jackson 5, I was first in line. I was one of a thousand in a standing-only crowd that day watching Michael Jackson do take after take of him making his big stairway entrance onto a glitzy rock and roll-like set and jamming with his brothers to a reworked version of Billie Jean, incorporating, quote, you're the Pepsi generation, end quote, into the song. Whatever. It was fascinating to watch Michael Jackson at work. Of course, I grew up with his music, but it was quite an up-close and personal experience to just be in that audience watching how a really big commercial is made with one of the biggest stars in history. At one point, I noticed my Groundling pal, John Lovitz, in the crowd. We were both in the Groundlings at that time. He wasn't even on SNL yet. And when I asked him why he was there, he introduced me to his best friend, Miko Brando, son of Marlon, and at the time, Miko was one of Michael's bodyguards. Point two. Keep in mind, this was all before the internet before social media, TMZ, cell phones with cameras, all of it. The public wouldn't even know of a news event of this magnitude until much later. So when people ask me to this day what it was like to be there, 
I have to remind them of this. Here's what happened that day from an extra's point of view. Keep in mind, you can see it online now because Us Weekly got hold of the footage of when the pyrotechnic effect went off too early and they posted it much later in 2009. However, the last thing production would do following an accident like this would be to announce it to hundreds, if not thousands of extras. They would never say something like that, just so you know, like, there's been a horrible accident, everyone go home. I mean, these are the days where everything was kept a secret, right? I just remember we were all abruptly excused for the day. And by the time I had driven to my parents' apartment in, you know, their used Toyota Corolla, it was actually an apartment I shared with them in Santa Monica. It was on like the local news and I couldn't believe I was there. Over the years, it's been so strange to realize that I had been there for this sort of momentous showbiz incident. One many believe led to his debilitating addiction struggles and death and nobody knew what had happened at that time. I do think he um, did molest all the kids, though. So there's that. Jenner, comma, Kendall. Model, by today's standards. I mean, let's be honest. First of all, I call her Kendall, which drives her insane. Speaking of driving, the lanky, somewhat soft-spoken, very homeschooled, up-and-coming model, reality star, whatever, and I were leaving an event at the same time. So the valet guys brought our cars one right after another. Candle's SUV was right in front of my car, and when she backed up slightly to maneuver out, she came, I just want to say, perilously close to my front bumper. So that's what I call an opportunity. So I just yelled out, and there were a bunch of other celebrities in line. I just yelled out in front of the line of celebrities, Candle, Candle, don't kill me. Not today. This isn't the night. I grabbed Rosanna Arquette, who was nearby. Rosanna, you're my witness. Candle Jenner is trying to kill me. I'm pretty sure Candle waved as she drove off, a gesture from this stone-cold would-be assassin that simply said, next time. I know you're wondering, so I'll let you know. My Maserati was unharmed. Shaken, but okay. Jenner, comma, Chris. My true biological mother. When it comes to Ms. Kathy Griffin's style of highbrow comedy, the Kardashians get it. Not in the way you're thinking. I mean, Kris Jenner actually gets it. I'm now the least of the Kardashians' worries, and it's heaven. I mean, they are juggling all sorts of tabloid newsworthy topics, ranging from sex tapes to relationship drama, Taylor Swift, paternity suits, you know, the academic rigors of PhD dissertations. All right. Maybe not that one. But there may have legitimately been a time when the subject of Kathy Griffin warranted an, oh, no, not her. I literally cannot stand her. Literally. But now they just say hi. And I honestly don't think I've had a Kardashian actually mad at me for years. And this is not something I'm proud of. Let's see if this book can break that streak. At least the main Kardashians haven't been mad at me in years. Now, I cannot keep up with the younger ones, who seem to just be multiplying. I'm looking at you, Saint, Sinner, whatever your name is, Southeast. All right, whatever. Case in point, a few Christmases ago, I found myself at a star-studded party where I was embarrassingly underdressed. As in, I'm in jeans, it's supposed to be formal. My big idea was to sneak off to a room, call my assistant, get him to drive over and throw a Carolina Herrera ball gown through the window. I find a door, open it, go try to find a place to make that call. And I walk into a room that I think is going to be my like secret phone call room. And I freaking run into the whole freaking gang. Kris Jenner, the three main Kardashian girls, Candle, and then Francine is floating around somewhere. The other one with the lipstick. At this point, she's so um, plumped, she's not even recognizable. They really do clump together, by the way, like the mafia or some bygone Irish band of toughs from Gangs of New York. And by the way, they, I'm sure they love that film and can quote anything by Scorsese. I started right in joking with them, and they let me go on. Even though by a certain point, I realized they'd kind of encircled me, and the brief thought of a blood sacrifice ritual did enter my mind. But really, they were actually all quite friendly and just wanted me to entertain them, which I'm always happy to do. Nobody was even mean. Chloe even came up to me and... She said, which is amusing to me, that she was using a baby voice. Hi, my favorite. And I just said, what's up, Loch Ness? Because I was nervous. It was like I was um, their attraction at some weird Hollywood petting zoo. 
Chris Jenner pipes in. She walks over and she's got a drink in her hand. And she goes, you know, I was just in another conversation and we were trying to figure out how I'd classify our family. And I noticed you were here, Kathy. So I thought, Kathy Griffin's going to be able to come up with something right away about how to classify us. I pretended to take a minute to think about it. And then I said, I'm going to have to stick with dirty whores. And they actually cheered and laughed. Like they went like, cheers, clink. And that's when I went, oh, shit, they get it. Jonas, comma, Nick, singer, former has-been, current hitmaker. When I first met the Jonas Brothers, it was at the Grammys where they played a song with Stevie Wonder, and I thought they were embarrassingly horrible. Stevie Wonder might have wanted to be deaf as well as blind that day. I really couldn't get over how they'd been kind of shoved down our throats. The stadium tours selling out in seconds, dressing alike, talking alike, being anointed somehow better than your average boy band. I mean, Come on, it was a manufactured, time-tested showbiz formula, which worked very well for them for quite a while. Also, dating a slew of famous young women in a rotating tabloid-friendly fashion accomplished two goals, staying famous and staying in my act. But then, for various reasons, the Jonas Brothers, as we knew them then, faded away. During this period, Nick wound up being seated at my table at a charity event, and he was actually really sweet and humble, and even ended up calling me Ms. Griffin, which, by the way, I love. He was then sporting, like, a white boy fro, and for all intents and purposes, acting like a nice young man who didn't really care about the spotlight anymore. So, of course, I had to start. Damn right it's Ms. Griffin, Jonas. I reminded him for no reason. As you know, the Jonas Brothers decided to kind of part ways and move on to their next musical projects or reality shows, and Nick just couldn't help himself. He hit the gym, got a haircut, sent one Instagram pic of his abs to the universe, and uh, you know you've seen it, the LGBTs, okay, mostly Gs, just decided he's hot again. All that was echoed and agreed with by a certain person whose name rhymes with, uh, Banderson Booper. I ran into Nick again after that, and I had to let him know. I go, I know your game! (laughs) And he just flexed a bicep, smirked, and went along his merry way. Just a word of advice, Nicholas. And Kathy wants you to know that if you dare gain 10 pounds or turn even the least bit doughy with your now famous upper body physique, The G's are going to dump your ass and remove you from their cell phone screensavers. And I say this out of love. Keaton, comma, Michael. Birdman, Batman. Something happened with Michael Keaton that's never happened to me before with a celebrity run-in. This is it. So I saw him at a 2016 black tie soiree. And since, I've always loved him, right? He's funny. He's a great actor. He's weathered ups and downs, always come back stronger. I wanted to say hi. I wanted that interaction to happen. You know, somebody like that is somebody I would really seek out. I loved Spotlight, which would go on to win the Oscar, all that stuff. So I thought, that's it. I'm going to go up to him. In my ready-made, fast-talking mode, when I'm nervous, Hi, my name is Kathy Griffin. I really want to meet you. I just think you're so amazing. I'm going to bug you for a picture and just, you know, your work and your movies. So (laughs) they're just so great. As I was rapid rambling, he interrupted me with that patented, shy mutter of his by saying, with his head slightly down, uh, I've actually met you before, but you probably don't remember. Pause. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. For a brief moment, I was speechless. I had to get in the name of another Keaton movie in there. All right, here's the funny thing. Of course I remembered meeting him. But first of all, it was barely a meeting, and it was ages ago. It was during my Suddenly Susan years, like 20 years ago at a Warner Brothers party and Michael Keaton was talking to Brooke Shields and I was just standing nearby smiling and watching and nodding. And I was probably even then going like, holy shit, there's Michael Keaton. And now here I was acting like I'd never met him because I assumed he would never remember meeting me. Like he isn't allowed to be the misremembered one. That's my job. So I said, yes, of course I remember. I just assumed you wouldn't remember. And then he goes, oh, well, I just thought So we had this moment of, no, I'm less memorable exchange, which is absurd. Believe me, that's also never happened before. It made me wish there was a camera there to capture it, like a video camera to capture it. But in a way, there was, because I was so taken aback that my cell phone wasn't ready. Yeah, I was that asshole. That by the time it was, Keaton and I had moved on to like this really serious conversation 
about Spotlight and Father Porter and pedophile priests and Catholicism, it turned into this serious conversation. So he started doing that full brow furrow thing that he does. And then I see my camera's ready, so I'm nervous. And in the middle of this conversation, I go, time for a selfie! And I remember him going, whoa, whoa, transition, transition. So then I decided he needed photos with different people. I just decided to be in charge of his photo session. So I just pushed him toward Jane Fonda, Alice Cooper, and Sammy Hagar. Fonda actually emailed me later, and she's like, can I have that picture? So he played along. I just hear like, oh my, Sammy Hagar. And all the while, I just couldn't get over how this Academy Award nominee thought, like, I wouldn't recall meeting him. Believe me, in those situations, it's always me going, oh, we met several times. Oh, I made you laugh one time. I sat next to you on an 18-hour flight one time. Oh, I hosted your charity event. I made out with you one time. Uh, I saved your dog from drowning. But it's okay if you don't remember me. But Michael Keaton did. Kendrick, comma, Anna. Twilighter, Pitch Perfecter, could be nicer. I'm sure this was an isolated incident, or at least I'd like to think it was. I was at the Toronto Film Festival in 2011 hosting an Amphar event, and I attended one of the parties as the date of a movie publicist friend of mine. So I see Katie Couric there, who let me hijack her phone, and I started scrolling through her pictures. And by the way, that was really fun in itself. Jessica Chastain came up to me, and she was not yet super famous. And she runs up to me, and she goes, oh, I want to meet you. You're so amazing. I mean, that was cool, right? So then my friend wanted me to meet and say hi to Anna Kendrick, who was at a booth nearby. My friend knew her really well. So I walk up, and I just go, hi, it's nice to meet you. And I think I complimented her on Up in the Air and her Oscar nomination for it. I mean, simple, like, chit-chatting, maybe 30 seconds. Then there was a pause. And since I'm not afraid of pauses in conversation, I just kept talking. And then she looked at me and very unabashedly said, um, I have to ask you to go. My cousin is here and she's visiting, so, like, we need to catch up now. And, um, listeners of this book, at that moment, I wanted to die. I had nothing, okay? I probably said something like, oh, uh, that's cool, yeah, ha 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 or something smooth like that and bolted. But seriously, if there had been a security guard in the vicinity, I would not have been surprised if Kendrick had just snapped her fingers and had me forcibly escorted away. <laughs> it was that weird. To my mind, rude. And as my mother would say, a little high and mighty. I mean, come on, it was a party. It was a press event. I was nice to her. She's a winner in life, damn it. A star on the rise. Breaking out of those Twilight movies, and I was acknowledging her for that. I wasn't some drunk fan barfing on her tits. I get it. She had a relative there, but I pride myself on reading a room, and I clearly had that one wrong. And I don't know why. I also pride myself on being the sassy aunt to the fun younger gals like Megan Trainer and Aubrey Plaza. So this diminutive Ice Princess's tone truly caught me off guard. I mean, I would have fully expected that reaction from Katie Couric. You know, I would have deserved it. Katie probably would have let me have it like 10 feet before I even got to the booth. You know, plenty of famous people have given me leeway, watched me step over the line, and then had to say, all right, enough. But never in a million years would I have expected Anna Kendrick to give me the do I have to have you removed look in less than a minute of a very friendly praise session for me. I wish I could tell you that I had had a snappy comeback, but I just skulked away like a high school nerd rejected at the cool kids table. I mean, she's very talented. I love those pitch perfect movies, but the next time I see her, I might just have to barf on her tits. Just so when she tells me again that I have to go. It makes sense. Night, comma, Shug. Former CEO of Death Row Records can give a hell of a death stare. One night I was talking to my pal, comedian Cat Williams, on the phone, and he said, what are you doing right now? I said, I'm in my pajamas and my boyfriend is watching sports. <laughs> Cat goes, I'd like to send a car for your people if you want to come over. I go, Kat, my people is me and my boyfriend, and I can drive my own car. Anyway, as we were getting ready to leave, I joked to my boyfriend, whose upbringing is very much like Orange County Caucasian, look, we're going to Kat's house in Malibu. Kat is my friend who has had some legal issues, and there's a chance, a very slight chance, it probably won't happen, that this evening could resemble that scene from Boogie Nights with an armed Alfred Molina and the um, Gaijin who was throwing firecrackers. What? My boyfriend said. I said, but probably not. 
Okay, we get in the car, we drive to Katz, and as we pulled into his driveway, I noticed more than one Lamborghini and two cages in the front lawn that housed two giant Mastiffs. And I remember thinking, you know what? I have never had a boring moment around Cat Williams, and this is not going to be the first. So Cat met us in the driveway and escorted us inside, where he had a smorgasbord of delicious Italian food laid out. You want some fettuccine? I mean, he was being the perfect host. So there were two rather imposing-looking men in the corner. And then my boyfriend Randy says, the line of the night, that guy looks like Suge Knight. To which I said, that's because it is. The color drained from Randy's face, which was my cue to, of course, make things worse for him. So I turned to Suge Knight and I go, Suge? Because you could pronounce his name that way. So Kat started laughing and I go, Suge, what are you doing here? Oh, I have missed you. Suge Knight looked exactly as you might expect. Ill-fitting golf shirt, chains, jeans with mysterious bulges that did not look anatomical. A man of few measured words. He did not say anything. He then just walked over to a table and picked up a box of Popeye's fried chicken. So I did the slow clap. Really, Suge? You're a black man who's going to eat Popeye's fried chicken in front of a white comedian? Well, welcome to my act. Cat was laughing even more, saying, Oh, Suge, now you did it. Now you're in trouble. White lady's going to say anything. You know how white lady is. White lady is Cat's adorable term of affection for me. Randy, my boyfriend, of course, has his, like, please stop talking expression working overtime because my teasing of Suge was taken to the edge. Suge really hovered over Kat the whole time we were together, bodyguard style, to the extent that I just kept going, Suge, time for my pat down? Kat was the perfect host. We had a great time hanging out, and when it came time to leave, he walked us out to the car. Right before getting in, though, I couldn't resist. Suge, have you met my boyfriend, Whitey? I could tell my boyfriend was like, oh, God, we're so close. The finish line is right over there. Then I asked, Suge, do you know what just occurred to me? When was the last time you spooned with a lady? Cat chuckled and said, oh, I don't think that's what he's into. You know what? I said, I think it is. I think someone here is afraid to ask for a spoon. So I walk up to Suge Knight. I took his arms, wrapped them around me with my back to him, and said, just breathe, Suge. Enjoy something called tender, loving care. Then Suge, a man with communication skills that are unique, said, and I quote, Normally I like pussy. I nodded. I said, I know. I know. But tonight, you're going to have to be satisfied with gentle spooning from your friend Kathy. I looked at Suge as I got in the car, and I said, Good night, Suge. And remember, call when you miss your little spoon. I know many people might be surprised that I wanted to engage with a convicted felon as somebody adorable. But I believe I changed him. And yes, since that night, he's been shot and arrested for theft and been involved in a fatal car accident that led to another murder charge. But I know it gets him through these trials. An affectionate redhead named Kathy Griffin, who opened his eyes to gentle spooning. Kutcher, comma, Ashton. High-tech Nostradamus. Douchebag. When Kutcher was pushing Twitter hard in his early days, saying it would change lives globally, I tweeted out, does Ashton Kutcher have stock in this company? Obviously, the guy has his finger on the pulse of all things Silicon Valley, and he's got venture capitalist chops to prove it. I get it. But in my experience with him, this social media champion is a tool. We co-hosted a charity event in 2005 for ubid.com. The event was star-studded with everyone from Jessica Biel to Mila Kunis. And it had an extra spark because this was when Mila was still dating Macaulay Culkin. Take that in. And Kutcher had just married Demi Moore. Jesus, I have been present or involved in some pretty crazy-ass moments. God, this book is good. I digress. The point of the story is Kutcher, my co-host, did not speak to me once. If you're wondering exactly how that works, join the club. I don't either. At least three separate times, we were standing in the wings, waiting to go out together and present. And I would say something like, hey, next time we go out, maybe we do this, suggest something. And he would just ignore me. He'd be like, look at his notes. We may as well have been strangers standing next to each other in a subway car. 
Which, by the way, makes the one who starts talking sound like the insane person, especially when the other one refuses to react. At least two times we were out at the podium together, and the silence had been long enough for me to almost say, ladies and gentlemen, wait a minute, I've got to talk to the happy groom to force him to talk to me. But I didn't do that, because oddly enough, I actually kind of understood his skittishness about being like a high-profile newlywed. So I wanted to go in and make fun of the like newly married thing and knowing back that like Kunis was there, but I was just like trying to get through the night, but I didn't know why he was being such a douchebag. If he said five words to me the whole day, I'd be surprised. It was bizarre and it was like rude and it made me feel like he thought it was <laughs> beneath him to even like be doing this with me. Like I wasn't worth talking to in the slightest. Three years later, I was grabbing something to eat from this little Mexican takeout joint in my neighborhood, and who should walk in but Kutcher and Demi Moore? I smile and wave, and they don't even acknowledge me at all. Like, I wasn't screaming like, hey, there's Ashton and Demi. I just saw them. The place has like six tables. Nothing. Nothing. If you're not even going to say hi to me in the local Mexican takeout joint, you're a D-bag. Another time, I was talking to P. Diddy who granted I barely know, and Kutcher steps directly in front of me and just starts talking to him like I'm not even there. So that's three incidents. Do I loathe him? No. He's just someone who's made it perfectly clear to me that I have absolutely nothing to offer him during his precious time on earth. By the way, I encourage you to look up the photo of the two of us hosting this event together because it's just awkward and it says it all. Enjoy. Lansing, comma, Sherry. Studio Chief S. Model, Jane of all trades. Trust me, I am equally in tune with the groundbreaking women who are behind the camera as well as the women in front of the camera. Sherry Lansing was the first woman to head a major Hollywood studio. She started out as an actress, became a producer, then president of 20th Century Fox, and later was CEO of Paramount for 12 years. I've gotten to know her through the Beverly Hills Mafia, sometimes referred to as the Loop Group, Sherry knows how to work a power luncheon, which she hosts often. At one of those luncheons, in attendance besides Sherry were Bette Midler, Angelica Houston, Sidney Poitier's wife, Joanna, and Vanity Fair editor, Graydon Carter. And little old me. I've always gotten the impression that Graydon Carter finds me, like, classless and vulgar. Of course, the reason this bothers me is because I have been a longtime subscriber to Vanity Fair. Often, these lunches are all about the seating arrangement, so I was happy to be seated next to my gal pal, Sherry, who, by the way, is a great laugher. So when Graydon arrived and took his seat next to Sherry, she said, Graydon, Kathy Griffin's here. What a treat and a surprise. Nice tea up, Sherry. Let's see where this goes. Sherry obviously has the gift of seamlessly putting people together, and that day proved herself to be a true friend. I told her that I was nervous about meeting the formidable Graydon Carter. Next thing you know, as it will happen at a lunch party, people started mingling and shifting chairs, so I found myself seated between Bette Midler and Graydon, with Sherry to his right. I tried to bring my A-game in this conversation. You know, politics, pop culture, and most importantly, quoting not one, not two, but three of my favorite Vanity Fair pieces. Sherry chimed in, isn't she great? I just love her. Her mind is so fast. Thank you, Sherry. Graydon finally asked how I knew Sherry. I said, I know Sherry because she respects me. Tremendously. He laughed at that. And then I said, but I don't know if Sherry knows that she married a crazy person. And Sherry goes, what? You think I don't know that? Sherry's married to Academy Award winning director William Friedkin, who made The French Connection, The Exorcist, and who, while being an incredibly great filmmaker, has a notorious reputation for being somewhat of a volatile perfectionist. Look, let me just say, Linda Blair's head didn't spin itself. I've teased him about it. Sherry continued, let me tell you my story. I married Billy four weeks after I met him, and 20 of my best friends called me and told me I was making the worst mistake of my life. Then another friend called me and said, well, you'll never be bored. And that friend, of course, was Sue, and we were all there in our friend Sue Menger's honor. But I loved that story. And yet I said to Sherry, you know, when I see Billy, he's always kind of like warm and fuzzy, but I just want you to know, <laughs> there's a darkness there. Sherry laughed and said, that's why I married him. Isn't she great, Graydon? Isn't she great? Graydon? Graydon? I'm ready for my cover. Latifa, comma, queen. Actor, rapper, my friend Dana. 
In the Suddenly Susan days, I remember a moment waiting for an elevator at a hotel, and Queen Latifah came up to me and said, I'm watching you. What? Uh oh. And then she continued, You're really funny. Phew. Oh, okay. She continues, I really like your shit. You're really funny. I never expected anyone to know who I was in those days, and I remember thinking, Wow, Queen Latifah like, knows who I am, and she knows I'm a performer. And I just, it was like really sweet, right? So that led years later to me appearing on her daytime talk show. Just so you know, many talk show hosts don't bother checking in or saying hi or even meeting their guests before a show, but Latifah did. So when she came into my dressing room, I shouted, come on in, Dana, knowing I was buck naked. I do love to shock a talk show host. I always have. And just so you know, I have a real um, body, like real boobs, real everything. Gravity does exist. And that is what Latifah saw. That's right. I was rushing to finish the full hair and makeup process, which required full nudity because I was also wearing bronzer. So I had a strange half-done rainbow colors of pale effect in that my arms and legs were covered in this very dark bronzer, which I'm sure offset the pale, near transparent canvas display of my naughty parts in a probably very disconcerting manner. Basically, I'm assuming I looked like a strangely iced gingerbread cookie or a stripper who fell asleep that day at the beach. The point is I've been in this business long enough not to give a rat's ass at who sees me naked anymore. But if you think I'm going to wait for you to clear a fitting room before I shed my clothing, you are sorely mistaken. You know, I'm there for a fitting, not to be demure. Back to Latifah's reaction, which was swift and genuine. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I come back later? Are you, are you naked? Oh, Kathy, Kathy, you're too much. Mission accomplished. I had shocked the host and stayed on schedule with my full body bronzing process. I was more than a little flattered when she may have blurted out, dang girl, you still got it. No wonder you got a young boyfriend. And with that lovely compliment, a nice bookend to her, you're very funny intro all those years ago. I have considered foregoing the dress or any of my clothing altogether for my segment. But I decided to wear clothing because, number one, it was daytime, and number two, she is royalty. Leno, comma, J. Comic, The Tonight Show host, confidant. Jay was one of my guys. He had me on The Tonight Show multiple times. And with my history of talk show banishment, it was a relationship I had come to cherish. It had a um, rocky period, too, as Fans of my life on the D-list well know. During an appearance on The Tonight Show in 2005, I was doing this bit with a picture of me and Carmen Electra and how she wouldn't stop calling me for beauty tips. And Jay threw in his own crack, calling the photo a before and after picture. To this day, I can't fully explain why I burst into tears about it in the NBC Studios parking lot, but I did. And there was some welling up and some needing to calm down, and I called him out on it. Afterwards, saying it was a blow-the-belt joke. We had an argument in his car. He was saying I should be able to take that kind of humor. And then <laughs> it was all recorded by the D-list crew. And I actually wanted it on the show, but I heard that Jay called the head of the network and was like, oh, don't include that. You know, and the network was like, yeah, it doesn't make him or Kathy look great. That's what I heard. Anyway, it was not a great scene, and I was kind of banned from the show for a while. And I got invited back. That's kind of been my story. So here's the weird thing, though. Ever since then, it's been this love fest with Jay. So since that fight, he's been one of the kindest, most generous people and an actual champion of mine. Look, he's got his detractors. I know that. But my personal experience with him is that he is an attentive, thoughtful colleague who took the time to visit me in the dressing room before every one of my appearances on his show and initiate actual private chats in which we would just talk about anything. It became a ritual that I would so look forward to whenever I did The Tonight Show with him. So during hair and makeup, he would stroll in in the denim shirt and the jeans. He'd make a joke, and then I'd go, you know what it's time for? Then I would rudely kick everyone out, and Jay and I would settle in on the dressing room couch next to each other and get very candid about whatever was going on in our lives. He opened up to me about what he was going through during the feud with Conan, and I really felt like I could ask him about anything. He even called me up personally one time after my guest star appearance on Law & Order, to tell me I was really good. I thought that was like really going the extra mile, right? So after my talk show was canceled, I was kind of in a dark place. And he said to me, look, kid, this is what I think. 
It was a good show, but it was so under the radar, it's not a fail. Don't think of it as a show that was canceled. Think of it as two seasons of a talk show that gave you that experience. It was really right on, you know. So maybe the most valuable thing he said to me was after I'd been complaining about some career slight or not getting some sought-after TV gig, I'm sure the job had gone once again to, like, the other girl or whatever I was bitching about. And he said, I don't get it. Your first chair on The Tonight Show. You've got the awards. You won. Be careful what you wish for, because most people I know who end up truly realizing every dream, they go down the toilet pretty quickly. And boy, do I think about that a lot. His advice was, you want to keep the struggle. Well, (laughs) I'm good for that part. But anyway, here was this guy that I'd had a rough start with. And now, all these years later, I cherish our conversations. I like talk show hosts who want to talk, you know? So to this day, if Jay and I happen to be headlining at the same casino a night apart, I'll go in a day early or stay a day late just so I can get our precious one-on-one shop talk backstage. Leto comma, Jared. Actor, singer, international oddity. I have an unspoken arrangement with Jared Leto. It's not enough for him to be gorgeous and a great actor. He's got to be in a fucking band. Look, I remember when 60 Seconds Over Tokyo or 30 Seconds Over Pluto or whatever his ridiculousness is called was playing teeny wee clubs in town and Leto was bragging about turning down film and television roles. And I just thought it was absurd. I would look at his guy liner and dyed hair and think, you know, just get a Casio and put it in the basement, do it on weekends where nobody has to be embarrassed for you, Leto. But I love him. He made it successful. Like Jennifer Hudson, he told Hollywood, you're going to love me. And it worked. Now, it doesn't mean he loves me. Our friendship is very much one-sided. I'm friends with Jared Leto, even though he probably doesn't know he's friends with me. I'll explain it in this way. After seeing each other repeatedly over the course of many celeb-packed events, we kind of have a thing. It's not sexual. It's not even necessarily collegial. It's, um, like I said, it's an arrangement. The thing is, when he was making the awards season rounds with Dallas Buyers Club, I saw Leto at everything. Because, you know, he's got his feet in the acting and the music worlds. He'd been at the Screen Actors Guild Awards and then the Grammys. I'd run into him at the BAFTAs, the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and he'd be at iHeartRadio. So, all right, enough time had passed and events had transpired at which we would maybe exchange pleasantries. And then I realized, as I will, it was time to ramp it up a bit. Now, I can't remember the first time I honed in and gave him real shit. But I do recall at the Eagles concert at the Forum, he was sporting uh, two-tone long hair. I think it was brown on top and blonde on the bottom. And wearing a poncho as if he were going to be called on stage to sing Desperado that night. Look, he looked like he was in costume. All right, I'm sorry. So I just yelled at him from my seat, Lado! He looked back up and he gave me a tentative hello wave. And then I go, hey, Khloe Kardashian called. She wants her hair back. And then Leto, in front of everybody, goes, thank you, Miss Griffin, and walked away. And I thought to myself, yeah, damn straight. The hot guy A-lister takes a joke on the chin because Mrs. Kathy has earned it, damn it. And it wouldn't be right to beat up on her. Game on, Leto. Two weeks later, I was doing my regular walk. I was hiking, and I was in a park. A park. I wasn't going for a walk down a red carpet or through a movie studio I was pretty much, by the way, in the middle of nowhere. No cameras around, just going for a hike. Nothing Hollywood about it. I see, of all people, Academy Award winner Jared Leto walking toward me in costume. Yeah, I said in costume. I don't know what you work out in, but um, my new BFF Jared Leto was rocking a man bun, wearing what looked to be those Kate Hudson brand colorful jeggings with like a paisley print, a skimpy tank top, and a red fanny pack. So I couldn't resist. Leto! He just stopped. I go, I- I'm sorry. Is there a Cirque du Soleil rehearsal I'm missing? You're in a canyon. Act like it. He puts his head down. Thank you, Miss Griffin. And walked away. Thank you, Mr. Leto, for hiking into my act. Letterman, comma, David. Talk show legend. Those of you familiar with my best-selling memoir, Official Book Club Selection, (laughs) and that's all of you, right? I thought so. Anyway, you know of my heartbreak when I was banned from Letterman's show after I swore on the show. And if you care, 
or know anything about me, you'll know I was thrilled at being asked on again years later. Well, that welcome back was permanent, and I became a true friend of the show through the rest of Dave's tenure, and I loved it. I remember talking to Tom Hanks one time about appearing on Letterman, and he said what a lot of us feel about sitting in that lead chair. He actually said, I rehearse for David Letterman appearances. I want to go there prepared. I mean, you got to kick it up a notch. It's got that legend factor when you're around someone like Letterman. Well, of all my appearances, my favorite story has to do with him showing everyone a picture of Cher and I swimming together. So he asked me about it on the show, and I told him about going on vacation with her, and David couldn't get over it. It's all he wanted to talk about. A lot of stars would tell you about how you're not supposed to talk to David during the commercial break. Like, that was always a thing. So I never initiated it. But that night, we go to commercial break, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, don't talk to David. He doesn't like it. He's in his headspace. Fine. So he grabs my hand, and he pulls me toward him. And he continues off camera in the same tone he was using on camera. So Dave is saying stuff like, I just can't believe it. You go to Cher's house? And keep in mind, the audience can't hear any of this, right? So I go, yeah, David. What's wrong with you? You've interviewed every American president. You had an on-air fight with Madonna. (laughs) What's the big deal? And he goes, oh, I'd be terrified to go to Shares. Come on, is that true? I go, David, everything I say is true. You know that that's my thing. He goes, but this, this is true? Come on, this really happened? I go, yes. He goes, you go to her bedroom and you guys just talk? I go, yeah, we talk, you know, politics or movies and laugh. And what don't you get about this? I don't get it. This is what you do for a living. And he goes, oh, I could never go to Cher's house. I'd be scared she'd eat me alive. I mean, I can't believe you just, like, go talk to her and hang out. I go, I can't believe you're so freaked out about Cher. I'm going to text her everything you said. And Letterman goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just please be careful how you say it. I go, oh, okay, David. I'll be extra careful because she's so scary. FYI, you're a thousand times scarier than Cher. She's a breeze. You're, like, a very tough cookie, David. It was true, by the way. He's way more intimidating. Who knew that that was going through David's mind regarding Cher? I think the fact that she called him an asshole on his show all those years before that probably had something to do with it. But Dave and ballsy, outspoken women, they kind of make for good TV. Again, Dave and Madonna, remember? Look, maybe to him, as often as he's been called a legend, he thought of her as the bigger legend or the one with a genuine mystique. It was like the modest Indiana in him was coming out and only for, you know, 120 seconds. I mean, remember, it was a commercial break. It was actually really cute how bewildered he was. Later, my text to share was something along the lines of, well, thanks a lot. My whole interview on Letterman was about you. I could barely push my new special. Lovato, comma, Debbie. Pop star, slugger, hashtag too confident. One night, I got asked on Twitter who I thought was the, quote, biggest douche celebrity. This is not a question I take either extra seriously or that jokingly, so I usually just go with a recent history. A certain Disney Channel star that had been unfriendly to me for no good reason at a few different events, i.e. we wound up on the same guest bill on The Tonight Show once, and I made a point of walking over to her after she performed to say, congratulations on your new song, to which Debbie replied, what? I repeated myself, congratulations on your new song, what? And I just was like, all right, and walked away. So I remember thinking like, oh, you're you're just an asshole. Anyway, thinking back on this and other brief encounters, I said into my iPhone, Demi Lovato, referring to who's the biggest douche. Well, Siri translated it into Debbie Lovato, which I just thought was funny. So I call her that now because um, Apple products are always right. Debbie had been in my act already because of an incident on a plane in 2010 in which she'd punched a backup dancer named Alex Welch in the face and then suddenly went to rehab to allegedly deal with a lot of things. She named um, cutting, eating issues, substance problems, bipolar disorder. Serious stuff, by the way. I get it. These issues obviously trigger very genuine emotions in fans. Or in my humble opinion as a professional stand-up comedian who is covered under the umbrella of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution under satire, and trust me, Debbie, I know that First Amendment better than Larry fucking Flint, I am merely suggesting that I have had a long-held opinion that Debbie may have gone to rehab to help everyone forget that she punched a girl in the face when she got mad at her. Um, quick question for you, reader. 
If you were in the same situation, do you think you would have been sent to rehab or, I don't know, arrested? So I admit I had a little comedic fun in my shows with the theory that jail time didn't sound too appealing to Debbie, but settling quickly and going into rehab right away worked out nicely. And how many civilians who assault someone can get away with that? <laughs> Judge, do you have an album dropping soon? Civilian, no. Judge, lock her up. Anyway, the day after I called her douchiest celebrity on Twitter, my phone blew up with supportive texts like, are you okay? Emails from friends. How are you holding up? Um, things that make you think someone died? Then I just checked my Twitter feed. By the way, this was in a hotel room in Seattle at like one in the afternoon when I woke up. And I had more tweets than I had ever received. But they were not exactly friendly. I decided for this to just quote directly from some of the examples. And keep in mind, Debbie's fan army identifies themselves as Levotics, which considering certain struggles, I would say that's a bad choice of a suffix. Here's some examples. At Kathy Griffin, I will burn your house down, cunt. At Kathy Griffin, I will come to your house and rape you, bitch. Hashtag, Levotics want Kathy Griffin raped. That was a hashtag. Kathy Griffin, don't you ever talk shit about my Demi again or else us Levotics will kill you in your sleep. By the way, to which my dear friend Howard Stern said, at least you'll be asleep. Okay, so by the way, I'm not making fun of the following topic, but I'm going to be honest. I involuntarily may have chuckled in shock when I read this one. I'm going to try not to laugh because it's not funny. At Kathy Griffin, I really hope you commit suicide. I'm going to let that one sit there. Look, meet Debbie's fan army. By the way, kids, you're not in an actual army, so stop acting like it. The Levotics are a 30 million strong bunch that are passionate, and they're fucking psychos. Anyway, they're clearly not phased by being labeled with a suffix that conjures up a medical condition and the need for treatment. Whatever happened when Debbie went into rehab after settling things with Alex Welch, she freaking somehow came out of it with an image makeover, like she's turned into, you know, a Sheryl Sandberg for teens. Lean in when you punch people, I'm assuming is the message. But it's an image as calculated and successful as it's been that is contradicted by the level of hate and vitriol she and her fan army can whip up. And I refuse to believe that Debbie herself does not realize this. So when the LAPD became involved and detectives were sitting in my living room, they expressed that they had considered some of the posts from certain Levotics to be, quote, credible threats. You know, those adorable kids posted pictures of my home online. Uh, they had descriptions of knowledge of my daily routine. They suggested that people go to certain places where I hike every day and throw bricks at my head until I'm dead. And so on. They printed my dress online, all this other stuff. Okay, I'm wondering when Debbie feels like it's time to call off the dogs. I believe she can. Since then, a security team has kept and continues to keep profiles of certain Levotics. In my mind, she escalated things not long afterward when she herself tweeted a selfie from backstage at iHeartRadio long before this dust-up even happened, in which you can see me in the background, and I'm watching Rihanna perform, and Debbie is in the foreground making like an ew face, like an ick face, and pointing at me. So she took the picture without my knowledge. She then posted it after I, you know, called her douchebag. I'm sorry, she had to know it would unleash 30 million psychos and their wrath, and I'm suggesting she likes it. She does that tweet, and then the army goes crazy, and the threats continue. And then she did that thing where she deleted it because the millennials think they can just hit a button, and we're all good. But I think she did inflame things. Look, here's the deal. I poke fun at all of them. Believers, directioners, Swifties. Barb's smilers and never experience anything like this. By writing this, I probably even made the worst of those psychos be like, Yes, we slayed her for standing our queen. Lynch, comma, Marshawn. Beast mode, Super Bowl champ, a big KG fan. I took on Beast mode. It was March of 2014, and the Seattle Seahawks had just won the Super Bowl. Apparently, heterosexual men get very excited about this particular football contest. 
All I remember is that the Bruno Mars halftime show was fantastic. Anywho, I was co-hosting an event in San Francisco that happened to have a lot of star athletes and pro sports team owners as donors in the audience. Now, it's not uncommon when hosting a high-profile charity event that I'm asked to mingle with the high donors prior to the event or even if there's any downtime in between acts. I've had many times in my career when someone with a headset just says, go out into the audience and vamp. That means I have to choose someone at random bring a wireless microphone, and improvise with them for a moment until the next musical act is done setting up or the next beautiful starlet or whatever. So halfway through the show, I was asked to do just that. Since I'm not so up on the sports figures as the 17 straight guys reading this book are, I asked for a photo cheat sheet. I picked out one guy who just looked like he would be fun to play with. I had my cheat sheet and was running up the aisle with a microphone in a long red Valentino gown, yelling to the entire audience, where is this guy, Marshawn Lynch? Is that how you guys say it? Marshawn or Marshawn? Okay, two things happen simultaneously. I found him quite easily. He is a rather imposing, gigantic African-American man with dreads who stood out in a room of primarily white, diminutive men in their hedge fund suits. The second thing was that almost every dude in that audience immediately started gasping, freaking out, and pulling out their cell phones and taking pictures. I didn't know why, but I knew this was going to be good. I ran up to Marshawn and proceeded to do what I do best. I kept putting the microphone in his face and asking him rapid-fire questions while flirting with him, throwing my arms around him, telling him he was absolutely adorable, asking him what he did for a living, because I care about people, and asking him if he could picture seeing Marshawn and Kathy Lynch monogrammed on his bathrobe. The crowd kept their cell phones on, I was highly inappropriate, and all he had to do was stand there like a champ. And guess what? My new BF Marshawn Lynch was a good sport. He was a teddy bear. He played along like the pro he is, and the audience loved it. I mean, for God's sake, this is a professional football player who has a Super Bowl ring, He's dealing with the public constantly. He deals with the press constantly. Uh Uh-oh, record scratch. After my triumphant vamping with the clearly tamed by me beast mode, I triumphantly returned backstage to hear a choir of heterosexual crew dudes shouting at me, how could you pick him? Don't you know how shy he is? (laughs) As if I care about a celebrity being shy at a public event. I mean, come on, what does that really mean? Plus, I'm like a therapist with shy people. Everyone in the audience seemed very excited to see my abilities at making this Marshawn Lynch character really come out of his shell. I don't know too many athletes who are introverts. Well, the crew told me right away. Apparently, my beast mode is well known for not wanting to be questioned, bothered, or anything unless it's his choice. He had recently been fined tens of thousands of dollars for refusing to talk to the media throughout the season. And he actually has no history saying he enjoys a crazy redhead randomly running up to him with a microphone, asking him like 15 rapid fire questions. I believe I straddled him at one point. Anyway, the point is I'm proud of this moment. Okay, first of all, I didn't know I was supposed to have Skittles in my bra. I didn't know that about him. Second of all, at not one point during our harmless yet clearly romantic encounter did he say, I'm only here so I won't get fined. You know what? Maybe I'm his beast mode. Take that, sports nerds. I tackled the beast and turned him into a kitten. Deal with it. He probably wrote a bigger check that night, you know, just to get me away from him. Where's my Super Bowl ring? Macklemore. Bundled up rapper. I don't just love making my second favorite Vanderbilt laugh every New Year's Eve on CNN. I am always looking for any and every comedic opportunity December 31st, 2013, I spotted Macklemore performing on the ABC big stage nearby. Fucking Seacrest. Wait, screw you, Seacrest, because guess what? Macklemore and Ryan Lewis walked right over after your show, Seacrest, to where our rather modest operation was. You know, I live for these impromptu moments. So I actually looked up the transcript of my conversation that evening on air with Macklemore, and I want to read it to you. Kathy Griffin. Hey, I was at Jingle Ball when you guys were there. Remember when Selena Gomez said the F word really loud and then boom, threw the mic down? 
Like Chris Rock? Macklemore, I did. Griffin, confirm it, yes. Macklemore, I watched it on the internet. Griffin, wasn't it great? Macklemore, it was impressive. Then my overactive brain started worrying about another odd element. Fur. Yes, I was wearing a real fur. A rented sable. And I knew that Macklemore liked wearing fur. But what I didn't know was if he was into the dead animal kind of fur or the faux fur kind. Because if he's like Mr. Peta and I'm sporting a carcass, then I needed to keep my trap shut about that topic. Sure enough, during the commercial break, Macklemore won't shut up asking me about my fucking fur. Ooh, girl, that's a fly coat. Where'd you get that coat, girl? Is that fur? What kind of fur is that? But I'm nervously laughing because I don't know which way to go. So I'm saying stuff like, ha ha, it sure is cold. It's no thrift shop. Ha <laughs> ha, get it? I was panicking. The last thing I need is PETA and a bunch of activist rapper fans pelting me, excuse the pun, with balls of paint. But all was good. He was a great guest. It was a big get for us. And later, I googled him and learned he does wear real and faux fur. The video where he shows off 10 fur jockstraps with tails? That one stuck with me. He might be missing one of those on next New Year's Eve. Gotta keep it warm down there. Mangano, comma, joy. Inventor? Entrepreneur? Literally the joy? Enjoy. I loved joy. Stories about successful women really get to me. So when I hosted a very high-profile, high-celebrity, high-octane award show presentation in 2016, I knew I might get a chance to meet the real Joy, because she was there to present the director, David O. Russell, with a screenwriting award. Well, I didn't recognize her at first, because even elegantly attired for a Hollywood event, there's nothing Hollywood about her, which is very refreshing. She had teased hair and a black shift dress, but I remember looking at her giant scoop necklace and long earrings wondering if the diamonds were real. Because if they weren't cubic zirconium, Mangano had to be sporting one of the most expensive pieces of bling in a very expensive room (laughs) that included a very expensive Catherine Zeta-Jones, who, by the way, I doubt would know costume jewelry if you threw it at her adorably bipolar head. When Mangano sat next to me at first, it took me a second. I go, you're Joy from Joy. Then she said... Yeah, don't you remember? We met at HSN. She was referring to Home Shopping Network, and there was an audition episode of My Life on the D-List where I was like auditioning to work there, but frankly, it was like a blur. So I said to her, look, I'll tell you, I wasn't looking too good that day putting a vacuum clean together. I wish I'd had your mop. She laughed, and then she turned on the nurturing tone that Jennifer Lawrence clearly adopted to play her so well and said, we have to do something together. I mean, there's got to be something that you and I can do together, you can sell. Oh my God, she was so charming and genuine. I mean, really, it was as if I was in the movie in that scene at the end where people are sitting across the desk and she's like trying to help them. I mean, this was my wet dream. I immediately started to feel like I could be one of those women that she like lifts up and helps realize their business goals. I had to be honest with her though. I go, trust me, Joy, I would love nothing more for my money to make money, to be a brand, to have a product. You know, like everybody else, I want to be Diddy with Chirac or Jessica Simpson with those shoes. But I said, Joy, unfortunately, I only have buckets of dick jokes. I've only been able to make money the boots on the ground way, doing stand-up or being on television, one joke at a time. But she wouldn't let go of the idea of us working together. And I loved it. I'm pretty sure my quick-fire idea in the moment didn't go well. I said, how about instead of a bucket, we sell a can of dick jokes? But, you know, I'm just brainstorming. Kathy's bottle of freckles, Kathy's trouble be gone juice, ingredients to be determined later with the help of my mom, Kathy's lesbian flats. Okay, I'm going to work on the name, but you guys all know what I'm talking about. But it will not be a line of funny dog clothing, okay? If one more person suggests that, I'm going to hit him with one of those joy mops. Manilow, comma, Barry. Bathhouse pianist made good. I know there are fools who may think of Barry as a guy who's once had a top-of-the-charts heyday and is now kind of a has-been. Oh, let me tell you, he's not. He's insanely rich. That publishing money? That's what you want. He even wrote the song, I Write the Songs. Let me put it this way. When Barry shows up for Clive Davis's Grammy party, which is in Beverly Hills, he takes his jet, 
from Palm Springs. It's a 20-minute flight tops. Look, maybe he thinks it'll save him some time so he can, you know, write some more songs. He does live music 24-7. It's actually one of the things I love about him. He has to be reminded to do things like eat. Really. He's constantly doing music. He's very tall, rather lanky man. The other thing is that Brooklyn accent, which I got to tell you about because we don't hear him talk all that much, but it's hard to forget. Now, sure, there's the whole look, the feathered hair, the tanner, the padded shoulders, all that. But when you hear him talk, he turns into Tony Soprano. That said, he doesn't do a lot of talking. So when you sit with me, though, at a party, you're going to answer my questions. He and I played this game multiple times. One year I said to him, so Bear, every Grammy nominee is performing here tonight. So many greats, so many legends, so many new faces. Who are you looking forward to seeing? He goes, Jennifer. And I'm thinking, Jennifer. And I go, oh, Jennifer Hudson. He goes, I love Jennifer. I go, yeah, she's incredible. Never lip syncs. I mean, she's going to be great. He goes, so looking forward to Jennifer. I don't want to see Johnny. I go, Johnny? He goes, Johnny Mathis. Johnny's going to sing Chances Are. I want to see what Johnny's up to. <laughs> I admit, this one was my bad. I kind of thought Johnny Mathis was dead. That's my bad. But he was performing? Okay, this is all going to be great. This is incredible. I just want to say, I'm a kid from Forest Park, Illinois. I never thought I would see any of this in my lifetime. I was practically crying. And yet, that still didn't stop me from thinking I was talking to a mob boss at the time with the whole, I want to see what Johnny's up to, Brooklyn ease. Is there going to be an offer that can't be refused? I mean, refused. Barry, that's amazing. By the way, you must be excited about Jenna Fa or Jennifer because she's going to be singing her new duet Trouble with Iggy Azalea. Pause. Manila goes, what's an Iggy? Uh, before I could start laughing, I said, well, uh, Bear, and Iggy is an Australian white girl who's also a rapper. She and Jennifer have a duet, and I think you're going to like it. He goes, ugh, is that the talk singing? I go, yeah, it's uh, the talk singing. He goes, that's where they lose me. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, when Jennifer Hudson came out and sang, Barry did this thing I've only seen a handful of top music guys do. He leaned forward, elbows on the table with his hands clasped, and rested his chin on his hands and closed his eyes. Clive Davis does this. Quincy Jones does this. They are purists about the music, about listening. They don't care about the outfit or if someone's being drunk or obnoxious nearby. They just know how to tune it all out. It's pretty great to watch. Well, Barry Manilow did it for Jennifer. Then Iggy Azalea started. Barry opens his eyes, turns to me, and says, Get the jet. Manilow out. Mars, comma, Bruno. Filipino Jersey boy. It's getting harder to do, but when I met a star-studded award show like the Grammys and stuck sitting in the back with fans, interns, assistants, I'll jump up, run down to the front rows where the big names are all clumped together, and I'll just grab a departing celebrity seat faster than you can say shut up Kanye. The last time I did it successfully was 2012, when I stole the seat of a country singer who lost, and then he just left. Uh, why would anyone leave? I was on the aisle, a choice spot for being in, you know, camera shots, for example, and maybe craning one's neck to see who's around me, and of course, for bolting, if security realizes what I've done. In this case, after my self-actualized upgrade, I noticed that Bruno Mars was across from me, to the right, maybe five feet away. And a few feet away to the left of me was my buddy David Grohl from the Foo Fighters. Now, Bruno had already approached me earlier before the show and said really complimentary things, which I thought was really cool. He was in a great mood. I mean, after all, he was up for at least like five major awards, including song, record, album, pop, performance, pretty much everything. But this was also the year someone else was up for all those same awards, a certain singer named Adele. Remember now, the televised Grammys don't give out a whole lot of awards, but of the ones they do, most were in those really big categories. I may not have had a legitimate front row seat, but I did for the spectacle that was Bruno Mars getting visibly pissier every time he lost an award. The first time he lost, he made a mildly stifled show of, I guess, discontent. And then he just kind of looked at me, and I look at him, and I mouth the words, you were robbed, which is maybe the worst thing you can do to somebody in that situation. Fan the fires of their indignation when they're supposed to 
act like they don't really care about losing. So um, I did it again. Second loss. Third loss. Bruno is barely suppressing his outburst at this point, and he's looking back at me as if to say, like, can you fucking believe this? And I'm looking back at him, like, huh, right back at you with eye rolls that are like, oh, Bruno, this is bullshit. Now, I knew that Dave Grohl was watching me do all this because his eyes bore right into mine, and he made the slice across the throat with his finger symbol as if to say, okay, too much, not cute, not funny. Yeah, I got it. But I have to say, part of me both loves the show I got to see and admires how this massively gifted star wasn't going to be anything but just openly honest about being a sore loser, something I have no experience with. For the final award of the night, for which Bruno Mars was also nominated, he lost to Adele again. Bruno was still backstage after his performance when the live cameras caught his extremely candid reaction to losing once again. If I could have, I would have run backstage to, you know, console him. But it took me the full force of the Foo Fighters to shut my ass down. Merchant, comma, Stephen. British beanpole, almost fiancé. Ricky Gervais once suggested I go out on a date with his writing partner, the freakishly tall, nebbishy-looking, brilliant Stephen Merchant. They collaborated on the original British version of The Office and the HBO show Extras, and Merchant, of course, has his own series, Hello, Ladies. So dating him seemed a very remote possibility, literally, because Merchant lives in England. But Gervais liked the idea, or joking about it, because he said devilishly, oh, I talked to Stephen about you one time, and he's scared of you. I rolled my eyes and I said, well, you can also tell him that there's my act, but then there's a human me. Okay, so I spotted Merchant for the first time when I was having lunch at the outdoor patio of the Chateau Marmont in L.A. I walk up to him, Merchant? He turned to me and it was as if all six feet, seven inches of him began to shrink. <laughs> and he goes, oh, no, 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 scared of you. No, no, scared, please, no, no. It was so funny I couldn't stop laughing. I was, of course, charmed by him instantly, but, you know, nothing came of it. Then a little while later, I booked a one-day role on the Farrelly Brothers film Hall Pass, in which Merchant co-starred, and on the set, I ran up to him to get a selfie. As I was pulling him aside, he continued the bit, oh no, oh no, petrified, don't want trouble, please help, no, please someone, anyone. I even got the Farrelly Brothers involved, telling them within his earshot, will you talk to your skinny star? All right, he's being all scared. Too scared to fuck me, apparently. What's the big deal? I mean, I'd crush him. But other than that, and Merchant just kept, see, see, this is what I mean. Hello, haven't said anything negative about you. Don't want to be in your stage show. See, you look lovely, being nice. Hello, help, don't want trouble. Wow, Gervais really put the fear of God into him. Milan, Caesar. Dog whisperer, trainer of humans. Look, I'm not a paid spokesperson for Cesar Milan, but I can tell you he's come to my house twice and actually whispered at my dogs to the point where they behaved so well that I wished they could speak so they could tell me exactly what the fuck he said to them to convince them to act completely different. In fact, they were acting like magical, perfect dogs. My mistake was never getting him to train my 96-year-old mother. I mean, God knows she doesn't listen to me. Where was I? After I got to know Caesar, he came to my house to interview me for one of his books, and basically, he wanted to know why an obnoxious comedian has a bond with dogs. So I told him that I'm normal like anybody else, that when I'm on the road, what gets me in my gut is missing my mom and my dogs. So it'll be three in the morning, and maybe I'll have just finished a show, had a meal, you know, and what brings me to that calm, relaxing place is just looking at videos of my own dogs. Caesar welled up listening to me talk like that, and that's why I love him. He's the real deal about canines. He actually said, that's what I want people to get. Dogs save lives. So I admire Caesar. He's written about really vulnerable issues. And he wrote about him having suicidal thoughts. And you know, people love him worldwide because he's so candid. He's a very successful guy. He's very honest about his feelings. So that being said, he's also a very good sport about my particular um, brand of humor. So on the early seasons of Dog Whisperer, he was operating out of a South Central neighborhood that looked scarier than really any of the dogs he's ever dealt with. So I told him, I go, Caesar, it looks like the fucked up doghood. I always called it that. I know that's a very un -PC expression. I was just trying to make him laugh. But I do think he should have made an animated all dog version of Boys in the Hood, Barks in the Hood. 
He goes, well, I'm not afraid. And I said, well, of course you're not afraid. You've got 80 pit bulls. But he really does have the touch. My dog, Pom Pom, is a um, secret assassin, probably funded by Oprah Winfrey, Inc. I can't prove that. She will not allow another dog into the house. And yet when Caesar visited, when I still had Chance and Pom Pom was younger, he brought five dogs into my house. And the effect was almost comical. Pom Pom sat like a princess on an imaginary tuffet and Chance just drooled. That was it. It was like Caesar brought some instant hex. He really will get your dogs to do things they've never done before. And then I was that person being like, oh my gosh, Pom Pom has never done that before. Oh, I know I sounded like every person has ever been on any episode of Caesar shows. I obviously don't have the touch. And I admit, I, I don't always like follow up on the training Caesar tells me I'm supposed to do. You should know, though, the minute he leaves, it's back to the bad doggy behavior. All right, maybe it's sort of my fault, but I can't resist joking to Caesar. Look, why don't you just make the tagline at the end of every one of your episodes a little more honest? I am Caesar Milan. I am the dog whisperer. Until I leave your house and you're screwed. Caesar, if you're reading this, you still have a standing offer to just move in to my palatial mansion whenever you want. Just don't leave. I need my sofas intact. Morgan, comma, Tracy. Comedian? Next president? I once had a five-day-in-a-row commercial gig, and I got to meet and work with the following people for five days in a row. It was me, Jim Gaffigan, Michael Ian Black, Deborah Wilson, Tracy Morgan. Okay. <laughs> it was a great ad campaign. It was fun to do, and it's where I got to really get to know the indomitable and unforgettable Tracy Morgan. My time with him was magical because even though he was up and down, laughing one day and then like crying the next over something that would touch him, he just says the kind of hilariously crazy things that keep you on your toes. So he was exactly the way you would think he could be. And he would joke about it. Tracy will just randomly say things like, now, Kathy Griffin, I don't know. If my queen doesn't dole out my pills right, I'm not sure what's going to happen, Kathy Griffin. Weirdly enough, I feel as if I share something in common with Tracy and that we're both 24-7 comics, almost out of necessity. If he and I happen to run into each other on the worst days of our lives, we're still able to riff. With him, there's no like real downtime, you know? Comics are not always wild about other comics who are always on, but I'll riff anywhere with anyone. And Tracy is such a genius. He's unfiltered in the best way. It's fun to bite whenever he says something nutty. I'm about to get you pregnant, Kathy Griffin. That's how fine you're looking. Now, you don't respond to that by thinking, how dare he objectify me? If you're Kathy Griffin, you go, tonight could be the night, Trace. Let me find out if that last remaining egg somewhere deep, deep in my ovaries is in the mood. I mean, he clearly has no shame about his issues, whatever meds he was taking, so on. So I wasn't surprised that he allowed the producers of 30 Rock to make his over-the-top character, Tracy Jordan, a heightened version of himself. If he offends people, and he has, I'm telling you, he doesn't know it. Backstage at the Kennedy Center, when Eddie Murphy was getting his Mark Twain prize, Trace's appearance there was all anyone could talk about. He had just made his triumphant return to Saturday Night Live the night before after a debilitating truck accident that nearly killed him. And even Eddie Murphy was asking, how is he? How is he? But Tracy came out, guns blazing, and kicked ass, ignoring the producer's ban on using the N-word by telling a joke that had the whole stuffy Kennedy Center audience in stitches. I got a quiet moment with Tracy backstage that I will always cherish. We started reminiscing about our week together doing that commercial shoot, remembering the details, talking about how much fun we had, and it gave me hope about the traumatic brain injury diagnosis he got from the crash. So he needed to sit down for a second, and he admitted that he was, like, really hurting. It was hard for him to do SNL, and then to go do the Eddie Murphy tribute. It's like doing two tough gigs in a row. But he also said, you know how it is, Kathy? As long as I can be making people laugh, that's all I care about, Kathy Griffin. I might be pregnant. Malali, comma, Megan. Actress, pal. I've known Meg for a long time, as in doing student films together in the 80s and 90s long time. She's a pal. She's the kind of pal that will only trot out the Karen voice from Will and Grace for my mom. Well, during one of those long ago student film shoots, when we were struggling actors, she told me about auditioning for Warren Beatty for Dick Tracy 
the movie. And for years afterward, I love telling people what really happened to Meg Mullally. Meg is an incredible singer, so I would get all excited regaling friends, acquaintances, and talk show hosts with how she won the role of Breathless Mahoney after auditioning at Warren Beatty's house and how she'd gotten those famous Warren Beatty calls at 2 a.m., you know, asking if she wanted to come over, maybe for some sex, and how Meg was a struggling actress but not inclined to accept his advances. So on the third such phone call after his, it's Warren, do you want to come up? She politely replied, Warren, have I ever wanted to? And how Madonna then swooped in and stole the role of Breathless Mahoney from Meg. Because, well, maybe Madonna did respond to those phone calls in the affirmative. Can you imagine thinking your career was going to change overnight and that you'd be starring in a big-budget musical film only to find out Madonna used her feminine wiles to ruin the life of the adorable Megan Mullally in one day. Oh, how brutal Hollywood can be. Well, I love that story. I had a feeling Meg hadn't told me everything, though. So we were together somewhere years after this story of hers had been a part of my repertoire, surrounded by people. And I said, Meg, why don't you tell the real story, okay? You were banging Warren Beatty, Madonna caught wind of it, she stole the role from you, (laughs) and you had to recover. Are you so afraid of Madonna that you can't even be honest? Meg's eyes got wide. She laughed so loud, and she said, Kathy, I love that you think my life is so exciting, but let me remind you of what actually happened. Then she proceeded to tell me that she did audition once for Breathless Mahoney. (laughs) Warren Beatty did tell her he'd be happy to take her to lunch or dinner in a platonic way, and then the role went to Madonna. (sighs) Apparently, Madonna did not steal the role of Breathless Mahoney from Megan. According to Megan, she was never even really given the role. Look, here's the deal. My version of the story is way better, and I have no shame about the fact that I've told it for years. I definitely told it on Jimmy Kimmel. I may have told it in one of my specials and just hadn't gotten caught yet. My version is torrid, juicy, and I haven't met a gay man yet who didn't believe me. After she heard the version, I had been generous enough to spread for her over the years. She goes, all right, well... 10% of that story is true. Well, 10% is all I need, honey. Murphy, comma, Eddie. Comedy giant, recluse. I had a few lines in the movie Shrek Forever After, and as part of the promotion, DreamWorks honcho Jeffrey Katzenberg gathered the big four, Mike Myers, Cameron Diaz, Antonio Banderas, and Eddie Murphy, and then those of us who voice, like, new characters, for a group photo session at the Soho House in Los Angeles. The photographer only had 10 minutes to get everybody together for one photo, and I happened to be lucky enough to be seated behind Eddie Murphy. I had heard all the rumors about him being unapproachable, that he doesn't do appearances, and all this stuff, so this felt like maybe the only chance I would ever have to meet one of my comedy idols. He was mellow enough, and he sort of seemed to recognize me. All I know is he sat in front of me. I was afraid to talk to him. He turned around. I said, hi, nice to meet you. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're great. So glad you're here. All right. I could walk away saying I met the great Eddie Murphy and that he was nice and he wasn't weird. I'm happy, right? So then there's another slight pause in the photo shoot, and we had a second of downtime, and I recognized the chance to maybe initiate a little conversation, right? So I thought about it. Eddie's right in front of me, and I'm thinking, oh gosh, oh gosh, what can I ask the great Eddie Murphy, or uh, what can I say to him? So I waited, and then I finally came up with the perfect thing. I said, hey, how's it going? All right, I'm not proud of that. But look, I was in Proximity to Brilliance, and I can't tell you how many times I've watched Delirious and Raw. Kathy Griffin, the fan, gets nervous. Well, Of all the chit-chatty questions to actually take seriously, Eddie chose that one. So he turns around and quietly says, I'm paraphrasing, but something like, well, most days I wake up in my mansion around three o'clock, fight depression, and try to work up the strength to get out of bed. 
and then turned around. Um, <laughs> I don't know to this day if he was joking or not. I'm going to go with not, but the honesty floored me. And by the way, it like hit home, like what a guy like that has gone through. He's a talent who's had the highest of highs, the lowest of lows. I absolutely loved how brutally frank he was. And by the way, in, of all places, at a photo shoot to someone he didn't even know. What is it that maybe something like that could only be said comic to comic? I think it's true. You know, I think most comics deal with these issues and we tend to be somewhat open with one another. I don't know. But five years later, when I was asked to pay tribute to Eddie at the Kennedy Center when he was given the Mark Twain Prize, I knew I had to have a great personal story about him. But first, quick sidebar. I also want to let you know, the night before the Mark Twain taping, Eddie and his family were incredibly sweet and welcoming to me. We were both staying at the same upscale hotel in Georgetown. I mean, of course, Eddie had the penthouse. How do I know this? Dave Chappelle made the mistake of pointing out Eddie's room number to me. And in the moments before I put on my fancy cocktail dress for a dinner honoring Eddie the night before, I was hanging out in my room in my pajamas. It was only 5 p.m. Why would I be dressed yet? You know, I can't help it. I love walking the halls of fancy hotels in my not-at-all-fancy penis-repellent pajamas. It always gets a laugh from strangers. And damn it, I was going to go get my laugh from Eddie Murphy. So I marched up to Eddie's room and bum-rushed him. He then threw his arms around me and said to the amusement of everyone in his room, Oh, okay, you're like one of those eccentric people. I spent quite a few hours in their suite with Eddie's crew, Chappelle, Arsenio Hall, hanging out, laughing. I mean, it was awesome. Now back to the next day, the Mark Twain event itself. So I had to find some way to not bring the place down or sandbag the amazing Eddie Murphy with maybe one of his darkest <laughs> feelings he had shared with me all those years before. So I admit, and I have to tell you this because I never do this, I fudged something for the greater good of a loving tribute to an extraordinary comedian. I don't ever do that. I kept the part about him telling me he has bad days, but I changed the ending to a complete fabrication, which is, <laughs> this is what I said on the Mark Twain show, that he leaned in and said, instead of saying, you know, I wake up every day, I'm exhausted, I'm depressed, blah, blah, blah. I say that he leaned in, he goes, I have good days and bad days, but otherwise, I'm still Eddie fucking Murphy. I labored for weeks over what to say that would get righteous applause for a hero of mine, stay somewhat true to the nature of our small exchange, and yet still have it sound like it came from Eddie. I'm coming clean about it here because I want you all to know that Eddie's actual candor in an unexpected moment was like really meaningful to me and reflective of what comedians have been known to go through. He may not have said a few of those words I told the Kennedy Center audience, but in a brief moment at the photo shoot, he really was Eddie fucking Murphy to me. Nicholson, comma, Jack. Legend? Joker? Cuckoo? Holy shit balls! I'll bet you never thought your Kathy Griffin spent an evening seated next to the great Jack Nicholson at an exclusive, small, eight to ten person dinner party. Twice. Look, I am as aware as you that this man has always been shrouded in mystery, riddles, enigma, and public and private scandals, but most importantly, is recognized as a cinematic icon and larger-than-life person. I'm going to give you the reason that you bought this book. I'm going to describe what it's like to be in a private living room when he walks in. Because when people speak in cliches about movie stars or the it factor, I can tell you I felt it in the air, and it was tangible. Even the hostess herself, Sue, announced his presence with a not-so-subtle, The King is here. I couldn't take my eyes off him. Okay, I get it. You're thinking, no kidding, Kathy, neither would I. But Jack Nicholson has that quality that is truly magnetic. It was fascinating to watch him enter the room in a suit and tie with all the quirks, mystery, and the Nicholsonisms you could ever hope for. So what do I do? Try to make him laugh, of course. Did I succeed the first time? No. Here was my attempt. I had just won my first Emmy, so I brought it with me to the dinner party. And I tried a bit in which I said to Jack upon first meeting him, excuse me, Jack, I don't know if you've seen a real live Emmy in person. My name is Kathy Griffin. I'm thrilled to meet you. But just know that if you want to touch it or take a photo with it, 
It's fine. I don't mean to rub it in, but an Emmy is physically larger than an Academy Award. He looked at me like I was from Mars. And since he's from Mars, I was fine with that. Even my friends call me an acquired taste. He carried himself as if he didn't realize how imposing he was, and yet still came across like a younger, dapper man. He was clearly there to hang with his old pals. The hostess told a story I found unbelievably charming about how she and Jack had gone down to a local, really down-and-dirty, well-known L.A. burger joint called Tommy's. And look, maybe they just had the munchies. I don't know or care. But what I wish I had was security footage of the dude working the counter at Tommy's burger joint taking an order from Jack Nicholson. At the dinner table, I was seated between Lorne Michaels, whom I barely know, and Jack, who didn't know me at all. Though I could easily talk to Lauren because we have comedy stuff in common, obviously I really wanted to just listen to Jack Nicholson. He talked movies, a bit of politics, and occasionally he would just laugh at nothing in particular. So thinking I'd miss something, I would turn to Jack and be like, what? What'd I miss? And he would just say stuff like, you know, you look good, honey. So at one point I turned to Lauren, I go, so um, is Jack like this all the time? Because he's just laughed three times in a row now at uh, nothing. Lauren was cutting a piece of meat at the time, and without looking up, he just went, all the charm. The second dinner with Jack, though, I got to hear him talk about his own movies, everything from The Departed to the famous hot tub scene with Kathy Bates in About Schmidt. It was the stuff that dreams are made of. He even talked about The Shining. I mean, it was amazing listening to him talk about working with director Stanley Kubrick. He peppered these stories with his usual Nicholsonisms, like looking away, seemingly lost in thought, and then just laughing. But being in that rarefied, cozy atmosphere where a silver screen superstar is spinning yarns about his movies was indescribably cool. There was enough of a chumminess building up that I got a little bolder, and I turned to him and I said, are you ever going to settle down? And he said with a devilish twinkle in his eye, I think when old Paris turns 30, I'll be 75, and she and I will be exactly in tune at exactly the right time for both of us. I thought that was so funny. Later, by the way, I told Paris Hilton that story. She just gave me like a blank stare. But by the end of the second dinner, I got the sense that he maybe knew who I was a little bit. So I timed my departure to coincide with his, which meant he and I were in the driveway together. As his driver was getting his car, I was, well, standing next to Jack Nicholson. I got up the nerve to just say, you know, Jack, I always love talking to you. And then he said, Kathy, you've never looked better. I immediately got off flush. In all seriousness, he could have said any generic form of good night or like just called me Joe or Anne. But what touched me, and I know this sounds silly, he knew my name. So for a Forest Park, Illinois girl who went to all of his movies, it just kind of doesn't get better than that. Wait a minute. That's as good as it gets. Nick's comma Stevie. Velvet Gypsy. Singer. Possible Wiccan? I know I'm going to borrow a great expression from my assistant, John. It's one he has for the icons he loves, and it's, quote, relevant in every decade. As much as I love the kids who pop up and blow everyone away, it's the legends who really get me. My second concert ever was Fleetwood Mac, back in the Rumors tour days. Stevie Nicks has been my silver spring ever since. It was such a thrill to have her as a guest on my life on the D-list in the great moment where Bette Midler calls her to rally Grammy support for me. I believe Cher's quote in full Cher voice was, Stevie's one of the good ones. She's always been a great girl. At our first in-person meeting, we just hit it off and already we felt like we knew each other. She was performing at a very fancy post-Emmy party and I wrapped my arms around her and we just started chatting. We actually forgot that we were on a red carpet, and while the cameras were going off, we were having like a real conversation that was fun and genuine. She's one of those legends. I just want to make her laugh. Oh, and she's a great laugher. One night at the Fillmore in San Francisco, a legendary rock venue where I filmed my first HBO special, by the way, Stevie was doing a solo show, and my boyfriend surprised me with tickets. I reached out to her, said I was coming, and then she and I emailed about having a chat backstage after her show. But I didn't know that that night she was about to blow my freaking mind. There I was in the balcony fangirling out, and Stevie, draped in her full Stevie, flowy, witchy, sexy getup, stops the show and says, and I'm not making this up, people, my friend, the hilarious Kathy Griffin, who has made me laugh so many times, is here in the audience tonight. So I'm dedicating this next song to her. And that song was a little ditty you may have heard of called Landslide.
I could not have been more excited and touched at the same time. So the last time I saw her was backstage at the Forum in L.A., and we got right down to business. We just love talking about all the rock and roll dudes who've lost it all to failed marriages or baby mamas and how the girls of rock and the girls of comedy are not all that different when it comes to holding on to the hard-earned dough. Is she on board and supportive of me traveling the road with my boyfriend, who's also my tour manager? You're damn right. Stevie will last a lot longer than a lot of the others from that era because her audience never vanishes. LGBTs and women of all ages worship her, and she's told me that whenever another date gets added, whether it's to her solo tour or the Fleetwood Mac tour, she loves it. I'm grateful, she told me. Do you know how many of my friends who, like Fleetwood Mac, played stadiums back in the day, now come up to me and tell me they're playing 200-seat theaters? It's not lost on me that we're still touring as a group and we're playing the forum. That's what she said. I guess the fact that she and I talk about the road like we're peers just kills me. She said she's building a silver bullet trailer on the beach to be a perfect writing space, and when it's finished, she wants me to come over and we can write together, or I can use it to write. First of all, I'm in. I'm just going to lie and tell her I'm writing something, like I'm a poet now or some shit. But can you just picture the two of us sitting side by side in a silver bullet trailer with notepads? Because we're not going to use computers, let's face it. I can. Stevie will be writing haunting, beautiful lyrics. I'm going to be writing my dick jokes and, you know, running them by her naturally to see if she laughs. Night Stalker, comma, the serial killer, so not my boyfriend. On a side note, a lot of people think this is the craziest story in the book, so enjoy. 1989 is more than just the title of the wildly successful Taylor Swift album. It's also the year that I decided to turn to my then-boyfriend Andrew and say, you know, as an actress in training, I should get as much life experience as I can. And I just realized I've never attended a real live trial. The local TV news in Los Angeles was obsessed with covering the trial of Richard Ramirez, dubbed the Night Stalker, who had terrorized L.A. and San Francisco throughout the early 80s with multiple home invasion, rapes, assaults, murders. He was captured in 1985, and his trial started in 1988. The boyfriend and I made it downtown to the criminal courts building and managed to snag seats in the third row. Soon after, I heard the distinctive sound of metal rattling. I look up. And there was Ramirez, wearing handcuffs and shackles around his ankles. I don't know what came over me, but I decided to indulge a crazy notion that I had that I would stare him down. Yeah, I don't know why either. I wanted to give him the, you're going down glare, that is terrified, you know, probably nobody ever. There's nothing to gain from staring down a captured killer who's undoubtedly so bored by now that he'd actually find a curly-haired crazy lady scowling at him amusing. But I was intent on staring him down, and damn it, I did. Ramirez stared right back. He did not smile. He looked straggly. His frame was tall and thin. He did not present himself as someone who was trying to show his innocence. Of course I'd seen him on the news, but... Up close, he actually really stared me down in a way that anyone would label as menacing. So my then-boyfriend, Andrew, under his breath, goes, Is he looking at you? And I go, Shh, I'm working. All right, having seen plenty of TV shows and movies, I was expecting to see tears, pointing, loud objections, and gavel banging. Instead, I'll be honest, it was over an hour of detailed testimony about Ramirez's sneakers. Granted, it was illuminating to see how a defense lawyer wears down a witness with potentially damning testimony, bogged down the person with details and inconsistencies. Well, was it navy or regular blue on those shoes? I mean, that kind of thing. Then they started down the same road of specificity about a blanket. A blanket? Recess was called. Now, I was surprised to see that the attorneys for both sides, as well as the jurors and spectators, were all sharing the same space in the hallway. The lawyers seemed chummy with each other, and the jurors were talking to each other. Nobody was sequestered. This is not what I was expecting. Okay, however, I took it all in as an exercise for my acting training. Remember, this was the real reason I was there? I went to the ladies' room right off the hallway, and after I emerged from the stall, I recognized a woman from the courtroom washing her hands next to me. So I casually said, Now, that last witness, do you think the sneaker they were talking about... And she just turned and walked away. Rude. (laughs) I thought we were all chummy at the Night Stalker trial. Well, when I came out of the bathroom, 
I instantly felt hands on me. Sheriff's deputies yanked away my purse and searched its contents while another pair of officers dragged me away as I heard my boyfriend himself being held back yell, Where are you taking her? I screamed back to him, I don't know. <laughs> Was I being kicked out? Worse, they ushered me into the judge's chambers. I was shaking so hard, I could barely concentrate on anything. I thought I was going to jail. I had been in row three among everyday people, and now for some reason I'm facing Superior Court Judge Michael Tynan, and I don't even know why. The attorneys for both sides were also in the room. Was this a horrible mistake? The court stenographer was there as well. And when she started typing, that's what made me think, oh shit, this is official. One of the attorneys said to me, Tell the judge about the incident in the restroom. I was so scared. I swear, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Incident? Restroom? So I said, I went to the restroom? I swear to God, I was afraid to talk. Was I going to prison based on what I would say at this moment? Then the woman I spoke to at the sink was brought in, and a brief sense of relief washed over me. So I go, hey, you're the lady from the restroom. Again, the attorneys go, what'd you say to her? And I said, oh, I was just asking about the sneaker because <laughs> I like that. And then I just described the bathroom scene, which to my mind was going to end all this nonsense because the nice lady over there would clear it all up for me. No one said a word for a while. And then Judge Tynan said, we're going to return you to your seat, but you're not allowed to leave. Back in the courtroom, I noticed that all the spectators were gone and the jury had been excused as well. So it was me, my boyfriend, the woman from the bathroom, both teams of attorneys, and Richard Ramirez, the night stalker. And by the way, I could tell Ramirez's attorneys were loving this. When the judge called back the jury and audience members, the term they actually use, by the way, for spectators, audience members, I thought my nightmare was over. Then Judge Tynan says to the entire courtroom, Miss Griffin, approach the bench. Oh, shit. I get up, I walk through that little creaky, like, swinging gate, and then the judge goes, stop. So he stops me right next to Ramirez, who's staring up at me, like, close enough to touch me. He's just staring up at me during the following exchange. The judge says, what's your name? And I go, Kathy Griffin? Barely audible. Then he says, where do you reside? <laughs> Very softly. 2637 Sentinella, Santa Monica. And as soon as the words came out of my mouth, I realized Richard Ramirez is looking at me and I'm saying my home address out loud to the fucking Night Stalker. This is maybe worse than going to jail. Then the judge says, what is your relationship with Mr. Ramirez? I said, none. And then it dawns on me. I'm thinking, oh my God. Then the judge says, have you ever corresponded with Mr. Ramirez? No, I answered. Holy shitballs. They think I'm one of those psycho chicks that pursues serial killers. Do you have feelings for Mr. Ramirez? None, Your Honor. I see where this is going, and it's not going to be good for me. What do you do for a living? Then I said, I'm a loan officer in a bank. Let me explain. That last answer was a lie. Yes, I had just stated out loud my home address in the presence of a psychopathic killer, which, incidentally, my late brother Gary, who was a trial attorney, told me later I didn't have to do. But I certainly was not stupid enough to admit in a court of law that actually I was an out-of-work wannabe actress, because that would sound stupid. Telling an unrepentant, still not convicted criminal where I live? That I would do. But saying, well, I'm taking commercial classes in Van Nuys, <laughs> fingers crossed for that, right, Your Honor? Or maybe a juicy, non-paying role in a student film? That could be good, Your Honor. And I'm starting soon at the Lee Strasberg Academy. Yeah, those things I deemed too embarrassing. So I lied and said I worked in a bank. Then the judge says, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a case of possible jury tampering. So I seriously am thinking, this is it. I'm going to jail. Tell my mom and dad I love them. Listeners. It was a member of the jury I'd started talking to at the restroom sink. You, you guys probably knew that. And before you ask yourself, did she know she was on the jury? Yes, I did. But, and this is one of the reasons I regret not going to college, 
I truly didn't think it was inappropriate to ask a juror a question as long as the question wasn't, do you think he's innocent or guilty? That's right. Learn from me, law students. Even worse, the trial had already had its issues with jury tampering, as the judge reminded everyone that day, adding, as he put it, we cannot afford to lose another juror. In other words, naive dumbass Kathleen Griffin and her little sneaker small talk could have inadvertently led to a mistrial for one of the worst serial killers in recent memory. By the way, during the trial, a juror was actually murdered which eventually wasn't attributed to Ramirez, but it understandably had put that entire jury on edge for the whole trial. I know that now. That judge really humiliated me. I just stood there and took it. It was crushing, but I was terrified, and I was dutifully chastised. Finally, the judge actually came out and said in front of everybody, Why are you here? And I answered, I um, wanted to see a real live trial in a real courthouse and everything. And the judge goes, well, you certainly picked a good one. Take your seat. Everybody laughs. Um, just, you know, that was my first and last time attending a trial, but somewhere buried deep in the court transcripts for People versus Richard Raymond Ramirez is Kathy Griffin, who lives at 2637 Centinella. O'Donnell, comma, Rosie. Comedian, talk show host, pal, connector. When I call my good friend Rosie a connector, it's not just about someone who introduces me to famous people. What Rosie has is a skill for joining people together who are likely to develop meaningful bonds. If it weren't for Rosie, I wouldn't have met Cher, the Estefans, Bette Midler, or Rachel Ray. And these are not some of my closest pals in the business. She's like a chef, and her friends are ingredients she likes to toss together and make something special. That's how insightful and smart she is. She actually knows the stuff. But she also makes good on these promise connections, which is unusual. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you should meet my friend, and then they don't do anything. She makes good on it. That's what's rare. We met in the mid-90s when she was in Los Angeles taping episodes of her giant hit daytime talk show, and suddenly Susan snagged her for a guest role as herself. I'll never forget her telling me I was funny, because that means so much, and after that, I appeared on the Rosie O'Donnell daytime talk show several times, and if there was ever an instance when the show was even booked with guests, she would just say stuff like, come on as a surprise, like Johnny Carson used to do. So one time she even flew my mom and dad to New York, and they had never even been to the Big Apple in their lives. She put them up at the Parker Meridian and had them make a quick appearance on her talk show. To this day, my mom still talks about that trip and Rosie's generosity. Rosie believed in me from the jump, and it was a very serious boost to my confidence as a comic. Of course, I love that she's outspoken and a showbiz pioneer as an out lesbian, but there was a moment from that Suddenly Susan taping that really hit home to me about how unique her place was in the entertainment world. I've never told the story before. We were filming scenes on the Rosie talk show set. Her real audience was still there, even though we were doing scenes for Sunny Susan. So she asked them to stick around for us, and they agreed. They were going to be the audience for the Sunny Susan part as well. Anyway, Rosie then expressed some dissatisfaction with a line in the script that had a reference to the gay community. So she said to one of the writers, you know, I'm just not going to say this. So the writer who wrote it said, well, I wrote it and I'm gay. Rosie wasn't out at the time yet, and I'll never forget this. She was still mic'd up so the crew members could hear her, not the audience. But she didn't make a big deal out of making a secret. And she said, look, I know, I'm gay. It's not that I don't know what being gay is, but I have small children and I go do stand-up comedy on the weekends in places where I would fear for my life and the lives of my kids if I became the openly gay talk show host and stand-up comic. It's different for me as a mom. Now, remember, this is before Ellen announced herself as a lesbian, but Ellen didn't have kids or daytime talk show, and she was winning over the heartland of America. But Rosie's words always struck me because it meant she was out to everyone she worked with, and obviously to friends, but not to the world. It was as if she'd created this experimental staging area for herself from which she could plot the right moment to come out. And she did near the end of her show's run. But I remember showbiz friends calling Rosie a hypocrite, like pretending to have a crush on Tom Cruise and stuff like that. But secretly, I knew there'd be bigger power in her coming out when it was on her terms. 
as a super successful TV figure. And it was indeed powerful, and I was always proud of her for that. She opened my eyes to the timing of a gay joke, and I feel as if I did the same for her when I, and I take a lot of pride in this, helped her reconcile with Joan Rivers. Joan would make these jokes about Rosie in a way that, um, let's just say Rosie didn't care for. (laughs) And then Rosie would say, how can you be friends with Joan Rivers? She's so mean. And I would tell her she can feel however she wants, but Joan has been so wonderful to me and I'll always adore her. And then eventually Rosie saw Joan somewhere, walked up to Joan and said, I don't know what to do. Kathy Griffin has nothing but nice stories about you. And they made up on the spot. So when Joan passed away, Rosie and I attended her funeral together with Rachel Ray and Kristen Chenoweth. Rosie was even kind enough to arrange the car and all the logistics, always connecting. And that's who she is. Orman, comma, Susie. Financial guru, girlfriend, approved. You haven't lived until you've had a lesbian Super Bowl party. There, I said it. What I mean by that is my good pal Susie Orman and her wife KT were in Los Angeles, coincidentally, the day of the Madonna Super Bowl. I don't know what the teams were, and I don't care. I was just happy to have two of my favorite ladies visiting for the day. Susie has been a genuine, not Hollywood, but actual friend since I threw myself at her mercy and cold called her. Ten years ago, I was dealing with a complicated and very personal financial issue. Without skipping a beat, she said, Come to my office and bring all the financials you want me to see. She does talk like that. (laughs) This woman knows her stuff. She lives it. She is a true believer and is on a mission to help people from all walks of life make the emotional connection between their financial issues and their everyday life choices. Anyway, back to Madonna. Susie and I were goofing around, holding hairbrushes, singing like a prayer alongside Madonna. My boyfriend was looking at us like we were insane. We may have been making fun of him a little bit for being a heterosexual male who cared about football. But when we sat down, Susie held up her phone and showed my boyfriend an email she had received from her friend, Coach Pat Riley. What? It was the Pat Riley legendary NBA player, coach, and at the time, president of the soon-to-be championship-winning Miami Heat. I was confused. Why is Pat Riley emailing you? What is he emailing you for? Susie then told me Pat Riley had contacted her to make videos to speak directly to the players' moms. Not only do I find it hilarious that the implication here is that these big, muscly, tough guys ultimately really just listen to their moms, but might possibly also be a little afraid of their moms. When I brought this up to Susie, I asked her if these players were dealing with big-time agents, accountants, stockbrokers. Like, who are they dealing with? And then she said, Girlfriend, Pat Riley knows how to train these young men into champions, and he knows that I know how to speak to players' mamas, she said in her signature sing-songy voice. I've never heard of these supposedly famous basketball players, but she explained that she made videos for the moms of Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade or D. Wade or something, and some guy named LeBron uh, James. Is it possible that my bright collared jacket wearing firm but loving giver of the Susie Smackdown friend was helping Pat Riley assemble the big three into an NBA championship team in Miami? I imagine Susie making these videos, looking right into the camera, and getting right to the point, speaking directly to these women. Maybe something like, this is the sum of money the coach has in mind, and this is how it's going to work. Your son will be playing in a little state called Florida, which, guess what, my dear, has no state income tax, which means he can keep a lot of it, invest most of it, and here's my number, and you can call me. Let me see if I'm getting this straight pun intended, my gal Susie somehow was instrumental in putting together a championship dynasty? Is there nothing this woman can't do? Susie Orman, NBA commissioner? Susie Orman for president, 2020, 2024, or 2028? Just think about it. Oh, and the shocker, she and her wife also remodel and flip houses. I know, you didn't see that one coming. It's also my understanding that this LeBron James character was even able to segue into feature films. (laughs) That can't be true. Susie, I issue a challenge to you. It's time for you to assemble the next big three. Kathy Griffin, 
Mm. Ryan Gosling. Uh, Tyson Beckford. We'll call it the big three way. Osborne, comma, Ozzy. He's really like that. In May of 2013, I hosted an auction concert charity event benefiting women thrown by rocker extraordinaire Linda Perry, who was able to get everyone from Natasha Bedingfield to Sia to the great Ozzy. Now, as long as I've known Sharon Osborne, believe it or not, I'd never even met Ozzy. I've seen Ozzy in concert with and without Black Sabbath. And let me tell you, I don't think Sharon gets enough credit. She is by far the most powerful and successful female rock and roll manager and has broken the glass ceiling for women in that part of the rock and roll industry in a way that is nothing short of dazzling. I knew that Sharon would be the perfect person to approach regarding how I should give her client, Ozzy, the best intro. Well, we all know that Sharon is deliciously unfiltered, so it will not surprise you to hear her response. Just get up there and say this fucker better give the best performance of his life because it's for an amazing fucking cause. Easy. I made my way to the Beverly Hilton Green Room, which is, by the way, a pretty small venue that regularly hosts so many high star wattage events. And Ozzy is just in there running around, like chatting with his band. And he's sounding, um, you know, incomprehensible because I can never understand what he's saying. So I go up to him and I said, hi, Ozzy, I'm Kathy Griffin. I'm hosting the event. And since I'm going to be introducing you, is there anything in particular you'd like me to say? He was speaking fluent Ozzy, which I did not take in high school. So I admit I couldn't understand a lot of what he said, except when he would keep repeating with his thick accent the word, amazing. I said to him, so perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Ozzy Osbourne? And he just kept going, amazing. Then I said, all right, got it. Now, I'm sorry to be that person, but can I get a selfie with you? Once the camera was out, he grabbed me, gave me the full-on Aussie smile sneer, and again goes, amazing! As if that wasn't Aussie enough, something else caught my eye. You often hear about rock and rollers having these crazy writers in their contracts with various specific and bizarre demands. In a room filled with typical, boring dressing room fare, such as a couple bagels, a coffee pot, a few bottles of water, I happened to notice something that had an actual post-it on it. It was a pyramid of six little five-hour energy bottles and a note that said, don't touch, for Mr. Osborne only. Well, there you go, I had my intro. So I walked out there and said something like, with 30 hours of energy and an amazing amount of talent, ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Ozzy Osborne. And with that, he flicked the switch. He's one of those. He didn't just get through the set. He blew the roof off the place, from paranoid to crazy train. I think I even barked at the moon. Paltro, comma, Gwyneth. Beautiful pill. Entrepreneurial stork. There have been a few celebrities who've been a cloud of exasperation for me for so long. They should win some kind of longevity award. Oprah is one. Paltrow's another. There's an arc to our relationship, even though I'll bet she doesn't even know that we're in one. Call it a subconscious intercoupling, if you will. When I first encountered her at the VH1 Fashion Awards back in the early 2000s, unable to join in on the fun with her mate, Stella McCartney, who had no problem, by the way, answering my silly red carpet questions, she was the kind of snooty celebrity whose antics helped me build an entire comedy career. I hated her. I loved her. I got comedy out of her. But at a certain point, you want a response. So years later, when I did a guest spot on Glee, she was there the same day I was, filming a different episode. So I found her in her trailer, burst in, and announced, Paltrow, I'm here! She was looking at a magazine and getting her hair and makeup done. So, you know, I got the bare minimum. You know that. Hi. Look, I get it. She was in the zone, and me acting like her, you know, make-a-wish kid was finally here. That was probably a bit much. So later, I got a copy of a cheesy full-page picture of me in some tabloid magazine. I went back to Paltrow's trailer when she wasn't there, naturally, and found her assistant and proudly proclaimed, I'm going to leave a present for your boss. 
This very statement may have sounded ominous to this visibly uncomfortable assistant, so I added, Give me a Sharpie. He reluctantly handed over the pen, and I ripped out the full-page picture of myself. I proceeded to give Paltrow the gift of a lifetime. I wrote in big block letters over the entire page, Dear Gwyneth, and by the way, I spelled it G-Y-N-N-E-T-T-H. I want to give you an autograph from your personal idol. Love, Kathy Griffin. I hope she'd find the misspelling of her name amusing, since I read somewhere that she couldn't stand it when people misspelled her name. You know, push their buttons first, I say. Well, I got zero response. Did I misread our semi-conscious throupling? Did she go straight to the cops with what she perceived to be evidence of stalking? (laughs) The following year, I saw her at an industry party, and, you know, I couldn't resist. So I just went up to her and said, What's up, Goopy? Everything goopin'? Everything gooptastic? And guess what? Finally, a decade after the VH1 Fashion Awards, she just gave in. She laughed. That's right. She figured out how deep I really am. I approached her in the same way I approach every gig. If the audience laughs, I end the show. If they don't laugh, I'll stay up there for five goddamn hours until I hear it. Audience have known it for decades. Now Goopy knows. Paul, comma, Aaron. Jesse Pinkman? <laughs> Thanks to me. You'd be surprised to learn who had a small role as Zipper in an episode of Suddenly Susan. It was a certain teenager named Aaron Paul. Breaking Bad? Ever hear of it? Yeah, I pretty much discovered him. Although I knew the character of Zipper could not continue on Suddenly Susan, I know raw talent when I see it. I remember it like it was yesterday. He came onto our set with the intensity of a big cat, but he didn't know what to do with it all. I mean, you could just tell it was going to be trouble. We were on a sitcom, not some brooding basic cable drama, and the studio brass weren't happy. They were going to can him, but I got on the horn with the bigwigs, and I said, I can straighten him out. He's a kid. Let me at him. Kathy Griffin's been around. I've done the math. I can take him under my wing. I stormed onto the set, grabbed Aaron, and pulled him aside like a teacher with some delinquent. Oh, well, Heil Hitler, bitch. We're all on the same page. The one that says if I can't kill you, you'll sure as shit wish you were dead. Look, whatever you're trying to cook up here, Captain, can it. We're not some lab where you can just try things out. You haven't earned your own trailer just yet, bucko. A show like this requires chemistry, so you better dial back the intensity. You look like someone poisoned your girlfriend's kid, for Christ's sake. So shape up and learn to love working in Burbank, or the next thing you know... You'll be a crazy handful of nothing in some shithole in Albuquerque. where There's a lot of uncertainty, bitch. The sky is just as blue here, and the chicken places are even better. Do we have a deal, you pathetic junkie? Answer me! Then, naturally, I threw him on the floor of the Suddenly Susan set, choked him out until he finally pointed to his pocket full of meth, which I promptly threw into the Warner Brothers decorative fountain next to the friend set. All right, I'll be honest. Um, I actually have zero recollection of ever meeting Aaron Paul when he was only 19 years old. I'm too famous. Okay, but the point is, he still owes me a lifetime of gratitude for putting him on the map. You're welcome, Aaron. Pelosi, comma, Nancy. Speaker of the House. Secret KG ally. Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi have taken enough sustained smearing from mean, backward Republican men to last a few lifetimes. And I think I have it bad with pissed-off celebrities. The first time I met Congresswoman Pelosi, I should say Speaker Pelosi, she was unfailingly nice, complimenting me and talking about the importance of humor. I mean, it was great. In my opinion, a much better understanding of a solid chick comic than... Paul Ryan will ever have. Okay, so I was scheduled to go on a talk show in which I knew I would have to defend her. Don't come at me, Fox News. 
for, you know, respecting this woman's accomplishments, for God's sake. I had to make sure I had my talking points ready on what a badass she is in the House of Representatives. I mean, she runs her caucus like a mob boss. My D.C. pals tell me she's loyal as long as you don't cross her. You kind of got to love that. Check and check. I respect her because at 70-plus years old, she's still working her ass off. Oh, she has a killer body. <laughs> Any of this ring a bell? I'm just saying we have a lot in common. Kathy Griffin, future Speaker of the House, just think about it. Okay, the great story, though, is that when I was at an award season party and a very distinguished, handsome, gray-haired gentleman walked up and said, Hi, I'm Paul Pelosi. My wife and I would love to say hi to you. I said, Oh, my gosh, I'd love to say hello to the Speaker. So I go over to their table, and it was a power group for sure. The Pelosi's... Apple CEO Tim Cook, a few other like true titans of industry, and some chick with hair kind of like Ginger from Gilligan's Island. So Pelosi and I exchange pleasantries, and then she says, have you met Lana? Suddenly it clicked who the redhead was. Oh, I said, and I turned her, I, I said, you're the singer, Lana Del Rey. Well, Lana made a forced cough sound and said, <laughs> uh, I heard what you said about me my mind started racing. Is she even in the act? And then she continued, uh, for your information, putting me on the worst dress list was preposterous because that dress was, and she continued, right? So then I'm thinking, oh, oh, I, I get it. All right. Uh, fashion police? At the time, I had done one episode. And not only that, someone else put her on the worst dress list. It wasn't even my doing. All right. I tried to explain this to her, but Lana's anger appeared to be escalating. So then Nancy Pelosi stepped in to do what she has had to do countless times at the Capitol, mediate. She steps in and she goes, oh, Lana, dear, it was a joke. Kathy tells jokes. She goes around the country and makes people laugh. I'm sure it wasn't a comment on you personally. And then I said, Lana, I think you're a very good singer. I do. I mean, you're a little, you know, dark with the lyrics. So then Nancy, of course, steps in, kept defending me. At the same time, she was trying to comfort Lana Del Rey. Um, the thing about fashion and humor is that they're both essential in their way, as is music. And Lana, dear, people are going to make jokes if I could tell you all the things I've heard in the Senate. Okay, I loved how the speaker was stepping in to soothe a hot-headed celebrity. It kind of emboldened me. I mean... It made me want to continue the dialogue with Little Miss um, Sourpuss, although I may have taken a little advantage of who was in my corner at that moment. Lana, I said, do you know who this woman is? <laughs> I doubt it. Why don't you practice your scales and just enjoy your meal or something? Pelosi said, now, Kathy, dear, that's not going to help. Lana sat there silently stewing. I mean, I felt like just dragging in more big guns. So I just looked at the Apple Haunt show and go, and what kind of gay man are you, Tim Cook? You can't even help me out? Lana Del Rey here maybe wants to kill me. Uh, she even refers to herself as a suicide girl in that song. She's not me. What's next? Homicide girl? Well, Tim Cook was laughing, which I love, as Nancy Pelosi um, walked me away from the table. You know, like a trainer at a boxing match? Well... Everything is fine. Then, sure enough, at the valet, there's Lana again, and she walks right by me, Taylor Swift style, without so much as an acknowledgement that one of our most powerful women in the world played diplomat for our benefit. All right, I guess Lana felt like she got her two cents in at the table, and that's all that mattered. How in the world does Speaker Pelosi deal with those petulant whack jobs in the White House or the any house? All right, for those of you who still can't be talked out of trashing Nancy Pelosi, I encourage you to Google Dennis Hastert. Yeah, that's what I thought. Pen, comma, Cal. Kumar, actor, canine hero. One morning, Larry, my big lug of a dog, went missing. And I, of course, was in a state of panic. As in, I could not stop crying. It wasn't Larry's nature to vanish. It's more his nature to lay around and wait for food all day, not even really try to find it somewhere else. But he is a people dog, and I was sincerely hoping he hadn't found someone else and just dumped me for another person. Because he's a man. Men. 
you open up your home to them, let them eat your food, you clean up their poop, and then they take off. Anyway, I imagine Larry being taken in by a frat house. Because, by the way, he'd be a perfect companion to a bunch of mentally stunted dudes who eat Cheetos off the floor and growl if you drink their beer. He's kind of the same. Anyway, I put out the word on Twitter that Larry was missing, hoping someone would come forward, and someone did. Cal Penn. Kumar. Of Harold and Kumar. Obama appointee. Yeah. After famously campaigning for him, he took the position of associate director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, and then later served on the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. I mean, I've never even met Cal Penn, but apparently he was a neighbor. A neighbor my dog, Larry, must have wanted to meet very badly, as Larry wandered over to Cal's house for probably a hug and some White Castle sliders. Anyway, Cal brought Larry back safe and sound. I was out of town at the time, but my assistant took a picture of Cal with Larry. And after I tweeted it with my public thank you, my awesome followers showered Cal Penn with their social media appreciation, which I thought was great. Cal later tweeted, quote, Man, you get a shout out from at Kathy Griffin and your feed becomes a love fest. Thanks, guys. Larry the dog was totally adorable in real life, end quote. If Cal in any way during his brief caretaking endured a crotch nuzzle from Larry that left a slobber stain, he didn't even say anything about it. I have nothing but gratitude, but I feel for comedic purposes, I must point something out. My new hero, Cal Penn, was in possession of Larry the dog for several hours, even though Larry had a tag with a phone number on it. (laughs) I've often wondered if Cal did maybe an adorable photo shoot where he was acting as if Larry was, in fact, his dog in order to attract chicks. Look, I don't know. Maybe he took a photo with Larry, sent it to the Obamas with a note that said, Dear Barack and Michelle, I don't miss the White House one bit since I've adopted this big fella. Or maybe he used his photo with Larry for his Tinder profile pic. Come on, wouldn't you? Penn, comma, Sean, Oscar-winning actor, experiential journalist. The sun was cresting over an earthquake-ravaged Haiti as I handed Sean Penn a shovel and I said, that drainage ditch isn't going to dig itself. Get to work, Penn. Never mind, that was a dream I had. In reality, I was at the Women in Entertainment Power Breakfast hosted by The Hollywood Reporter, and Penn, who was giving a special award to Melinda Gates, showed up, and looked a little, you know, disheveled. I was at my power table near the front, and I said to anyone around me who would listen, look at him. His hair looks ridiculous. It was 9 a.m., and believe me, I'm no fan of getting up before, I don't know, midday. But he really looked like the guy who opens his eyes, throws on a suit from the night before, and doesn't even bother to check the mirror before going out to give an award to Melinda Gates. Chris Jenner, who was at my table, and by the way, I still maintain she gets my genius attempts at hilarity, she dared me to bring Sean Penn to our table. Ha <laughs> ha, done and done, lady. This is what I do on a daily basis. He was nearby, so I marched up to him in the middle of what was clearly a private conversation with Melinda Gates, and it sounded like they were having like a very cerebral, save the world type of talk. And I said first to Melinda Gates, who I, you know, don't know, excuse me, Mrs. Wozniak, crickets from her. I thought it was funny. And then I turned to Penn and I said, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, what's with the hair? Okay, so Melinda Gates wisely walked away and Penn turns around. And he goes, why? By the way, that was after um, I tapped Penn on the shoulder. And then I believe his first words were, oh, shit. Anyway, I say to him, look, Penn, you're at a big power women's event, you're giving out an award, and your hair looks like crap. He goes, what should I do? And I go, do you have any hair gel? And he goes, no. And I go, really, Penn? Uh, You have two Oscars, and you have no hair gel. Look at the room. Barbara Streisand is right over there. Captains of industry are here. Get it together, Penn. Your hair needs shape. He started putting his fingers through it as if that was going to help. So I wisely and quickly wrapped my arm around him, turned him around, 
as you would with maybe an old person going down a stairwell. And I go, let's go to my table. They all want to meet you. Come on, Pen. Excuse us, Melinda, I shouted. The armor on him was important because he tried to get away. And uh, there was like a sound of alarm rising in the voice almost, like a <laughs> him just saying no, no, no would stop me. But it took only three steps. And then I just announced to my table, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sean Penn. And I just want to say my entire table all cheered and went yay. That's right. Rita Wilson, Megan Trainer, Lena Dunham, Sarah Silverman, Chris Jenner. Yay! I won. Wait a minute. Why didn't I make a wager with Chris Jenner for like a million bucks to bring him to the table? Like, why did I just accept that challenge? She probably had a million bucks with her in her, you know, uh, Kim and Kanye clutch or her like Yeezy clutch or something. <sighs> Whatever. Anyway, you can't imagine how happy I was when Sean Penn, hopefully a little bit shaken by me confronting him on his hair looking disheveled, went up to give the award to Melinda Gates. He made one joke that fell really flat, which I loved because I was sitting right in front. And I looked at him and gave him the OK sign as if he was doing really well. And then he stopped because he could hear the crickets. And even Penn knows bombing, like I know bombing. And then he recovered by making a joke, which made me extremely happy, which is he had made some joke about how, like, women are the superior sex. And all the room of feminists were like, oh, that's a little old timey. So then he recovers by saying to the entire room. And that was never more evident than when I walked in and Kathy Griffin told me my hair looked like shit. And everybody clapped. It was a triumph. Oh, and then he went on to catch El Chapo, I think. Pink, comma, pink. Singer, opinionated acrobat. At the 2000 Billboard Awards, when I was hosting with NSYNC, Justin Timberlake and I were rehearsing a sketch that needed his then-girlfriend, Britney Spears, and we had her for a very short amount of rehearsal time. So, I mean, we had like five minutes with her. So the three of us were running over our lines for the skit, and we just kept running it over as many times as we could fit in. And then suddenly, an up-and-coming pink walked up to us, right? So this is when she only had one album out, and her hits were There You Go and Most Girls, right? So she was in Britney genre at the time, but because we were slammed for time, I turned to her and I think I said something like, hang on a second. So the next day, after the show had happened, the producer of the show called me and said Pink wanted an apology. All right, so when this happens, I, I just run over the previous day in my brain, and I'm going over everything, and I said to him, but I didn't make a Pink joke. So he explained how Pink was really good friends with Brittany and Justin, and she was just trying to say hello when I blew her off, and she felt disrespected. <sighs> I, of course, was livid. I'm not apologizing. You kidding me? I was rehearsing. I'm not apologizing to a 20-year-old who's got her panties in a wad. He goes, all right, well, what's the compromise? Will you at least talk to her manager? <laughs> I was like, oh, sure. So I talked to the manager, and I told him what I remembered happened, and I barely remembered her coming up because I was rehearsing, and, you know, that's, that's kind of how I recall it. So then he said, good, can I go back and tell Pink that you said you're sorry? And I was like, uh, yeah, like, what do I care? Sure, go ahead. So years later, I'm sitting in the scenic Burbank Airport, about to board a flight to Vegas, a Southwest flight, I think, by myself. And I see this chick in a baseball cap sitting by herself against the wall. And it's pink. And she's trying to look under the radar. I totally get that. And I go up to her and I go, look, you want to just sit together? You're probably better off just sitting next to me than some drunk dude on his way to a bachelor party. And she was so nice. She goes, cool. We had the best time on that flight. She had just gotten married to motocross superstar Carrie Hart who was working in Vegas at the time. So she was like doing a two-city relationship. And I remember her saying, this is what it's like when you're in a long-distance marriage. Am I a good wife or what? <laughs> I agreed. And then we just started talking shop, specifically selling merchandise at shows. I had just started doing it myself. And then she let on, I make more money selling glow sticks than I do from tickets. I thought that was fascinating. So then she continued and she goes, after every show, I make the venue settle the merch and make them put the receipt under my hotel room door so I can go over it that night. I know. I was like, oh, hello, Pink. 
She was super mellow and very smart and such a good business person in just those 50 minutes in the air (laughs) that it was actually really fun and eye-opening. You know, I love it when the ladies are down and have their biz affairs in order. So ever since then, I actually look forward to running into her at events. And we have this great picture here, hugging after I won my Grammy for Best Comedy Album. I guess when you're like a very smart and talented businesswoman, you maybe forget about what had made you angry many years ago at the Billboard Awards, you know, at the turn of the millennium. Well, I don't, of course. I put it in a book because I need the material. You understand. But now I see why Pink wants to get the party started. It's those glow sticks. Pitbull. Chrome Dome Homie. Team Griffin and Team Estefan cannot stop coming up with brilliant ideas. The night of September 10th, 2011, I was in a really bad, bitter mood because I just lost or rather been robbed of the Emmy for my life on the D-list that year. And yet, Emilio Estefan had arranged a limo to whisk me from downtown L.A. to a hangar at the Santa Monica Airport where the American Latino Media Arts Awards were holding their show that same night. That's because Emilia wanted me to be part of a surprise inside a surprise. Gloria had arranged to premiere her new song, Weppa, with a performance the audience didn't even know was coming. And Emilio wanted me to surprise Gloria by sneaking out on stage. This, by the way, was a live broadcast. (laughs) And um, acting like I was one of her backup dancers. Okay, the plan was going well. But I started running into people. Remember, I'm supposed to be the surprise, right? Hosts Eva Longoria and George Lopez, actor Danny Trujillo, who all pretty much said the same thing. They were all like, hey, hi, wait, um, what are you doing here? My answer was pretty much the same. Um, I'm Hispanic now since I heard it will help my career. So I need you people. And I hear that you people can use some redheads. Everybody believed me. At this point, several high-profile Latinos were in on the Estefan Griffin prank. So at the crucial moment, Team Estefan, minus Gloria, of course, had people huddle around me to shield my presence. Emilio described what would come next. He said, okay, once the dancers go on, we're just going to push you out there and see if Gloria notices. I mean, everyone was laughing. It was going to be great, right? So we found a small space in the wings where my protective little human shield wouldn't be noticed by Gloria's giant entourage, who were also waiting, right? So they're hiding me from her. But then out of nowhere comes Pitbull in his entourage. And we're now truly in a traffic jam of posses. A Team Estefan guy named David, who's known Pitbull forever, starts yelling at him in Spanish to get out of the way. And then Pitbull starts yelling back in Spanish, and I'm officially terrified and confused. Um, I don't know at this point who the Jets are or who the Sharks are, but, you know, I know I'm not going to be Officer Krupke. I'm worried I've started a Cuban turf war, maybe, at which point Pitbull turns to me and starts screaming at me in Spanish, as if I were Lucy after some cockamamie scheme gone bad and he was Ricky Ricardo tearing me a new one. So I turned to David with this nervous, huh, what's he saying? What's he saying now? What's he saying now? So then David started translating. So Pitbull's yelling, and David is doing the English translation. Uh, you're the funniest bitch, mama. I love you, mama. You're so fucking funny, mama. I'd fuck you and listen to your jokes, mama. Oh, Pitbull. Then Pitbull grabbed my shoulders and kissed me and walked away. So once my brain grasped David's translation of Pitbull's words, all I could do was snap out of it and just yell something like, Oh, gracias. That had to be the most aggressively scary compliment I've ever received. And to this day, whenever I see the Estefans, they love to bring up the time that Kathy Griffin was frightened by superfan Pitbull, after which they do their impression of a terrified white girl just going, What? What? Ho ha ha ha! Anyway, a couple years later, Pitbull performed at the Hollywood Bowl, and we arranged to go backstage and hang out with him in his private suite. And I know he's supposed to be, I guess, scary Pitbull or something, because he's very ferociously sexy to the ladies, or whatever. But I could also tell you, he's a guy that took time out minutes before his headlining performance at the Hollywood Bowl to host my little group of four. It was so great. We took pictures, we joked around. Very international love stuff. 
As he exited the room to start his performance, I yelled, Dale? I don't even know what it means. Poitiers, comma, Sydney. Actor, Sir with Love, Lily of My Field. As you may know, I typically find myself in relationships with much younger men. However, let's be clear. I'd fuck Sidney Poitier tomorrow. I bet you never thought I'd even know Mr. Tibbs, did you? Well, I do. When you first lay eyes on Sidney, you just have to kind of take it in that he's actually in front of you. And then, if you're me, you gotta start to work. I introduced myself to him years ago at a fancy dinner party, and he said, I love comedy. Great. So I tried to make him laugh, and guess what? He laughed. I mean, what more do I need to hear? Anyone says I love comedy, I'm in. Ever since then, the Academy Award-winning leading man and civil rights icon has been a favorite of mine. And whenever I see him and his lovely wife, Joanna, well, I kind of make Joanna my partner in crime. (laughs) He's cool, charismatic, regal, and he has this giant laugh that just fills up a room. Because he's such a pioneer for black people in the arts, He's a darling of Oprah's, and being the classy gentleman who can speak to the struggle comes so easily for him. But guess what? In everyday life, he loves a joke. If I've really gotten to him, he actually doubles over, and then he gets up in my face and he goes, you, young lady, you go too far. Don't ever stop. I'm always cornering him and asking him when we're going to, you know, get it on right in front of his wife, because she typically chimes in, and she goes, for God's sake, Kathy, take him off my hands for one night. I mean, that's one night I won't have to make him a bland chicken breast for dinner. (sighs) Then I get to say, Sydney, let's cut the shit. Your wife is practically throwing you at me, and the Beverly Hills Hotel is ten minutes away. Let's just go knock this out. He'll then turn to my boyfriend, Randy, and just go, how do you deal with her? Nothing stops her. Then Joanna will say, Well, I'm not going to stop her because I get to go home early and read a book for once. Maybe Randy can join me. Joanna and I then began just planning the swap, and I watched Sidney put his arm around Randy and say, okay, what will it take for you and me to just get a drink somewhere alone? (sighs) Ah, It's been years of those exchanges, and I love them. Even at my pal Jackie Collins Memorial, which she had let friends know she wanted to be lively, not dour. That's who she was. So anyway, Sydney was there, of course. They were good friends, and he starts his bantering with me, which I love. So I hadn't been there very long before Sydney came up to me and said, I have been looking at you for five minutes, and you've been ignoring me. I said, fine, Sydney. It's all about you. First of all, who dressed you? You're in corduroy? Seriously? He roared with laughter and said, here's what I need from you. Stop being so beautiful. I said, oh, can't do it. Okay, so get this. I noticed Jodie Foster nearby. Uh, Just, you know, I don't even know Jodie Foster. Has that ever stopped me? No. Foster! I yelled. Jodie Foster walks over, and then I decided to introduce them. Foster, Sidney Poitier is here. Did you ever meet him? She very humbly said, "Uh, no, actually, I haven't. Watch how a pro does it. Sidney, this is Jodie Foster. She's an actress. Sidney goes, how do you do? What a pleasure. I turned to Jodie. Come on, Foster, work a little bit. He kind of knows who you are, but maybe not quite. Sydney, she's got two Academy Awards. Foster, don't fuck this up. What'd you win for? Tell him. Jodie Foster appeared somewhat shy. She may or may not have wanted to be put on the spot at that very moment. Too bad, Foster. I can't help being a goodwill ambassador when I feel the calling. So then she goes, um, the silence of the lambs? Not to me, Foster. I know that. Tell Sydney. So she repeats it to Poitier, and I go, louder. She actually said it louder, and I go, what else? She goes, um, to Poitier, she goes, the accused, sir? I I won for the accused. So I turn to Poitier, how about that, Sydney? But guess what she doesn't have? The Medal of Freedom. He shook his head, oh, no, you're not going to bring that up again. I turn to Foster, Foster, here's the thing about Sydney. He's great, but he's got to bring up that frickin' Medal of Freedom every two seconds. Jody looked a little shell-shocked at the exchange, but Sydney just smiled, and he said, that's the young lady I wanted to see tonight. Come on. The fact that a genuine, history-making, massively gifted superstar like Sydney Poitier gets me is such a source of joy and contentment, it's hard to describe. 
I mean, if Oprah knew this, she would curl up in a ball in Gail's lap and just cry. Povich, comma, Maury. Secret baller? The one that got away. This is the tale of two cities. One part, your humble authoress, me, kissing my own ass for a piece of comedic genius that I feel I provided the world with that didn't really get the credit it so deserved. The other part is the story of a man that you thought you knew for delivering the line, you are not the father, in a gray cashmere v-neck sweater. Here we go. Maury Povich is the shit. Hold on, Judge Judy, you are also the shit. Just give me a minute here. Maury's talk show, really like a live relationship melodrama, has been a hit forever. He owns a production empire. He probably runs at least half of Montana, where he lives with his wife, the legendary television journalist Connie Chung. All right, so here's the moment I want you to look up online, and hopefully you'll get a good chuckle. Sometimes I just can't stop myself. I get the idea in my head that the greatest way to spend an evening would be to show up to a taping of Maury and sit in the front row in disguise. No one was filming me. This wasn't part of, like, any one of my TV shows. Sometimes I just do this stuff for the love of the game. All right, so I had someone from my team reach out to Team Maury and let them know that they were in for quite a treat. They thought the idea was funny. Great. I told them I would not disrupt the taping of the show in any way, but I had one request. I wanted a sit-down with Maury himself. The plan was in place. I showed up at Maury's favorite restaurant a couple of hours before showtime. He has his own table, by the way, at this quiet restaurant, and the maitre d' greeted me with, Maury's table is right this way. Maury's table. He's sitting there by himself, and that alone, by the way, was a relief. Because I really cherish getting to meet, like, my idols one-on-one, without, you know, the team surrounding them and prohibiting a real live conversation. I had a lot to say to this guy. The first thing was, please tell me you're having as much fun as it looks like you're having. He laughed and told me, I have so much fun doing this show. Are you kidding? How could I not? Check. Right answer. I expressed to him how many longtime successful celebrities I had met who could not simply be happy with their jobs and how refreshing it was hearing from someone like him who had been so successful in the business for so long actually describe how fun it is because that's how I feel. It's that ease he had that comes with years and years of going up and down and up and down again in the television business. And I found that that only happens with a real certain like business sense and maturity, and he has it. So it took me five minutes to realize that this is a guy who's got a great sense of humor, a real sense of balance in his personal life, and he happens to be a kick-ass businessman. Oh, why are all the good ones married to Connie Chung? He stopped the conversation and simply said, what can I do for you? What? Folks, just so you know, this never happens. People who ask this question are not telling you that they have some fucked up agenda or that you're going to secretly make some deal with the devil that you won't find about until later. I mean, guess what? The good news is that Maury Povich is one of my idols because he doesn't need anything from anyone, least of all me. And by the way, that's been one of my benchmarks. You guys might know this. I really respect and admire people if they're able to say, like, I don't really need anything from you, right? That's like, I call those secret ballers. So Maury and I talked about my dreams and aspirations and how I wanted my new talk show to aspire to a level of conversation that Dick Cavett used to bring to television, and he was interested in hearing that. I mean, he knows all those folks, you know? So he told me he owned a company called Stun Creative. That knocked me off my seat because I had done promos with Stun, and I think they do awesome work. So he said to me, early on in the Maury Povich show, the promos other people did were okay, but I realized that the promos and the commercials had to be better than the show. So I started my own company, and now we do all the promos for NBC Universal. I mean, he said it like it was nothing. It was so brilliant. Anyway, I raved to him about Stun, and he offered to help me put together a Stun quality sizzle reel of the existing Kathy Talk Show content at no charge. 
I mean, this is a really generous offer. I couldn't believe it. He also told me something really fascinating about his deal with NBC Universal on the Maury Povich show. He used to own it, right? That's a big thing, ownership and licensing and stuff. But it was such a hassle auditing NBC Universal every year to ensure that they were being honest that he just did the math and said, okay, I know what it makes, so just pay me this much every year and you can just own it. I mean, Jesus, he was like a mentor. I thought he was going to start saying wax on, wax off. So I said a brief farewell to my new sensei, and I uh, had to then go don my disguise to live another dream of mine and get into character for being the greatest Maury Povich audience member you've ever seen. I played this role for two episodes in a row, because they do multiple episodes, and I had the time of my life. I wore this short brown wig. I made my face up in a way that was befitting, how shall I say this delicately, um, a true Maury Show fan, maybe from the Deep South. I mean, my character had this whole backstory. She proudly wore her Who's Your Daddy t-shirt that I had made. Um, my character took several bus rides from her trailer park and was fist pumping with anger every time she felt one of the participants on stage had done his lady wrong. Maury knew I was there the whole time. He never skipped a beat. He was not distracted by my insane front row behavior, even though I did my damnedest. It was honestly one of the most fun nights I'd ever had. At the end of the taping, Maury really laid it on thick. He comes back out and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, I have one more secret to reveal tonight about this sordid tale we've all been through. Pause. Audience moans loudly. Ooh. That's right, Maury continued. There is someone else in our midst tonight who is not who you think they are. Audience even louder. No! Maury continues. Yes, this woman. He points his finger at me. In the front row is... And then he goes... The great comedian, Kathy Griffin. Greatest intro ever. Audience went crazy. I ripped my wig off. I hugged Maury on stage. Oh, it was great. I have a picture. Oh, anyway, back to Maury. He then boarded his private jet and went to something called the Masters. It's a big golf thing. His jet. Air Maury. Quest, comma, Richard. CNN correspondent, extreme extrovert, amateur park ranger. This entry is designed to make Anderson Cooper quake in his Prada shoes. I insisted Anderson introduce me to CNN's lovable, loony, limey. Okay, that's a lot of alliteration, Richard, but I think you can handle it. I just knew Questy and I would fall in love. Anderson described him in terms that made him sound kind of like a caged animal, and he's obviously very protective of Richard, so one of the conditions of that particular New Year's Eve live broadcast was that I not mention any um, incidents in Richard's past. By that, I'm referring to the following article from the New York Post in 2008, um, quote, CNN personality Richard Quest was busted in Central Park early yesterday with some drugs in his pocket, a rope around his neck that was tied to his genitals, and a sex toy in his boot, law enforcement sources said, end quote. <laughs> okay, I just had to quote that for you. Anyway, I agreed because I am willing to give Richard the absolute benefit of the doubt when it comes to being arrested in a park with crystal meth and a rope tied to certain parts of his body. You know, if that isn't the definition of a victimless crime, I don't know what is. It doesn't matter anyway, because he's been back on CNN ever since. He's fine. Lighting up the channel with this over-the-top delivery. I just find it amusing that he's presented as one of their, like, tentpole global stars. But I'm in. I'm in. Okay, we did meet one New Year's Eve, live and on the platform. Well, my Richard did the most charming thing. He brought a mistletoe with him, and he would not stop holding it over my head. Well, I was more than happy to open-mouth kiss this colorfully vested, roaring, accented Richard Quest. Because, well, Christian Amanpour probably didn't have the balls to do it. 
Richard was like your crazy uncle at Christmas, festively dressed and full of spirit. And when compared side by side on television with my Anderson, you know, I couldn't have been happier to be the girl in the middle. So Anderson need not have worried about me referencing the New York Post article because there was a mistletoe and a kiss happened with Richard, not Anderson. Quinto, comma, Zachary. New Spock? <laughs> Loves pussy. Zachary looked impeccable in his suit and tie when I came across him at the CNN Heroes event. I actually had to point that tie out. He said it was Louis Vuitton, tailor-made for him. I was in a form-fitting Zach Posen full-length gown, and Zach complimented me on how chic it was. Realizing we also had something else in common, um, much younger boyfriends. We talked about that, too. His is 13 years younger. My boyfriend's 18 years younger. We talked about how gorgeous they were and how good they looked in suits. Then we talked about our houses. I mentioned my giant Hollywood Hills mansion, and he described his Greenwich Village townhome that he and his lover were redoing. We discussed house flipping, you know, the pros and cons, and then it was time for him to go because he had to actually get on stage and present his award. Then he looked at me and he chuckled. He said, wow, this has been a really gay exchange. Quivers, comma, Robin. Radio host, Stern Wrangler, New Age Health Experimenter. I've enjoyed my visits as a guest on The Howard Stern Show since 1996, and I can say that I felt an instant nurturing connection with Robin. Already, we're talking about an unusual atmosphere because nurturing and morning radio are words that don't typically uh, go together. Anyway, obviously, part of her role is to be the clear-eyed, reflective, cheery counterpoint and sometimes laughing audience to the glorious and unbridled rants and activities that Howard throws himself into, and it has earned her plenty of well-deserved accolades as a multifaceted broadcaster. But it's also a great cover, too, for when she decides to be a little bit naughty. I mean, come on, she'll be on your side for a good part of the interview, and then zing, she'll challenge you. Hers is a very particular skill. Off the air, by the way, she's an angel. Even though we've really only had personal moments like in the hallway at the studio. All right, so remembering that Robin was a captain in the Air Force, I sought her advice when I performed for the troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. So let me remind you, this is, you know, not just another story about me telling you about another woman who works in a male-dominated field. I mean, she's literally been in the trenches. So she was really helpful. Oh, and of course, she works with Howard Stern. You know, it was a, like a pretty big trench to be in. So sometimes I'll do my best to pry because she's famously private in some areas. Robin, who are you dating now? And she, every time she just goes, yes, I'm dating someone. And that's as far as this is going. And I'll say, seriously, Robin, I'm not going to ask you, like, if you take it up the butt or anything, because that's Howard's job. And she'll just say with her signature laugh, yeah, but I also know who I'm talking to here. Fair enough. We've talked dieting a lot, and she's famously become a vegan who's promoted a cleanse that involves lemon, maple syrup, and cayenne pepper, which I could never do, by the way. And I have incredible admiration for how she survived child abuse, cancer. I'm especially fascinated, though, by how she has navigated the boys' club for over 30 years. So... When I talk about female influencers of a certain age, I think of Robin, too, as someone whose example has taught me that it's still and it's always going to be a grind. Robin's job is probably no easier than it ever was. I mean, she has to deliver as much as Howard. She has to give as much shit as she takes. And for that, I will always gravitate toward Robin whenever I show up for my interview. And I remember the backlash, too, that she used to get from women of all colors saying she shouldn't let Howard say the things that he says. But I've always understood the amount of finesse it takes to roll with this crew hour after hour, day after day, year after year. I mean, we're not talking about elected officials here, right? I love this. She's like the rock, the mainstay. She's got to roll with these guys. You know, she's a real monument to hard work. And by the way, when her cancer was at its worst, she actually did the show from her home. And I feel like I'm able to recognize what her strengths are, and so are those guys, too. So 
we all know that Howard wouldn't be nearly as successful without Robin. He's even said it. So in my mind, after all these years, it's pretty clear who the real winner is. Well, not that Howard's a loser. I'm just saying she's a winner. All right. Anyway, Robin, as you can see, I'm really laying it on thick here. Why? One reason. I know it's going to kill Howard. Because I know Howard is going to be one of those celebrities that opens the book, sees if he's in it, and then he's probably going to read this passage verbatim next time I'm on the show and take umbrage to something or challenge me on labeling you an angel without irony. Too bad. I did it. Hey, now. Ray, Rachel. Personal chef to Kathy Griffin. I have Rachel Ray's house keys. Don't call the police yet. I can explain. All right. Whenever I see Rachel and her husband, John, in New York, whether I'm, you know, just hanging out with them at home or out and about, they are like that special kind of couple that never make me feel like I'm the third wheel. They are true friends, very gracious hosts. All right, the first time they had me over for dinner, Rachel pulled out all the stops with this gourmet meal that took, by the way, way more than 30 minutes to make, I'm sure. And I think it cost more than $10. So I joked, Rach, have the stuff I can't even eat. It's too exotic. I was really hoping for a good old-fashioned tuna melt. So the next time I went to their apartment, she made me the most delicious tuna melt I've ever had. Also, it was the fanciest tuna melt I'd ever eaten, with about 18 ingredients from around the world that I can't even name. So, of course, I had to keep up the joke. Okay, Rach, let's just keep it simple next time. Enough with the, you know, Thai shallots and gribici aioli. I had to look that up. I just want tuna and cheese. And the cheese has to melt. Tuna melt. Anyway, Rachel, who is as down-to-earth as they come, has her fun naughty side. I think you should know that when it comes to humor. And she always teases me about my tastes, which I love. But she knows me, and she knows what I like. So when I was performing my sold-out limited-run Broadway show at the Belasco Theater, appropriately named Kathy Griffin Wants a Tony which I was robbed of a Tony that year. Anyway, I reached out to Rachel one night and I just said to her, look, I'm, you know, doing a Broadway show. It's, it's awesome. It's a limited run, but I don't know what's going on. I'm maybe nervous all the time or something, but I can't eat before the shows. I can't eat after the shows. I'm changing my material every day. And uh, it's, you know, it's throwing my <laughs> nutritional habits out of whack. I got a hotel room with a microwave. That's all I got. I'm starving. I don't know what to do. I can't keep food down because I'm so nervous all the time. <sighs> Can you help me out? So then she doesn't say anything. She sent me a tray of the most incredible, homemade, all-natural, mouth-watering mac and cheese that I lived on for a week. It was so nourishing and thoughtful and tasty. Anyway, Rachel would have preferred that I just stay with her and John. They have a spare um, apartment off their apartment. They call it a spare room, but it's like an apartment next to an apartment. Anyway, and so one time she just started giving me shit about me not taking them up on their offer. And so I said, look, as flattered as I am, I'm never going to stay with you. I know you have a gorgeous apartment and I could save a lot of money and by the way, I can spend weeks hanging out with you. I adore you. You don't know how loud you are. Yeah, you talk louder than anyone I know. That's why you had that voice surgery, because you yell everything. The husband's no better. Besides, I sleep late if I'm working, as in 1 p.m. You two are up at 6, going to your damn gym. Plus, I'll be honest, Rachel, you're a cabinet slammer. Yeah, I said it. I don't care if you cook every meal for me. I'm not staying here. Then she just pulled me into the guest apartment and she just started going, look at this. Just look at this beautiful apartment. I just go, you can have it, lady. So we've gone back and forth with this routine many, many times until one night at dinner at her place, she simply gave me her house keys. I'm tired of this argument, she said. I'm just giving these to you. Next time you're in town, whether we're here or not, you got the keys to both apartments. Just Give me one day's notice by text and we'll just clear out the one next door. So I just shook my head. I go, you're like a crazy person. Are you nuts? And she goes, take them. It was like your aunt trying to give you that $5 bill. I mean, she was literally shoving her house keys in my pocket. I go, fine. I'm going to take them, but I'm going to mail them back to you tomorrow. Then she goes, now you're crazy. All right, so I'm walking back to my hotel that night. 
and Rachel Ray's house keys are jangling in my pocket. Even her keys are loud, by the way. <laughs> and so I texted her. I go, I have your house keys, because I thought maybe she forgot, seriously. So she texts me back. She goes, I want you to have my keys. Why aren't you getting this? A few days later, back in LA, I called her. Hey, how are you? It's Kathy Griffin. I have your house keys. They're with me now. And when you get a FedEx package for me, and it sounds like very jingly, it's going to be your keys. So she writes me back, don't you dare. All right, I admit, that kind of sealed our friendship forever. I mean, it's sweet. But I'm going to be honest, I don't know what to do. So when I see her now, and I start to say, "Um, by the way, Rach, um, you still want me to? She goes, yes, keep the keys. No celebrity has ever given me the keys to their house. And that includes my mother. All right, do I worry that Rachel will be burglarized and that my fingerprints being on her keys, which, by the way, are in a safe deposit box, will make me the prime suspect? Yeah, I do. But do I also imagine an apocalyptic future, perhaps because Levotics have taken over the world, and I need to hide out at Rachel's, a la Jodie Foster and Panic Room? Yeah, I imagine that too. And guess what? I could live on tuna melts. Absolutely. Redford, comma, Robert. Actor? Hubble, not the telescope. In 2012, I was asked to present a Career Achievement Award to Hollywood reporter editor Janice Min at the Los Angeles Times Press Club's Awards Dinner, which was being held at the Biltmore in downtown L.A. What was also exciting, though, was that my pal Jane Fonda was getting a Visionary Award that night, and her presenter was going to be the great Robert Redford. I was going to meet him come hell or high water, even though I knew his intrepid publicist would valiantly try to keep that from happening. Well, Redford was late, and nothing could really start without him being there, which I knew would be driving the publicist up a wall, by the way. Then I heard someone at the event say, Robert Redford is just pulling up. Time to have an urgent need to hit the ladies' room, I say. It was my only chance to get FaceTime. Okay, so I ran up to the hotel's glass doors as Redford was coming through with the publicist. And I thought, well, she's not going to stop me from saying hello. So from my perch near the restroom, I darted right up to him and I simply said, Hello, Mr. Redford. My name is Kathy Griffin. It's a pleasure to meet you. I know you're giving an award to Jane. Well, I'm giving one to Janice Min. So we're both giving awards tonight. Redford goes, what's your name again? I said, Kathy Griffin. I'm a stand-up comedian, and I think tonight's going to be great. Jane is so excited to see you. Oh, by the way, the restrooms are right over there if you want to use one first. (laughs) Come on. I wasn't obnoxious. I didn't ask for a photo or an autograph. And he was, like, very mellow about it. He was very nice. Okay, well, the presentation started, and Redford did his speech for Jane, which was terrific. And then I did mine about Janice. And about two lines in, I decided... I should just kind of abandon what I'd written in freestyle instead, which actually worked because then I got laughs. Phew. Okay. So I sat down and Redford, who looked very dapper and handsome in his tux, he was in tux, he comes up to me and he whispers in my ear, you're not just funny, you're sexy as hell. What? Oh, Bob. So of course I had to start. Bob, my boyfriend is right here. And guess what? He's going to kick your fucking ass. My boyfriend, of course, like the color drained from his face. Anyway, Redford just laughs and he goes, that's why I love her. Sexy and funny. You're a lucky man. Do you know what a great combination that is? That's what he said to my boyfriend. By the way, it doesn't stop there. Years later, at a women in entertainment power breakfast, Redford was giving an award to Streisand. And, you know, he was going over her career and he got kind of like, hung up trying to remember the club where they met. So Redford, wondering aloud from the podium, he starts to say, where was that place you were playing, Barbara? And Streisand is next to me at her table, and she's shouting at Redford. She's going, the bitter end. And Redford (laughs) didn't hear her. And he's like, what's the name of it? And Streisand's going, the bitter end, Bob. So Redford still didn't hear Streisand. And I don't even know if he knew she was talking. And so Redford's like going on like, what was it? It was this little place in the village. Everybody played there. Lenny Bruce played there. And then I stood up because I felt like I knew Bob, you know, from the thing with Fonda. And I just stood in the room in front of him. And I went, Bob, she's saying it was the bitter end. 
So then Redford from the podium goes, who is that anyway? And he puts his hand over his eyes like he's, you know, shading himself from the spotlight. And then somebody else yelled, Kathy Griffin. And Bob, my new boyfriend, basically, goes, oh, yeah, she's terrific. And my heart went pitter-patter. Rickles, comma, Don. Mr. Warmth, fearless, genius. The night I met the one-of-a-kind Don Rickles, it was like a Rat Pack experience. His beloved late son, Larry, worked on Suddenly Susan. And one day, Larry says to me, uh, by the way, my dad is Don Rickles, and he invited all of you to Vegas. Uh, what? Seriously? Yes, please, I'll have some more. Okay, so the whole cast of Suddenly Susan went. Brooke, Nestor, David, and myself. So we sat in this very classic Vegas showroom booth at the Flamingo Hilton. Brooke Shields was engaged to Andre Agassi at the time. So having watched Rickles famously pick certain people out of audiences on countless television specials and lovingly rib them was something I could only have dreamed of actually witnessing in person. So about halfway through the show, sure enough, Don did the old school, ladies and gentlemen, we have some special guests in our audience tonight. The beautiful Brooke Shields, applause break, and her fiancé, tennis champion Andre Agassi, more applause. Here we go, I thought, this is going to be freaking classic. And it was. Don was on fire. He made every joke you could possibly think of, from Brooke's Calvin Klein ads to Andre Agassi's mullet. Now, when you make fun of people that are in the audience, it truly is a high-wire act for the comedian, the subjects of the jokes— and the audience. We're all on this high wire act. It's a skill. Don isn't an insult comic. He has the ability to work the room that extends from his own work on the stage to his subjects he's poking fun at in the audience. And the actual crowd that is witnessing this complex and dangerous exercise, which he executes with the excitement of a teenager, is just dazzling. Well, that's not how Agassiz saw it. Gulp. Brooke loved it, and Agassi was livid. I couldn't have been happier. I'm laughing at this legend who's still got it and relishing how pissed off that flashy tennis-playing boar was over being teased about his mullet and dating Streisand. And you know Agassi dated Streisand, right? Anyway, um, now that we know a little bit more since Agassi's book came out that he was probably coming down from something— Allegedly, by the way, the book is called Closer, and Agassiz describes how during this time he was doing crystal meth. Yeah. Anywho, afterward, we were invited to his dressing room, and Don could not have been a nicer host. I mean, I was gushing. We all were. Well, except for a certain U.S. Open, Wimbledon, blah, 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 winner. Oh, what do I care? I have no time for some annoying athlete who can't take a joke from the great Don Rickles. Brooke was at her most charming, and Agassiz was still a stone-faced pill, even backstage when we had the privilege of hanging in Don's dressing room after the show. So Brooke had to kind of, like, explain to Agassiz, it's an honor when he makes fun of you. Oh, good God. Anyway, as I've gotten to know Don over the years, he's been wonderfully supportive, telling me to be who I am, say what I feel. I mean, oh, Don even tried to fix me up with a guy one time, Um, someone my age, because he doesn't think I should be with younger guys. Anyway, every time Don sees my boyfriend Randy, you know, who's a little younger, he just says, when's this going to be over? It's run its course. Come on! I mean, it's so funny. He busts Randy's balls endlessly. And then he turns to me, why don't you let this kid go take his SATs? And then there's um, Randy's tall, rather Germanic presence. So Don will just say something like, can I trust him? Is he in the party? <laughs> and then to Randy, he'll just go, hey, kid, how's the Third Reich? Does this look familiar? And then, of course, he's going to, he does the Heil Hitler salute to my boyfriend. I, I, it's funny. I can't help it. I love it. So does Randy. Look, I want everyone to appreciate the no-holds-barred, fast-on-his-feet comedy that Don really made his own, you know, and I've always found it very inspirational. Obviously, everybody has. Anyway, so when I got a call to present an award at the Primetime Emmys alongside Rickles, it was as great an honor as I could have hoped for. 
So backstage that night, it was really dark backstage, right? So Don was a little bit nervous about tripping over this piece of wood or cord or something like that. So we walked out with me holding his hand. It just, I don't know, it brought an air of fragility that I felt kind of needed to counterbalance, you know, the, like I said, the no-holds-barred style of Rickles, you know? Because I hate when people, like, think he's a mean comic, right? Because he's not. He's a, a doll. So anyway, we walk out there holding hands, and it's near a little bit of the end of the broadcast. So I just stood up, walked out there with him, and I just yelled to the jaded celebrities in the auditorium, Get up! And boom, the whole place stood. I will never forget that moment. And later, Don was super sweet and appreciative that I not only helped him avoid tumbling, but that I made the crowd show their respect. You know, kid, he said to me one time, I'll always remember that. Hey, Don, I was just, as you say, being who I really am, your biggest fan. Rivers, comma, Joan, my friend. Look, it was hard to pick one Joan Rivers story for this book. I'll always miss her. I have countless meaningful and hilarious memories of our time together. All right, I got a story for you that's going to blow your mind. It may have a couple surprises, but I think it encompasses so much about Joan that I loved. Okay, in 2011, she called me and said, Chuck and Camilla are having a two-night event, one night at Windsor Castle, one night at Buckingham. It's going to be very fancy. Do you want to come as my plus one? Uh, what? Cut to me furiously moving around my schedule in 30 seconds. Because to this day, it's one of the greatest, most generous invitations I've ever received. Okay, I was determined to make Joan proud and do it upright. I packed a knockout De La Renta gown for one night and a Herrera gown for night two. I'd already booked my room at a swanky modern hotel when Joan called and said, I want you to move into the Ritz so we can get adjoining rooms. You can even use my hair and makeup people. Well, I should have known that Joan would think of every detail for both of us. She really wanted to make it a girlfriend's weekend. And I was so touched by that. Now, I knew Joan was friendly with Prince Charles and Camilla, but what I didn't know is that she hung with them, as in rolled deep with them, as in she went out to Balmoral Castle on a painting vacation with them. Seriously. Hence calling them, you know, Chuck and Camilla. At the hotel with our adjoining rooms, we were like a couple of teenagers getting ready to go to the prom. We had so much fun shouting across the room at each other and making jokes about who's going to sneak into one of the spare rooms and cuddle with Chuck. We took bad cell phone pictures at our hotel room after we'd gotten ready for the first night. And we headed out to Windsor freaking Castle. Uh, have I mentioned that I'm from Forest Park, Illinois, and I'm now sitting next to Joan Rivers in a car going through the gates of Windsor Castle? Okay, when we got inside, I was a nervous wreck. My eyes were like saucers. Joan immediately started cracking me up by making fun of Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, who divorced Chuck's brother, Andrew. Can you believe her? How stupid was she? Stupid! Ah, oh, stupid! She could have had this forever! Well, I played along and fanned the flames. Well, Joan, maybe she was, you know, unhappy. Of course, she starts, Ah, oh, please, how could she be? Stupid, stupid, stupid. I mean, I loved it. I can tell you it's quite nerve-wracking to be standing inside Windsor Castle, but Joan was prancing around, acting like it was her vacation home. She gave me the lay of the land, pointing out the global movers and shakers in attendance, the secret old money types who aren't famous but, like, have this kind of access, and... Now, I realize that gay men everywhere are all about Harry, but I'm sorry. For me, it was always Prince Charles. Sorry, boys. Chuck and Camilla are my royals, okay? When Joan introduced me to Charles, she said, This is my friend Kathy Griffin. She's a very outspoken, outrageous comedian in the United States. Then Prince Charles pulls me in and says right in my ear, Well, if it weren't for comedians and journalists, who would keep us honest? Way to go, Chuck freaking love that sentiment. We don't really hear that from power brokers, much less royalty. We also don't hear a comment that I admit was in the back of my mind when I was speaking to him. I'm only human. I'll tell you right now, I have always found the surreptitiously recorded remark he made about wanting to be Camilla's tampon to be nothing short of charming. Yeah, 
Seeing how obviously thrilled he was to see Joan that night was really moving. It was obvious they had chemistry. He put his arms around Joan. She was polite in a way I've never seen. I mean, somebody made a joke, by the way, and they said, well, it's a good thing Camilla's not here tonight because, in fact, Joan is the love of Charles's life. So later, of course, I had to give Joan some shit about this. I go, oh, you thought Sarah Ferguson was stupid. You're the one who blew it. Charles could have been your tampon. Well, that evening was nothing short of thrilling, and we got to do it all over again the very next night at Buckingham freaking Palace. I was just as nervous in the car with Joan again, passing through those gates. I mean, can you imagine? I know I couldn't either. But my pal Joan Rivers made this happen for me. Camilla Parker Bowles, you know, the Duchess of Cornwall, was there the second night at the Buckingham Palace event. And it was even more fun because Camilla makes this beeline for her good pal Joan. Prince Charles comes up to me and says, I saw you on Graham Norton last night. Uh, whoa. I'm thinking, you're the Prince of Wales. And you watch comedic talk shows? Oh, Chuck, are there maybe some cracks in your marriage I should know about? (laughs) Just let me know. Now, you know, he could have had his doyen just simply whisper that in his ear, but who cares? He addressed me by name. He really does love comedians, I thought. When it was time to eat, Joan and I were seated at separate tables, but Joan told me why. I'm going to sit with Charles, but you'll sit with Camilla because she's a great laugher. Say anything you want. I mean, Joan was giving me a window into her relationship with them, which I could see was very special to her. I mean, she never made me feel like, oh, I was just lucky to be there. I mean, she even told me to make sure I took home a menu because they're hand-painted. And I did, of course. So at the end of the night, somebody wanted us to accompany them to a nightclub. Oh, by the way, it was former Congressman um, Aaron Schock. You can look that up. It was Aaron Schock and some guy he was with. I swear to God, they were like, you want to come to a nightclub? So (laughs) we joke back at them. Oh, yeah, sure thing. We'll be right over. You go first. I mean, we're laughing. Obviously, we're not going to go to like an EDM nightclub. But what I didn't realize is that my pal and your beloved Joan Rivers had something else in mind. She wanted to stop by a hospital to visit a friend of hers, somebody she was really close with who was dying. Well, we were quite a sight in our ball gowns. (laughs) walking into a very quiet hospital after visiting hours, but you know, it's Joan. And we took funny pictures with her friend who was really ill. And this guy was so happy to see her and she made him laugh a lot. And then we left. So Joan had really been in her element those two nights, you know, funny, friendly, supportive, enlightening, and oh, so energetic. She mostly kept this part of her life private and sacred, and I understood it. She'd been open about so much of her life, you know, but you can keep some things to yourself. And you got to know, like, what's in the act and what's genuine and what's life. And she really knew all those things. But Chuck's comment about comedians keeping us honest is something Joan Rivers did for us for so long. She never gave up when life and show business weren't always so kind, and her example will never cease to inspire me. When Joan passed away, I was devastated. I still am. It took me some time, but I finally worked up the courage to call her longtime assistant and just say, I'm curious, have you heard from the royals? Her assistant said, the queen, Charles, and Camilla had all called the very day Joan passed away. Of course they did. Rock, comma, Chris. Comic, director, Lil Penny. I'm going to take you inside baseball. A lot of people ask me during interviews what comedians are really like to each other. Which comedians support which other comedians, which comedians hang out, and so on. Well, when you're a 56-year-old chick comic, there is no one answer. But let me tell you about one time that was really meaningful to me. One night years ago, the late great Prince was doing a secret performance at a small club in Vegas. Well, I snagged a VIP booth, so I'm sitting there, right? And I see Chris Rock come in with his friends and sit down at a nearby booth. So this is always an odd moment for someone like me. Like, yeah, he and I are both comics. Yeah, he and I even play the same venue sometimes. But let's cut the shit. I'm me. (laughs) No complaints, no whining. But he's Chris Rock. So I get insecure in those situations because... I'm a little bit of a peer, a little bit of a fan, but I have enough 
understanding of celebrity to not want to bother Chris Rock sitting in a booth at a secret print show. So then Chris makes a point of getting up, walking over to me, and he took my left hand in like a gentle grasp of both of his fans, and he simply said, I just wanted to come over and say hi. You're doing great. And that meant the world to me. Like, it's always nice when the person comes up to you when it's sort of the person who's doing better, you know? All right. So I just didn't want to be like too much of a fangirl. Now, since then, Chris and I have become pals. So I admit I'm such a stand-up comedy geek that when I was standing in a circle backstage at a very high-level comedy event in D.C., surrounded by George Lopez, Tracy Morgan, Kevin Nealon, Dave Chappelle, and Chris, I was giggling like a schoolgirl. I was also the only girl. Again. But enough about that. So... Chris has this insight about my 80 City Like a Boss tour, <laughs> and he'll say stuff like this always gets me. Damn, Kathy, what the fuck you doing 80 shows a year for? You old child support? It was one of those moments when I was in the mood to tease him, and all the other boys about anything that just came to my head. So Chris was in my crosshairs. Chris, I yelled. By the way, he was standing right next to me. Uh, why do you always ignore my boyfriend, Randy? I mean, he's standing right here next to me. We've been going out for five years, and you've met him several times. Why do you have to be such a racist? So Chris casually said in his most Chris Rocky performance voice, Kathy, here's the thing. Randy seems like a nice guy for a white guy. Why? Because you seem happy. And if you're happy, I'm happy. Because you're not bitching to me about how you can't get a man. Now, the minute you break up with Randy, I'm going to run all over town yelling, fuck that white guy. And then Chris and Randy took a selfie. Rushdie, comma, Salman, author, fatwa survivor, swims against the stream. I just did a phone interview for my tour for the Lincoln, Nebraska Journal Star a few minutes ago. They can't all be Vanity Fair covers. And I was asked a question I often get asked. Tell us something we don't know about you. And you know what I answered today? I said, oh, I know Salman Rushdie. By the way, as if they cared. Anyway, look, I know we've all had bad days. But this dude has a fatwa on his head. According to Merriam Webster's dictionary, a fatwa is defined as, quote, a legal opinion or decree handed down by an Islamic religious leader. End quote. Um, that can't be that bad, I thought. I mean, I've dealt with tough crowds. You know, comedy's dangerous, too. Rushdie, a British Indian novelist who angered a lot of Muslims with his 1988 novel, The Satanic Verses, received a fatwa from the Ayatollah Khomeini. Khomeini? We say Khomeini. All right. In 1989, which ordered all Muslims to kill the author. All right. I admit it. This is way tougher than an angry bachelorette party that I've had to deal with at a Vegas show. Fine. You got me. But look, I remember that whole controversy vividly. And at the time, I thought, if I ever had a chance to meet Rushdie someday, I would love to ask him how he dealt with it. The hiding, the fear, his gradual reemergence into the world. In fact, he even did, like, a pretty famous cameo in the 2001 film Bridget Jones' Diary. So I thought, well, maybe he's comfortable being out and about in public on some level. Look, comedians are routinely in positions where they say things that stir shit up. And I have certainly joked about my propensity to do that. So I wanted to meet him. I figured we were totally alike. Oh, by the way, one New Year's Eve, I actually said to Anderson Cooper that my goal that night was to get a fatwa on my head, which he quipped, well, that won't take much effort on your part. So when I was promoting my memoir, Official Book Club Selection, my dream came true. And I snagged a sit-down with Rushdie for my life on the D-list. So we filmed it at the big Manhattan Barnes & Noble. And I'll admit, when he walked in, I was fearful for him. Like, I didn't know if somebody was just going to shout infidel and, you know, point at both of us being infidels. I don't know. I didn't know if he was going to be openly and visibly, like, jittery and paranoid or something. Nope. He walked in very casually. We spoke on and off camera. On camera, he was a great sport, answering all my silly questions. He was really playing along with the setup, which is I thought I could sell more books if I had a fatwa. I thought he actually might walk off the set at that question, but he didn't. 
It was a great scene for my little show, but I want to tell you about the conversation we had when the cameras were off. Okay, so I asked him to come hang out for a few minutes away from the crew. I wanted some private time with him. So he talked openly about why he came out of hiding, and he just basically said, I finally got to the point where I thought, if they're going to get me, they're going to get me. He said that living under that kind of terror made him snap, but in the opposite way. Instead of getting angry, he said, one day I said, well, this isn't getting me anything, so I'm just going to live my life the way I want to. Um, By the way, a couple years after our conversation, he published a memoir about his life under the fatwa called Joseph Anton. It's really good. At one point, Rushdie confessed to being nervous about our talk, and I said, Oh, no, he is scared about being out in public, and now I've exposed him. Instead, he actually said, I thought you were going to ask me about my ex-wife. What? Oh, right. He was married to Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi from 2004 to 2007. I had to assure Rushdie that that was the last thing I would bother him with. When I was talking to a man who had had a fatwa or has one, you know, I'm not so concerned about the ex-wives. He laughed and thanked God. And, you know, maybe Allah. Um, But the truly cool moment happened when we were having our private chat. And suddenly, my phone buzzed with an incoming text. And I said, well, 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 here I am talking to the great Salman Rushdie. But I have to ask you to wait, because I have a text from Cher. I showed him my phone, and he just goes, oh, my, that's very exciting. I go, yeah, I rolled the big time. Authors, living legends divas, you know. So then he grabs his cell phone and he showed me a text he got from Lou Reed. Remember, this is 2009. And then he goes, every time I get a text from Lou Reed, I want to show somebody, just like you did. I hold my phone up to whomever I'm with and I just say, Lou Reed just texted me. I worship him and I think he's a genius. I loved that. By the way, the fatwa still hasn't even been revoked. And in fact, more money was added to it in 2016. But you know what Rushdie ended up teaching me? We all have our share in life. We all have our Lou Reed. We all have our Ayatollah issuing a fatwa ordering Muslims to kill us. Right? Russell, David O. Filmmaker, fighter, J. Laws Fengali. I know a photo op when I see one. Damn it, if the press isn't smart enough to create one, then I will. Please tell me you have seen the infamous viral video of my friend Lily Tomlin and my other friend, the great director David O. Russell, going at it in an epic way on the set of I Heart Huckabees. Okay, now, both Lily and David, who of course went on to direct Silver Linings Playbook, Joy, The Fighter, you get it, are going to be pissed that I even brought this up again, but stay with me. I have discussed this incident with both of them separately, and they have both confirmed several times that while it was a very difficult shoot, the video going viral was something that neither one of them ever (laughs) predicted, and the two of them have actually since made up and even laugh about it. Now, I don't think that that is something people are aware of. That's where I come in. I think you should know that even when I'm busy hosting an award show, I still have an eye out for things like Lily Tomlin and David O. Russell sitting three tables apart in the audience. Yeah, I'm a real multitasker. In a very star-studded room, everyone from Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones to Bette Midler and Jane Fonda, I still wanted to test the waters to see if David and Lily would be up for the official we've made up due to our good friend Kathy Griffin photo. So at one point during my hosting duties, I actually ran into the audience with a microphone and straight out asked Lily Tomlin how she felt about having David O. Russell a few tables away. I love David, Lily said. That was a long time ago. And trust me, that room, filled with movie stars and directors, knew exactly what I was referring to. Step one accomplished. Later on, after David had accepted his award for the film Joy, he stopped backstage to give me a kiss on the cheek before he was about to leave. Now, I met David O. Russell in 2011 at this awards season luncheon. So he's with his wife, and he approached me, and he goes, Hi, I'm David O. Russell. I directed The Fighter. He said this in a very direct way, that... I actually kind of notice (laughs) in his characters. He cracks me up every time I run into him. He's very intense, by the way, even if you're having small talk. He kind of doesn't have a sense of personal space, which I find kind of charming because he is always saying something interesting. So he might as well say it while, 
you know, just rubbing a cheek against mine or something. Anyway, back to the story. So before he left this backstage area with me, I just had to unload on him. David, uh, you just came off stage. This was your big chance to publicly look Lily Tomlin right in the eye. And, you know, even though she has nothing to do with joy, just randomly let the world know that you guys are pals and have made up. Jesus, David, do I have to do everything? Do I have to sell the popcorn? Well, he's a pussycat. He just laughed. He goes, oh, shit. I really did mean to thank Lily. So I said, go back to your seat and just wait five minutes because I'm going to return to the stage and I'm going to save your career once and for all. I went back out there and I proudly announced that I was about to publicly bring back David O. Russell and Lily Tomlin in a sign of solidarity for actresses and directors everywhere. David, David, get up here and let's clear this whole thing up and get a nice photo that will obviously be Lily Tomlin's Christmas card. Well, wouldn't you know it, he left by the time of my almost epic announcement. Okay, David O'Russell, I'm going to give you one more chance to save your fledgling career. Listen up. Um, where's my great movie role? Yeah, Mr. I Love Casting Women Over 50. Hey, he got Melissa Leo an Oscar for The Fighter, for God's sake, and Jackie Weaver a nomination for Silver Linings Playbook. And he gave Diane Ladd and Isabella Rossellini some of their best roles in years in Joy. It's already unusual that a big-time Hollywood director even knows who I am, much less loves me, as obviously you do, David. So let's just say I'm ready to be your Monique and your Precious. Wait, a, a David, if you if you write like a Precious type of, I can be the, all right, whatever. I'm ready for my close-up with Brad Cooper, J-Law. All right, David, you can cast me as a, oh, a bipolar female boxer with a cleaning product empire. We'll call it Joy Fight. Just get to work. But if you scream at me, I'm going to call Lily Tomlin. Russell, comma, Kurt. Great actor, but also a Fox News pundit. In the interest of squeezing as much out of Oscar-winning Goldie Hawn as I could in order to agree to host her children's charity event, I added another clause to our negotiation. I want dinner with you and Kurt. Dinner. Not whatever this was. You looking like you just got off a treadmill. It's a dinner with you and Kurt, and I want you guys to look like movie stars. By the way, Goldie looked concerned. She goes, well, can we at least bring Marty short? And I go, why? And Goldie goes, Kurt's afraid of you. Ah, I get it. Martin Short is like their unpleasantness buffer. Great. And then I said, tasting blood in the water, well, Kurt should be afraid of me. This is me talking to Goldie. You tell him to get his butt off Fox News and get his head on straight. By the way, Kurt and Goldie are kind of like the James Carville and Mary Madeline of Hollywood, deeply opposed about politics, but deeply committed to each other. She gasped. You think we haven't had these fights every day? Your reaction is what I'm talking about. He's expressed, you know, nervousness. Well, I didn't mince words. So I said to Goldie, well, you've just said the worst thing you can say to me. All right, so the night of the Lovin' for Kids arrived. This is the benefit, right? And I um, basically chased Kurt Russell all night long, like a freaking Bobby Soxer. I had my hands full hosting, but whenever I wasn't, I had my eyes on the prize, which was messing with Kurt Russell. He was filming the Western The Hateful Eight for Quentin Tarantino at the time, so his in-character grooming was right on target. Kurt, what's with the facial hair? Don't walk away from me, cowboy. Did you take an Uber horse here? What kind of stash is that? Where'd you get it? Hollywood Boulevard Magic Shop? Oh, I love that you wore your wardrobe for the movie today, but shouldn't you put on your real suit? You know, stuff like that. Light. Whatever I said, Kurt's response was always the same. <laughs> and then he would just walk away. At one point, he actually started dancing, and Goldie confided in me, he never dances. <laughs> That's me. I can get him to dance. Actually, he was dancing to get away from me. But then Goldie encouraged me more, so this is kind of her fault. Because she then said, well, don't let him off the hook that easy. <sighs> well, whatever I did, it was catching. Because when it came time for Martin Short and Kurt and I to be on stage together, Marty let Kurt have it, hilariously announcing him as coming straight from his home on the range and so on. Look, it was a really fun evening. And it worked, too. Because shortly after that night, I got word from Goldie's assistant, Iris, that Kurt and Goldie wanted to take me out to dinner. Okay, here's the thing, though. It hasn't happened yet. And I'm due for my monthly call from Iris saying, oh, 
Goldie and Kurt really want to set up this dinner. They really do. Well, it's not even on the books yet. But you know what? They can't ignore me. Stay tuned. Shakur, comma, Tupac. Big reader? Or? Oh, you guys didn't know I spent the day with Tupac Shakur one time? <laughs> you don't get me. I am truly hashtag urban. I'm practically a thought. Look, I don't know how your day with Tupac went, but here's how mine went. This little cat has many lives, and believe it or not, in this story, I'm the cat. One of my many jobs that I had on ill-fated television shows, which I was convinced would actually catapult me into global fame, was a six-episode sketch comedy show on Fox called Saturday Night Special. The show was executive produced by Roseanne Barr. She was also still performing on her wildly popular sitcom. So I was cast as one of the sketch players, along with my pal Jennifer Coolidge, Stifler's mom, and several other up-and-comers. It was 1996, and thanks to Roseanne's heat, the show snagged some really big guests, including Sharon Stone, Patti Smith, hot up-and-comers like Green Day and D'Angelo. Okay, so one of the most exciting things about being a cast member on the series was I honestly didn't know who was going to walk onto that soundstage as a performer or a visitor at any given moment. So the energy on the set was really, like, extra exciting. Slash from Guns N' Roses and I did a sketch together. Ice-T came on to do a sketch. Oh, in fact, on the day that Ice-T came to the set, he had a little surprise for us. A surprise named Tupac Shakur. Not the hologram kids, the real live Pac. Is it cool I brought Tupac? Ice-T asks. Roseanne sensing an opportunity. Yeah, let's throw Tupac into a sketch. Uh, he ended up doing a sketch, his own performance, and, wait for it, a spoof yet charming version of the Neil Diamond Barbara Streisand classic duet, You Don't Bring Me Flowers. I mean, it was pretty cool. I think I have a pretty good eye for special moments, and this day was filled with them. I mean, remember, Tupac was at the height of his California love fame, and watching him goof around with iced tea was not something I... Ever thought I would just see on a normal work day. I admit it, I just kind of like followed them around all day, just like an observant puppy. All right, let me cut to the chase. I can't confirm this in any way, shape, or form. But it was my <laughs> observation that um, Tupac couldn't read. Yeah, I know. Now, just so you know, I myself am wildly dyslexic. Okay, like watch. I'm going to read something now. Leflacosic baja. Yeah, see, I had to, like, read a word several times, and then I still got it wrong. All right, whatever. The point is, I get the reading issues. So, um, Ice-T stayed really close to Tupac, like a big brother, right? And Ice-T appeared to be doing Tupac's reading for him, out loud. Like, the contract, the script, you know, everything. I even recall Ice-T filling out, like, his forms for him. So, I thought this was fascinating, right? Like, I remember wondering that very day if Tupac Shakur, or frankly, any global superstar, could reach that level of fame, be that talented, create an iconic and lasting, you know, legend, and could he be illiterate? No way. Okay, I know that last sentence was a barn burner, so give me this much. A. Admit it, you never would have guessed that I even met Tupac. B. Um, you can't blame me for thoughts that just pop into my head as I'm falling asleep at night. So thoughts like, I'm not sure if Tupac could read, <laughs> just popped into my head because I was watching him. And by the way, I'm, I actually think he can read because I think he did something where he like reads to kids or something. I know. What if Tupac was so damn famous he had a designated celebrity reader? In this case, Ice-T, read for him. Yeah, maybe that was it. Now that's famous. Shanling, comma, Gary, television comedy pioneer, former fiancé, kind of. I was fortunate enough to call him a friend. And if legendary Hollywood agent Sue Mangers had had her way, I might have called him my husband. She was set on me falling in love with Gary Shanling and marrying him. What she didn't know was she didn't have to sell me on falling in love with him. I was very much in love with him in a platonic way. All right. One day, Sue called me up and yelled on the phone, 
You need a strong, wealthy man who understands your world. And you are going to fall in love with and marry Gary Shandling. That was Sue, and then she'd hang up. Um, Unfortunately for Sue, Gary and I were more like brother and sister. As long as I knew Gary, he preferred, like, hot model types. And, you know, God bless him for it. Why not? I mean, have you ever met a male stand-up comic? They've got a type. It's called models. Sue's attempt at creating a comedically epic power couple for the ages was very touching to me. I was more than happy to break bread with my future husband at one of her famous dinners. So, okay, as I was getting ready for this particular dinner in the fall of 2010, I could never have predicted how the evening would end. I took Megan Mullally as my date, and I went with no expectations on the matchmaking front. I mean, mostly, I was just excited once again to be in the orbit of one of the funniest men on earth. Gary was late, though, and Sue got mad. So I said, you're right, Sue, screw it. I'm calling off the engagement. Be honest now. Tell everyone how you want to fix me up with Gary, and it's not going to happen. And now he's not even showing up because he just doesn't want to go out with me, Sue. At which point, of course, Gary walked in and then sat down right next to me. We were in plush chairs and sofas around Sue's coffee table, which she came to prefer for its intimacy over the formality of a dining room table, right? And Gary was so close, I started to wonder, did Sue, like, convince him this is going to work or something? He seemed really uncomfortable, and I attributed that to, like, him being fixed up with me and we're just pals. All right, whatever. But with Gary next to me, I found myself wanting to become more emboldened by busting the balls of this big-time, really well-dressed, handsome manager guy that I hadn't seen in forever, but who was sitting across from us. Okay, so this dinner, like all of Sue's dinners, was a combination of famous people, titans of industry, award-winning novelists, and other distinguished influencers. But remember, these are small dinners of like eight or ten people at a time. So when I saw this manager dude in a very expensive tailored suit, I just decided to make him my target for the evening in a very Anderson Cooper type of way. I sometimes do that. I'll just randomly pick a dude, and he'll just become my Anderson for the night. So with Gary Shandling by my side, I seized the opportunity to live a dream, to have a great comedic banter with this groundbreaking comedic force, and have a little fun busting some balls, too. Oh, how I loved sitting next to and riffing with the man who gave us all those nights of sitting in for Johnny Carson, It's Gary Shandling's show, and of course, The Larry Sanders Show. Big-time manager dude was looking at his phone every few minutes. I thought that itself was funny, considering this crowd. He told me his wife was sending him photos of runway couture clothing from God only knows what fashion show. He was clearly choosing not to engage with me, which, you know, fuels my fire even more. I admit my real agenda was actually just to make Gary laugh. So then Gary reached down and held my hand. What was going on here? Was he actually making a move? I doubt it. Time to pick out the China patterns? Probably not. Would I have a future with him in which I could send him cell phone photos of couture clothing from some runway show? All right, now my mind is just racing. So pretty soon what might happen meant very little because Gary began chiming in with his witty brilliance, and soon he was on a roll, making everybody laugh. I mean, he was on fire that night. At the end of the night in Sue's driveway, Megan and I rehashed the evening, standing there with him, And we just kept saying to each other, is there anyone funnier than Gary Shandling? Though Gary and I parted ways after the dinner, the next time I saw Gary, that night that we had had dinner suddenly became a lot clearer. So Gary says to me one night, I think it was actually the HBO after Emmy party. He goes, do you know that I will always be grateful to you for that night? And I said, "Um, oh, yeah, I know. Like, The discomfort of Sue, like, trying to set you and me up. I've always, are you, yeah, that must have been weird for both of us, huh? And he goes, no, no, no. Do you know that I was in one of the longest litigations in TV history with Brad Gray and that we hate each other? And I'm like, what? And he goes, and that I haven't seen him since then? And I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. And... Then Gary continues, he goes, I walk in, and Brad is sitting there, and then I just sat next to you. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. And then Gary continues, and you were giving him such shit. 
That's why I held your hand. I will never stop thanking you for getting me through what I'd always dreaded, running into Brad Gray again. Yep, folks, that's right. The well-dressed manager dude I was making fun of was none other than Brad Gray. It had completely slipped my mind that Gary had sued his longtime manager and friend back in the 90s for $100 million for improper leveraging of their relationship in order to benefit Gray's business. Um, By the way, they settled the excruciating and public legal battle back in 1999. Uh, What was even more embarrassing for me was that I didn't realize Gray wasn't like some mid-level manager anymore. I didn't even know he's the chairman and CEO of Paramount Pictures. You know, as my mom loves to point out, why do you always have to make fun of the goddamn check signers? Yeah, it's true. Anyway, Gary Shelling said to me, you make that evening bearable because you were, and I go, clueless. <laughs> anyway, Gary, I was very happy to unwittingly ease your discomfort, friend. I miss you very much. You were always very, oh God, you were so generous with your support of me and you could make me laugh like nobody else. And oh, what the night we had. Shatner, comma, William. Actor? Damn it! Actor! He really is my favorite red-faced bloated space captain. I love how he's never had a downtime in his career. He's always been cool or anti-cool, hip or not hip, but always on the cultural radar. Well, back in the 1990s, when I was on Nobody's Radar, I got to go to his house because he was auditioning people for a television pilot he was going to make. So, as you can imagine, I was excited. But, by the way, I can't even remember the role or the script or anything because everything about this audition was nuts. Are you surprised? Okay, so we're in his living room, and he sat across from me, very close. I said something like, you know, it's great to meet you, Mr. Shatner. What would you like me to read? And he said very intensely, how do you feel about your father? Um, okay, that wasn't what I was expecting. I think I said something like, uh, I like him. He shouted back, get in there. How do you feel? What pisses you off? Uh, taken aback and a little scared, I think I blurted out sheepishly, Um, when I'm really hungry? Okay, you would have thought this was a hidden camera show. It was so bizarre. (laughs) His veins were popping, his face turning that deep crimson. He had his hands on his knees. He was leaning in like a bad cop detective, ready to break me. The questions were coming hard, and he wore me down. After 20 minutes, I was telling him things I've never told anyone. Shatner, what do you want to say to your first grade school teacher? Give it to her. Let her have it. Me. Screw you, Sister Mary. I am special. It was insane. But, I mean, I would have gone back. Come on, an invite to Shatner's house? I think I got, like, a good work from him at the end, and, you know, nothing happened. I don't even think the pilot was made. But now, when I see him, I can't resist. I love the guy. It's the same every time I see him. Bill? And he always just slaps on his knees and goes, Come here, honey. Shatner. Sheen, comma, Charlie. Famous and infamous. I met Charlie Sheen at a great time and in a great way. We were seated next to each other as judges of a charity event. It was a drag show benefiting Aid for AIDS. This, by the way, was years before he announced to the world that he is HIV positive. Okay, so when one takes a seat next to Charlie Sheen, one does not know what one may be in for. All right, you caught me. I'm, quote, one. Even in 2008, he had been in the tabloids for all kinds of behavior, from antics on the set of his hit show Two and a Half Men to his divorce from Denise Richards. So, as if that wasn't juicy enough, it was the time in his life when he was married to Brooke Mueller, who he had had a uh, tumultuous relationship with. And, get this, she was pregnant at the time. All right, so this was before his whole I'm winning tiger blood phase. But if you think that I had forgotten that I was sitting next to the Charlie Sheen that accidentally shot Kelly Preston, you're mistaken. My ears were pricked up like a newborn puppy. I love moments like this where I get to be up close and personal with a famous and infamous celebrity in a celebratory yet somewhat formal environment. Obviously, Charlie and Brooke were going to be on their best behavior, right? I mean, the other judges at this event ranged from 
Charlie's father, the great Martin Sheen, to John C. Riley, to Julia Louis Dreyfus, to Melanie Griffith. Um, I was saying things to Charlie that night, like, "You're okay with this, right? You know, it's a bunch of dudes who dress up like chicks, and you're gonna have to stand up and clap." He goes, "Sure, sure." I've always heard from several pals that Charlie Sheen is really funny in real life, and he was. We were enjoying some fun, silly banter back and forth, and the show was progressing. Now, keep in mind that we were in the very front row, and this is one of those celebrity charity events where the celebrities are asked to stand and wave to the crowd. It's actually um, an event called Best in Drag Show. So this is actually not a tale of Charlie Sheen going off on his pregnant wife or going off on me or something. Sorry. I mean, no charges are going to be pressed during any part of the story. Charlie did not lock a drag queen in a bathroom at the plaza. Charlie did not throw a chair at fellow judge Molly Shannon. None of that. Yes, folks, here's the surprise. Charlie Sheen and his then-pregnant wife, Brooke Mueller, were like the Bickersons. In fact, I would go so far as to say Brooke was really giving Charlie a run for his money in the bickering department. I mean, that's the part that caught me off guard. She argued with him about everything, from how much to donate, to when they could leave, to murmurs of things I couldn't even hear or understand. You know, Charlie would turn to me with a series of gestures that basically were like, huh, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> Shrugging his shoulders as if to say, she's normally really nice. I mean, it was weird and hilarious. It was like watching some old-timey marital sitcom. So at the point where Brooke wanted to leave early, he apologetically indicated to me that they were going to take off with a look that I interpreted to mean like, huh, chicks, right? Phew. Am I right, buddy? So, of course, I couldn't resist this opportunity to say something like, uh, Charlie, this isn't one of those events where you can just leave in the middle. You know, nothing like stoking the fires. And then he turns, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know. So he then made a very generous donation, and then they exited. And as they were leaving, he turns to me and goes, sorry, the show is awesome. Everything's good. Hey, you look great. Hey, at least he didn't shoot me. Shindlin, comma, Judge Judy. Syndication queen? Baller. Here's the power of Maggie Griffin. No matter how often I've asked Judge Judy to go out to lunch with me one-on-one, -on -one, she would prefer my mother, her biggest fan, to be there too. By the way, it hasn't happened yet, incidentally, because Maggie says she's too busy. I don't think she means it. Anyway, Judy is as outspoken outside of her show as she is on it, dispensing common sense TV justice to bitter, moronic litigants in life and on the show. <laughs> or sometimes she'll uh, dispense justice to comedians named Kathy Griffin. But what I didn't know until Joan Rivers spilled it to me was that Joan, Judy, Barbara Walters, and columnist Cindy Adams all had a secret pact they lovingly called... <laughs> The Alzheimer's condo. Yeah. Joan asked me one time what my plan was when I got really old. I said what anybody might say. I'll get a caregiver and live as well as I can. Joan said, no, look, I've got a plan. It's called the Alzheimer's condo. I've discussed it with Judy, Barbara, and Cindy. This all happened, by the way, apparently during a bed and breakfast trip that Joan arranged for the four of them, in which they agreed that when... <laughs> Oh, I shouldn't laugh. When dementia hit them all, they would all move into a place together. Of course, they argued over which place. Um, Judy apparently pitched her apartment, and then Joan countered with her fancy New York digs. But then they all realized that Barbara Walters should win because she had the Doris Duke apartment. Also, Barbara Walters, you know, never loses. Now, Joan's rationale for becoming roomies well, we're all Jewish girls at heart, and we still want to save money no matter what, so we could share a caregiver and a dog walker. <laughs> we also joked about how if they shared the caregiver, you know, I would say to her, like, what if you get the caregiver, like, on one of those episodes of Dateline with this hidden camera, and you find that the caregiver is, like, beating them with a rock and a sock or something? And then Joan would tell me that um, the good news is nobody would be aware of it because they'd all be so out of it. You know, we laughed at a lot. In any case, I, of course, found this all incredibly funny. You know, a little dark, but funny. But I needed to know if it was true. I made it my mission to confirm it with each person. When the opportunity arose at a Beverly Hills dinner party at Arnie and Ann Copelson's house, I had to find it out from Judy herself. I pulled her aside, and I said, Okay, I gotta know. Is it true? The Alzheimer's condo. I mean, you're known for telling it like it is, lady. 
So is this packed? Is this thing real? Because Joan Rivers told me. And then Judy goes, I love Joan. Oh, I love her so much. Yeah, I couldn't take the suspense. I go, yeah, but is it true? And Judy goes, of course it is. We decided at the bed and breakfast. Yes, I got my answer. And by the way, she was almost offended that I might not believe such a brilliant idea. All right, now I knew that Judge Judy is a stone-cold truth teller. But I wanted to confirm something else about how rich Judge Judy is. I'd recently read somewhere that she made more money in one year than LeBron James. But I said to her, you know, just deliberately mixing up to test her, hey, I wanted to congratulate you. I heard one time that you were second only to LeBron James, and she immediately corrected me. I made more money than LeBron James. No objection here, Your Honor. Shriver, comma, Maria. Journalist, Kennedy, Brunette. Like a handful of names in this book, Maria is someone that I love, even though uh, she does not love me. I mean, she's so smart and accomplished and an Oprah bestie, and she had to deal with being married to uh, the host of the new Celebrity Apprentice, or whatever he thinks he is now. Anyway, she's also had enough my crap, to the extent that at a friend's birthday party, she said to me as we were standing near a pool, if I could throw you in this pool right now, I would. That's probably somebody who's not, you know, technically a fan. And yet, by the way, when I saw her a couple years later at a different fancy Beverly Hills shindig, I was very excited. And I just went up to Maria and I go, what's the matter? Bum, there's not a pool nearby. She had the nerve to shoot back with, I never even said that. Stop telling people I said that. How quickly they forget. All right. Anyway, I was at this other fancy party. I see Shriver. And then when it came time to sit down, I noticed the tables didn't have place cards, which always makes me happy because, you know, then I can sit where I want. But I needed to be careful because there was a vague high school feeling to this particular party, and I was worried I wouldn't be at the cool table, whatever that means. By the way, that means Kathy Griffin doesn't sit down first. She waits for the right time. What I do is I'll pace with a plate of food for like an hour, okay? I'll wait these bitches out, then I'll sit down. Anyway, I saw Maria sit down and noticed an empty chair next to her. Perfect. I went up to her and I said, look, Maria, here's the deal. I'm going to sit next to you just because I know it's going to drive you crazy. I'm nothing if not honest about my intentions. She looked up at me and said, do you think after everything I've been through and all the people I've dealt with in my life, I'm afraid of you and your jokes? Sit down. Well, to me, of course, that was immensely charming. I absolutely loved how she just sort of put me in my place. We ended up having the best time talking, laughing. I mean, I think a lot of celebrities could take a page from Maria. Just let me sit down. You'll survive this. We might even bond. There might even be a pool party for you in the future where you can throw me in. Sia, singer, songwriter, hider in plain sight. For a chanteuse who was known for only wanting to be visible as an incredible voice singing through a black and white wig with a bow on top, well, guess who ran up to me one time with plenty of photographers around and said to me, I want to meet you. I want to meet you. That's right. See ya. And just so you know, I not only asked for a picture with her, but she wanted one for herself too. Now, she's not always about keeping her face hidden from the spotlight. I mean, she actually Instagrammed those photos with the two of us. But her commitment to maintaining a semblance of privacy about how she looks is, in my opinion, very edgy and very interesting and I think very smart. Not that she's not pretty. I'm just saying it's cool. She's got the mystique. All right. Anyway, we have since become friends. I've gone to her house on Christmas. And, oh, she threw me a huge solid one time when... I asked her to sing Titanium when I was hosting a fundraiser for the Trevor Project. I mean, come on, that was pretty cool. So we've hung out and gossiped. She even um, sent me a link one time for leather pants I should buy one year when I mentioned I get really cold doing CNN New Year's Eve with Anderson Cooper. You know, that's a friend. But what I love about her is that she will burst into song at a moment's notice. I love that because a lot of singers don't do that, and they get, like, weird about such requests. But I have no qualms about just turning to Sia and being like, you know that Flo Rida song you wrote and she'll just rip into, you know, hey, I heard you were a wild one. Oh, you know, she wrote the Rihanna song Diamonds, right? So I actually asked her if she sang the demo to Rihanna, 
like, for Rihanna. And <laughs> her response to prove it was that she just stood up in her living room and she sang the whole song, a cappella, perfectly. Oh, and then I was asking her what it was like to co-write a song with Britney Spears. So then she just started singing that song, Perfume. <laughs> in fact, one time I was just having a down day and I reached out to her and I go, will you do me a favor? I don't know where you are or what you're doing. Will you just sing for me for like 30 seconds and send it to me? She goes to a bathroom somewhere, like a public bathroom with good acoustics. She freaking sings to me and just sends it to me. And she goes, there you go, mate. How about that? Yeah, I got my own Coachella. There's one part of the Sia story I just can't leave out. One night, Sia, Kelly Osborne, and I randomly decided to take in a movie. I mean, nothing unusual about that, right? Three chicks just having a night out of a movie. We had dinner before. What could go wrong? Okay, so the film turned out to be a super artsy-fartsy movie called Under the Skin. It's a very, very serious film. Okay, so naturally about 20 minutes in, the three of us start getting what I call the church giggles. That's when you're laughing at an inappropriate place and an inappropriate time, and you can't stop laughing. And it's infectious. So then we start getting hushed. So Kelly Osborne just turns and goes to, like, some woman behind us. Don't make me punch you in the face! And then Sia goes, I'm Australian, I can take him! Uh, we got kicked out. Yeah, the usher kicked us out, and then we just went to the lobby and laughed for five minutes. Also, we were laughing about how none of us could even understand this movie. So anyway, we're laughing, we all take pictures, and we tweeted the photo with a caption that was something like, the three worst people to see a serious movie with. <laughs> By the way, looking back, I should have just had see a sing chandelier to the usher. Spears, comma, Brittany. Singer, snake charmer, patient. When I first met Brit, she was opening for NSYNC, and I was already friendly with Lance Bass. Please. Backstage of the pre-show crew meal, she shows up in her Hit Me Baby One More Time getup, and I just turned to her. I didn't know who she was. I was like, hey, you're that sexy cheerleader, huh? And she goes, I know. All right. Anyway, the point is she was in pre-show mode, and she probably would, just would have said I know to anything as she whisked past me with her backup dancers. Okay. So when I hosted the Billboard Music Awards later with NSYNC, she and Timberlake were openly dating at that time, and her stardom was so big, like, I was frankly shocked that Timberlake was able to even, like, corral her for the skit that we did. You can look it up online. It's kind of cute. Anyway, what I remember about the few minutes of rehearsal that we got with Britney was that Timberlake was, like, kind of a dick to her. Like, he kept calling her baby, but in this really condescending way. Like, baby, baby, focus. Baby, come here, baby. Come on, we only have a minute. Baby, come on. Like, I wanted to go, Jesus, stop calling her that. But I don't know, maybe he knew something we didn't know. All I can say is that whole time was the frenzy about, we got Britney, we got her for a few minutes, let's get Britney. It's Britney's world. Great. Okay, fine. Over a decade later, at the iHeartRadio concert in Vegas in 2012, I heard Britney was going to present. Now, at that time, she was dating my former TV agent, this guy named Jason Trawick. So, naturally, I parked myself near the teleprompters, as I do, because I wasn't going to miss her before or after going on stage. All right, so Seacrest is there, and uh, he asked me if I was going on soon. And I go, no, I'm just watching, because I want to see how you handle Britney. And, you know, Seacrest, why? What are you talking about? I go, you know why. So, all right. <laughs> they may as well have dollied her out Hannibal Lecter style. I mean... It was one of her pinwheel eyes moments. Treywick handed her to Seacrest with one arm holding her as if she were, you know, 90. So she walks by and I go, hi, Brittany, it's Kathy. I yelled. I got my generic, hi, y'all. Then Seacrest escorted her on stage. Then it was back to the wings and the handoff to Treywick. Oh, by the way, when he was walking her out, I said to my former TV agent, come on, Treywick. Get rid of Britney and represent a real star like me for a change. You used to be my TV agent. By the way, he chimed back with, you're the reason I got out of the business, which I actually thought was funny. Okay, so maybe the best story, though, is when my assistant, John, got the brilliant idea of getting me into her Vegas show for the freak show number, because that is when there's an audience member, usually a dude, who gets a spanking slash whipping treatment on stage. So... 
of course, I wanted to be that person. All right, her manager got the okay from Brittany and then said to me, you know, she's a little afraid you're going to say something embarrassing while you're on stage with her. To which I think I said, as if the microphone's on. Um, by the way, when Jezebel.com reported that she was lip syncing the Vegas show, I believe they said it was a shock to absolutely nobody. Which is fine with me also. By the time my boyfriend and I got to the show, I was actually excited to see her do her thing. I mean, whatever shape she's in. It had been a while, and it was fun to see the spectacle and the dancing, and she's got a million hits. I mean, I knew she'd remember me. I've known her since she was 16. My boyfriend was skeptical. <sighs> whatever. Then I got called on stage for my big cameo appearance in what I've now come to call my This Is What It's Like to Be Britney Spears for 90 Seconds experience, which means the sexy male dancers, or backup gay angels as I've named them, told me everything I had to do. That's right. I didn't have to do anything, which um, I assume is quite simply how they handle Britney 24-7. It was awesome, though. I didn't have to think. I didn't have to remember anything. Oh, it was great. They just instructed me, right arm up, left arm up, turn left, turn right. We're walking, walking, now stepping down, on your knees, all fours, hair whip, look at Brittany, hug Brittany, kiss Brittany, goodbye. Oh, it was heaven, actually. At the end, by the way, she signed a t-shirt and gave it to me. All right, I don't mean to be an asshole, but <laughs> it's kind of like, thanks for the t-shirt. All right. Um, then she was very sweet. I, I had a great time. So then it's time to say goodbye. And she goes, give it up, y'all. And then the backup dancer had to tell her who I was. Yeah. Right before that, I saw him go in her ear. And clearly he said, by the way, it's Kathy Griffin. And if you look at the tape, she just goes, give it up, y'all, for Miss Kathy. And she didn't get the Griffin part. But you know what? Here's the thing. Looking back, I think of that as one of the deepest conversations I've ever had with my Brittany, and I'm always going to treasure it. And so will she, if she remembers. Stallone, comma, Sylvester. Rocky, Rambo, expendable. I ran into Sly in the run-up to the 2016 Oscars when he was enjoying the awards circuit after getting nominated for playing Rocky Balboa, again so triumphantly in Creed. My in was his wife, Jennifer Flavin, who was one of those really smart businesswomen who took advantage of home shopping early on and turned her hugely successful skincare line into an empire. So I knew her from when she was a guest on my life on the D-list, which, frankly, she kind of wouldn't shut up about that night. Flavin. I was the best guest, and you never called me to be on your show again. Me. It wasn't a talk show. Anyway, she's gorgeous and loaded. So I had to rib Sly about how she has more money than he is. And I said to him, I go, you know, you married up and nobody knows this. I cracked. He agreed, laughing. That's not even a joke, he said. So far, so good. Then I complimented him, of course, on his nomination. And I said, please tell me you're having the time of your life. I mean, you're having the year you're supposed to have with Copland. I was referencing an independent movie from 1997 in which he played a deaf, overweight cop, a role that was supposed to rescue him from action movies and showcase his drama chops. Although he was really, really great in Copland, that love kind of eluded him. And then almost 20 years later, playing an older, wiser, sadder Rocky Balboa in Creed, that love from Hollywood finally came out. Shows you how enduring that role was for him and what can happen to the legends if we... I mean, if they stick around long enough. Anyway, he loved that I referenced Copland, so I made my move to get a picture with him. Of course, Flavin gets in the middle, and I had no qualms about telling her to scram. You know, I'll say it to my own boyfriend. Randy, move aside, you're going to get cropped out. Which is it? So <laughs> Sly and I are posing. We're in close. He's on my left with his right arm around my waist, and with his left hand, he keeps reaching over and grabbing my right forearm in the weirdest way. Finally, he just physically made me do what he wanted, which is stage the photo so my right hand is in a fist just under his chin, like I'm going to pinch him. Oh, all right. Then he explained his polite grappling. He says to me, my whole career, no matter what picture I take with a famous person, this is the one that'll run. This is the one they want. Nobody wants anything else. You know what? Talk about a guy who knows how to turn being a punching bag on screen and off 
into a lifelong turn of the spotlight? Yeah, that's right. Oh, by the way, the fist picture, you know, like the fake punching picture that ran, was sly with Jamie Foxx. Damn it. Why didn't I take that Ray Charles role when it was offered to me? Steinem, comma, Gloria. Feminist icon, founder of Ms. Magazine, Laffer. On my 50th birthday, I was a single woman determined to make the night special without a help of any man. I became bound and determined to meet the great Gloria Steinem, champion for women's rights and stone-cold hero of mine. Among her many accomplishments, those of you who aren't up on the struggle and Gloria's place in it, are that she coined the phrase reproductive freedom and has done so many incredible things. Okay, so what was funny about my sudden desire to meet her was that it was partly inspired by me having gone through a really bad breakup. <laughs> I was worried I was never going to find love again, and I thought about Steinem and how her life as an activist and target for anti-woman hatred probably made dating extra difficult for her or even finding lasting relationships. So Jane Fonda was kind enough to give me Steinem's email. So I cold emailed her, I guess instead of cold calls, and I said I'd love to take her out to dinner on an upcoming trip to New York. I probably sounded a little desperate, but she wrote back with a yes, and I was thrilled. We met at a fancy vegetarian restaurant, and I proceeded to ask her about her amazing life, the movement, her range of experiences from going head-to-head -head on Meet the Press with a clearly beyond sexist senator to marching in the streets with Angela Davis and Bella Obzug. Well, I was in heaven. And we were getting around to the state of feminism today, which is, like, important. But I admit, I felt really silly asking this great feminist and intellectual about my, um, boy problems. So I shyly just kind of chimed in with, um, I'm sad. I'm not dating someone. Yeah, as you can imagine, it sounded pathetic. I had suddenly turned into a 14-year-old crying, I want a boyfriend. Was I really complaining about this to Gloria Steinem? But then she surprised me by saying, actually, I think relationships are very important. I'm very much a romantic, and I believe in love. In fact, I'm a little bit of a matchmaker. Uh, I couldn't believe this. The great Gloria Steinem is going to help me, and maybe she's even going to be a matchmaker? Let's think about this, she said. What are you looking for? We spent the next hour laughing and going back and forth about essential and important qualities for the future Mr. Griffin. Does he have to have a fancy house? Not necessarily. I have one. Is he smart? Necessary. Is he a feminist? Mandatory. Will he buy you trinkets, jewels, and a sports car? Never mind. I can do that myself. So after our meal, I remember walking out of the restaurant into the rain, and we were both still laughing as we said our goodbyes. Such was the basis for a lasting friendship, one that to me proves how resolutely the great feminist icons care about laughing and the necessity of the funny women who love them. By the way, it really irritates me when feminists get tarred with the, like, no sense of humor brush, because Gloria is not only funny herself, but she knows how important and cathartic laughing is in general. In 2014, she asked me to host a fundraiser for one of her favorite organizations, Equality Now, where she was being honored along with uh, Selma Hayek. So Congresswoman Maxine Waters and Quincy Jones were also participating. So here I am, yet again, hosting a serious charity event in an A-list room with big money donors. Oh, Steinem, how can you do this to me? You know I'm going to be too vulgar for these stiffs. She was so sweet. She actually introduced me to basically let the audience know what they were in for. She goes up, takes the microphone, the audience hushed, and she brought me onto the stage with the following intro. Hey, everybody. My friend Kathy is nervous to host the show because she's afraid she's going to be inappropriate. So I'm here to tell you it's okay to laugh at her. The audience loved that. She even continued with, you know, laughter is the only true free emotion. Even love can be compelled. If someone feels bound to someone else, it can be compelled, practically captive, but no one can compel laughter. It's the ultimate proof of freedom. That's why we as women need to laugh. And we need to know that women can make us all laugh, men as well as women. Everyone can make us laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, don't be afraid to laugh. Your host for the evening, Kathy Griffin. That's
that's what I call feminism. Stephanopoulos, comma, George. ABC, anchor, Council of Foreign Relations, including me. Don't you hate it when one of your friends marries the White House communications director and you don't, like, hear from her as much? Oh, <laughs> me too. My old growling pal, Allie Wentworth, got hitched to George Stephanopoulos in 2001. And, well, all right, she moved across the country. But I don't get to spend as much time with her as I'd like. Whose fault is that? <laughs> George's, of course. But I figured out a way to make him pay. That's right. I was asked to be a lead guest on GMA to promote my 2015 performance at Carnegie Hall. Yeah, my sold-out show, Carnegie Hall. Anyway, sometimes you should know a good bit is 14 years in the making. Now, I've been a fan of George's forever, and I respect him tremendously. But for a while there, I wasn't sure if Allie was making up their relationship because I never saw them together. All right, I eventually had a super awkward experience with George in 2012. Oh, this is great. So I had planned to meet up with my pal Lara Spencer at the bar in New York's Mandarin Oriental Hotel because I was doing a gay club appearance later in that evening. Don't even ask. Anyway, she was coming from a taping of the now-canceled Piers Morgan Live, and there was like this overlap where she and I could meet up. Okay, so much to my surprise, the whole cast of GMA showed up to the restaurant with Lara. So maybe when Lara was planning a casual get-together with her old pal Kathy, it didn't occur to either one of us that it might appear as if I were crashing their intimate, like, cast-only soiree to celebrate being number one in the ratings for the first time in years. So sensing her discomfort, yet knowing a comedy moment might be about to happen— I just looked at Lara and said something like, too bad, I got two hours left, I'm not leaving. <laughs> Robin Roberts and Sam Champion came up to me and said very nice things, but I immediately had the impression that George wasn't like overtly comfortable with ending a very long work day, probably expecting maybe a nice quiet recap with his workmates, only to be faced with me and my boyfriend. But you know what? I thought, He'll survive. He survived the Clinton administration. He can survive me. So my boyfriend Randy ordered some sliders, truffle cheese fries, and I don't know, charred Brussels sprouts or something because we were starving. When our order came, George started eating all of our food. <laughs> I go, George, you have to stop bogarting the food because guess who's paying for it now? You, George. He laughed at that, but then quickly went back to looking like he was deep in the middle of planning his next interview with the Secretary General of the UN or something. I get that a lot. Some rating celebration, George. Not as exhilarating as taking the White House. Anyway, Randy and I just settled the tab and left. The GMA gang was there alone, just with their remaining appetizers and also their high ratings. Anyway, back to my hilarious appearance ruling the couch of GMA. So, during the commercial break, I went to work on my friend Ellie's spouse. I say to the panel, this isn't going to work, everybody. If George doesn't get me, he said in that very even tone of his, I get you. I said, okay, but I feel like you're afraid of me, and I'm trying to be funny here, and you're throwing me off my game, like the night you ate all my food at the Mandarin Oriental. <laughs> and he had this, you remember that look? Oh, I had fun with him. He actually took it like a champ. So afterward, I said, hey, I emailed Allie, and it bounced back. I'm not sure if I have our current email address, so um, will you put it in my phone? So he takes my iPhone, and because he's, you know, like many of us, maybe a techno-deficient 50-something, and also really nervous to be around a star with my stature, um, he apparently struggled with this simple request. How do I know this? Because later in the day, I get an email from George. Why? He had clearly accidentally put his own email address in my phone instead of his wife's email address. So George had no idea. He's unleashed the beast. The following is the actual email correspondence between myself and George Stephanopoulos. Enjoy. <sighs> okay. Stephanopoulos writes to me. Kathy says hi. <laughs> By the way, that's when I realized that George thought he was sending me Allie's email address, but he was just... I think he thought he was emailing Allie because it's... I get an email from him saying Kathy says hi. All right, the point is I was going to have some fun. So I write back, hello, George. 
And so he just writes, I thought he was going to write back like, oh, sorry, I thought Allie was, you know. So he just writes back, hi, fun today. Okay, so I then, the next day, email him again. Hello, George. He writes me back, hi. I wait eight days. So I write, hi, George. Yeah, I'm fine. He writes back, so relieved. By the way, just, I know his game. Like, he knows that I'm going to use any of these against him in or out of a court of law. So I'm just suggesting that, obviously, that's why he's writing me answers that don't even have to do with the question. He clearly doesn't want any evidence or anything in proof that he says something ridiculous. So I can tell you guys. All right, I continue. So I write, I'm fine. And he writes, so relieved. <laughs> so then, um, like, three weeks later, I just write, George, I can't talk now. And then he writes back, he's there. All right, so I get it. He's playing along. So then, like a month later, I just reach out to George again, and I go, I'm going to Mexico until Sunday. I can't talk. So he writes back, you're going to miss the debate? <laughs> so about a month later, I send him another one, and the subject title is just My Day. So I wrote, I'll probably go for a hike and do some light packing for my next live dates. What do you need to know? He writes back, just makes me smile. Um, let me just say that this project, it's um, the type of thing that gives my life meaning. To the extent that, by the way, once I started these ridiculous emails, of course I put it in the act. So I actually put the first couple in my Carnegie Hall show. So you know me. I read them live from the stage. It's all fodder. And um, I told the audience how the great political mind and broadcast journalist George Stephanopoulos doesn't really know how to use email on a phone with a giant star like myself. At which point, his wife, Allie, who was in the audience, did the perfect thing. She stood up in the middle of Carnegie Hall and shouted, He's my husband, and you're tearing our marriage apart! Well, I mean, come on. The audience erupted in applause. And I have to say thank you, Allie, for not only helping open up my lines of communication with Good Morning America in general, but just your choice of men, and also, you know, thank you for marrying someone that ended up giving me material. You are a true friend. Streisand, comma, Barbara. Singer, actor, director, fierce. The first time I was ever near her, Brooke Shields and Andre Agassi were celebrating their engagement party at David Foster's house in Malibu. The party was pretty small, maybe 40 people, and yet I had no contact with her. I couldn't like, act like we're BFFs, right? But I was excited to kind of be in her orbit, I admit it. It was a taste, but it wasn't enough. Years later, I had a very fun, brief encounter with her. And while, I'm look, I'm never going to act like we're besties, I will say, even knowing her like a little bit, believe it or not, I feel oddly protective of her. And um, I have to tell you about a particular night that I really felt protective over my... Not really friend, but I've met Barbara Streisand. All right, whatever. You know, she's she's still beautiful, still endearingly has that Brooklyn, like, hello, gorgeous voice. And, you know, she's still Streisand. You get it. And if you don't get it, get the hell out of this book. All right, I want to describe to you what happened at the Staples Center in downtown Los Angeles when Bette Midler was on her fabulous divine intervention tour. For shows like that, I don't want to be in a private celebrity skybox to the side with some angled view far from the action. I want to be in the seats as close as possible. So that night, I took my seat in the thick of the superfans. And as I've often said in my act, you cannot underestimate the level of partying you will get at a concert from middle-aged gay men and the Jewish ladies of a certain age who love them. And they were there to party. Yeah, take that, millennials. Oh, you guys are so badass with your Coachella. Please, we can out-party the hell out of you. You should see us at a Journey concert or Foreigner with our comfortable sneakers. Look out. Anyway, you got your middle-aged gay men. You got your Jewish ladies who love Streisand. This was a perfect storm for what was about to follow. So some people in the crowd started to notice me, you know, whatever. And then I hear it. I want a picture. I want a picture. So of course I obliged. I'm doing selfies, whatever. But then I look across the aisle from me, five or six rows up, and there's Billy Crystal. So then the woman behind me says rather loudly, 
Oh my God, it's Billy Crystal. Should we get a picture? By the way, I had just taken a picture with her myself, and I was actually hoping she wouldn't bother Billy, who clearly did not want to be noticed that night. But she goes up to him anyway. She sticks her iPad, not her cell phone, but her iPad in his face on video. And she's saying to Billy Crystal, say something funny. I'm videotaping you. Oh boy. He said something like, I don't know what you want me to say. You could feel the air molecules change and thousands of people just shifted their focus to poor Billy. I felt for him, right? Because he's this, this woman's just screaming in his face. But then the room began to hum in a way I can only describe as a low gay rumble. For those of you that watch way too much Weather Channel, as I do, it was not dissimilar from how you would hear a Midwestern tornado survivor describe the beginning of a massive twister. Something was happening behind me. It wasn't the show starting because the house lights were still on. The rumble then became an oscillating wave of gay gasping, and I saw her walk down the aisle past me with her husband, James Brolin. Yeah, Billy Crystal who? First of all, what in the world was she doing in regular floor seats? Streisand does not move among the regular people. She wasn't even in her full, like, movie star hair and makeup. Where the hell was her diva lighting? Who has fallen on the job here? In a word, unacceptable. And there was nothing in Brolin's demeanor to suggest he was even worried about her. Well, he should have been, because people, and in this case, people were, how shall I say, Bette Midler's and Barbara Streisand's combined fan base. You know what I'm saying? Well, they all instantly just lost all composure. The eye of the storm had made land, and it was a melee. And a gay lay. I mean, cell phones were popping up by the hundreds. People rubbernecking more than any amount of icy hot could ever soothe. Bodies leaning forward, then back. Friends confirming that this was, in fact, a genuine Streisand sighting. The rumble got louder. Meanwhile, my beloved 55-year-old gay men and same-age Jewish gals were standing on their chairs to take pictures. Some just ran right in front of her to do it. Then the same woman who had moved from me to Billy Crystal pivoted with her iPad in hand and started yelling, Barbara, Barbara, sing, sing a song. All right. Even my boyfriend turns to me and goes, uh, should I go help her? And I said, no, that might make it worse. You could get gay trampled. The lights finally went down, and there were so many cell phones going on that I actually heard Streisand say, look at all those rectangles. Look at all those rectangles. Yeah. I don't, I don't think she was meant to just, like, sit somewhere and have hundreds of rectangles that maybe she didn't even know were cameras. Just take her picture. Oh, God. It was classic. Look, I get it. These fans have wanted to be up close and personal with Lost Dry Sand. I get it. But I have to admit, I was still nervous for her. I'm just going to say it. Jim Brolin needs to be on security duty a lot more. Because, you know, if they start showing up at Palm Springs street fairs or something together, you're going to know I'm right. Styles, comma, Harry. Boy, oh boy, band member. When the Eagles brought their final L.A. shows to the forum, I didn't know that the seating gods would be smiling on me, but they were. I was seated next to none other than Harry Styles of One Direction and a little up-and-coming model, reality star, professional Twitter scroller named Candle Jenner. I think that's her name. Anyway, naturally... I stood up, welcomed them with open arms. Harry, is that you? Keep in mind, of course, I've never met Harry Styles. Candle? I shouted. She picked her head up from her phone long enough to just sigh with the disdain of someone who was being forced to watch a bunch of old dudes sing songs from, like, the last century. Anyway, one-fifth, one direction. Yeah, Zane, please just come back. That's Harry. Meanwhile, he was wearing uh, his beloved YSL double-breasted, like, military-looking peacoat thingy and a headband. And uh, if I could have given him a fife and a musket to complete the picture, I would have. And yet, 
he also kind of looked like he just stepped out of a One Direction concert. Um, did I mention that he seemed not just like a Civil War reenactment character, but um, I'm only alleging this here. He also seemed like a really, really wasted Harry Styles. Yeah. I was also well aware of how many times he was getting up and leaving, which seemed odd since he was in the company of a Jenner Kardashian, one of them. Anyway, each time he left, he wouldn't even take his coat. So eventually, Candle, who must have been just sick of being left behind, just peaced out. I don't blame her. Then Harry came back, handed his coat to Fergie, of the Black Eyed Peas Fergie, who was sitting in the row ahead of us, and then um, he took off <laughs> again. So a little later, Fergie turns to me, and she goes, Ugh. I know you're going to make fun of me. I'm like one of those Hollywood moms, but I really do have to leave early. Got to go take care of the kid. So will you watch Harry's Coat? To which I said, yes, Fergie, I will. And you are a very good judge of character. Um, so I heard Fergie and her gorgeous uh, shallow husband, Josh Demel, laugh. So I knew I was okay. Um, anyway, I then proceeded to borrow Harry's coat. I stole it. In other words, whatever. I just started taking selfies with it, and I posted the pictures online immediately because I knew it would send ripples of fear, jealousy, giggles, and bewilderment through the directioner world. And sure enough, my twat feed, Twitter feed, blew up. So I was ready to just walk off with the coat when I um, heard one of Harry's friends shout, Scriffin, while snapping his fingers. Miss Griffin, Harry needs his coat back. I was like, um, it's mine? I got it today at Neiman's? He didn't buy that, so I had to return it. Uh, thank God there's no such thing as directioner's jail. If there was, I'd be in it because of what happened moments later. I'll tell you why. Okay, after the show, I took my backstage pass and was directed into a room to wait for the band. So I'm ushered into this nice and small room, right? So my fellow backstage... Maybe autograph-seeking fans included everyone from Jerry Bruckheimer. I think that Patriots owner Robert Kraft was there. Uh, Cindy Crawford, Randy Gerber, Chris Jenner, um, my pal Rita Wilson, her husband Tom Hanks. It was a you know it was a good room. So I instinctively just walk up to Tom first. So I know I can like count on him to share an experience like this with. So you'll see why in a second. Anyway. Um, I don't even remember what I was talking to Tom Hanks about in that moment, because the very next moment, a very, I'm sorry, an allegedly very, very wasted Harry Styles walks into the room and made a beeline for Tom Hanks. I don't think Harry even saw me, which, by the way, can be essential for gathering celebrity material. Anyway, it was as if I had taken my invisible pill and I was allowed to just observe and mentally log everything that these two titans of the arts would be talking about. Uh, Harry and I'm alleging he was drunk, had a great opener. Remember when you was saving Private Ryan and had to bring him back to his mom? Remember? This is what he says to Tom Hanks. So Tom Hanks, he's a little, like, perplexed. So he just looks at Harry Styles and he goes, yes. So Harry continues. Remember when you was in Captain Phillips? Remember? And then the skinny black guy comes up and goes... I'm the captain now. Was that scary? Remember? All right, I can tell Tom Hanks is like trying to figure this guy out. So he's just saying things like, yes. Yes, I remember. And Harry keeps going, was that scary? And Tom's like, yeah, yeah, it sure was. All right, so <laughs> then Tom Hanks turns to Harry Styles, and I believe he was trying to save Harry from himself. And... He says to Harry Styles, um, have you met my friend, the comedian, Kathy Griffin? And he's kind of making that face like, hello, I'm trying to hook you up. He's a comedian. Take it down a notch. Okay. So then <laughs> Harry Styles finally notices me and goes, oh, am I going to be in one of your skits? Am I going to be in one of your comedy skits now? And I love how he kept saying skits, like I'm fucking Benny Hill and I have like a bicycle, right? So I actually said, yeah, you have just walked into my act. Yep, you are in my skits, I promise. 
So then I actually um, said it so loud that Chris Jenner walked over. And Chris Jenner says to Harry Styles, Harry, why don't you take our spot for a while? And then she just walked away, which I thought was kind of cute. Anyway, ooh, now he knows I'm a comedian and apparently thinks I do skits. Maybe I should just get a topless girl on a bicycle or something. So then Harry turns his focus back to Tom Hanks, unfazed. And he's continuing with this questioning about all of Tom's films and if Tom remembers them. So then he turns to Tom Hanks and he goes, Remember when you was Forrest Gump? Remember? And Tom's like, I do. I remember. And he goes, Remember how you was always running? Forrest Gump was always running. Remember? Was that scary? Remember? Yeah. He's asking Tom Hanks if Tom remembers playing the role of Forrest Gump, for which he won the Academy Award. Now, I can't point out here enough how Harry Styles seemed to think it was like his mission to make sure that Tom Hanks didn't forget the names of any of his films or the fact that he had starred in these films. And then Harry kept going like, that were a good film. And Tom would be like, I do remember. All right, so finally, <laughs> Harry Styles finishes his reign of terror, turns away, pivots, stumbles out, and Tom and I are still standing there. And Tom, by the way, has been kind of frozen in this spot the whole time. And he's got this perplexed look, like he's actually thinking about it, right? So Harry Styles stumbles out, and Tom turns to me with the most perfect timing and goes like this. Sometimes I just want to drive them to rehab myself. Swift, comma, Taylor. Singer, songwriter, cult leader. Well, she hates me. I'm pretty sure there's some bad blood. We were at the same high-profile event in which the celebrities in the audience are actually called out by name. So when the host announced me, well, I had a funny little idea. You know me and my funny little ideas, the ones I implement before I've completely thought them through in my head. Anyway, they said, you know, Kathy Griffin is here. And I stood up, I looked right at Taylor, and I gave her like the two-finger, you know, like I'm watching you gesture where you go back and forth while mouthing the words, I'm coming for you, which I thought that was really funny. Anyway, she looked bewildered and not happy. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, a blown kiss, smiling, clapping, and jumping up and down. Thank God my idol Kathy Griffin noticed me. Think, Kathy, think. Anyway, a few minutes later, she and her infamous girl squad, Lord... Kara Delavine and uh, the band Haim, although in my twisted moments of selected memory loss, which I suffer from a lot, I can't help thinking of them as the band Corey Haim. I, I, I'm not proud. Um, it just pops into my head. Sorry. Anyway, um, so she and the girl squad walks past me on the way to the restroom, and I stood up and I actually started to say to her, Swifty, come on, I'm just fucking with you. I didn't even have the opportunity or I started it. They blew past me. And when I looked back at them, they had gathered in a cluster, a very menacing cluster, as if on cue. And then I realized I had to use the bathroom too. Oh boy, this lipstick isn't going to reapply itself. Now, there is no way I was going to go to the ladies' room at that moment, all right? She and her gang could have jumped my middle-aged ass without a second thought. So fine, touche, Taylor. Ever since that, I've decided to save my hilarious I'm watching you gesture until after I see the celebrity go and come back for the toilet. That is just smart strategic battle planning. T, comma, Mr. No fool to be pitied. Surprise KG tour manager. When I was on Suddenly Susan, my profile was large enough that I began to book stand up gigs at larger spaces than comedy clubs. I toured by myself then, which is not a completely thought-through decision, because unlike hitting clubs where there are other comics on the bill to hang with, a solo tour, you know, where you're playing and performing in music venues or theaters, you know, that means you're just by yourself all the time. It was dumb, and I should have brought someone along to help me and keep me company. But hey, it was great that I was selling too many tickets to do clubs. Well, during this initial burst of larger venue shows, I found myself in Chicago staying at the Ritz-Carlton, which is, you know, A-list all the way. It was getting close to showtime, so I go down to the hotel entrance to look for the venue's car that they sent for me to take me to the show. It wasn't there. So minutes later, still not there. I'm starting to worry, and, you know, 
I'm going to go in, look for a phone. I don't know what I'm going to do. And then I see Mr. T walk out of the hotel. By the way, he's hard to miss. Just ask Colonel Hannibal Smith or Lieutenant Templeton Peck. Those are the real names. He was in the full Mr. T regalia, too. The mohawk, the chains, the tank top. And if I remember correctly, there might have been balloon pants. He had a small posse with him. And while I was standing there staring at him, I swear to God, he looks at me and he's like, Hey, funny lady. All right, I can't do his voice. I go, hi. Um, I didn't want to bother you, but it's a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? He told me what he was doing in town. I think it was a charity benefit or something, and then asked me what I was up to. And I said, well, I'm actually headlining at a theater in 20 minutes, and I've been waiting for the car, and it hasn't arrived. So, I'm, frankly, what I'm doing is I'm kind of nervous. Without hesitation, he pointed to his a little bit old-timey stretch limo and just said, get in. Well, I piled in with Mr. T and three of his buddies, and I got the sweetest ride ever to my gig. We had a great time chatting and laughing the whole way there. And when the limo pulled up to the theater, I said to him, will you do me a favor and just stay here for one second? I flung the door open. I hopped out and just stood on the sidewalk and yelled, gays! I just want to acknowledge here that there was an assumption then on my part that the groups of men entering the theater may not be all heterosexual. I recognize the rashness of my outburst. But look, this was the 90s. It was a more innocent time. Anyway, I'm just shouting, stop whatever you're doing. I need witnesses. Look who drove me to my show. Mr. T. Wave, Mr. T. And Mr. T pops his head out of the limo and gave a friendly wave. Okay, maybe only 10 people saw this, but they all clapped excitedly. The limo peeled out, and guess what? I then had the first 10 minutes of my act. So if you have a problem, are late for a stand-up show, If no one else can help, and if you find them, maybe you can hire the A-team. Tatum, comma, Channing. Stepper, stripper, chubby. I've known Tatum for a while. I've known his wife, Jenna, through the Lance Bass game night party circuit even longer. I can tease Tatum pretty easily. Somebody has to. And by the way, don't act like you wouldn't have been a little excited to see Step Up's Tyler Gage walk past you in first class to go take his seat and coach on a rather long flight to Toronto. That's right. He was wearing a hoodie, as if I wasn't going to recognize him. As I sat in my comfortable first class seat, I may have raised my voice a hair as he walked past me and said something like, Channing Tatum? Economy class? Really? Geez, you announced you were once a male stripper? I'm sorry, I mean dancer, and suddenly you're just kicked out of first class? Oh, God love him. He laughed a little and just said, hi, Kathy. In 2014, I did a Fox television show that was a celebration of rescue dogs, which is, by the way, a very celeb-packed affair. After I said hi to Jen in the backstage area, I went up to Tatum, no longer my pal from Lance Bass's kitchen potlucks, but now a global movie star, and just to see if he would get the joke, I go, What have you been up to, Tatum? Anything? In his very sweet, gentle way, he just goes, oh, hi, Kathy. I go, Jesus, you've been away for a while. I mean, it was step up and then kind of nothing. Are things that bad? Without irony, as if he really thought I didn't know that he'd become like one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, he goes like this. Yeah, I just wrapped Mike too. I made a very disappointed face. And of course, I had to give him the slow clap and proudly announce to the rest of the awaiting celebrities in the backstage dressing room, Oh, Tatum, what's happened to you? Are you so insider you talk about your movies like everyone's the key grip or they're all hip to the crew lingo? I believe the title is actually Magic Mike XXL. Ladies and gentlemen, Channing Tatum from the upcoming Mike 2, whatever that is. It sounds like something you would yell during an audio check. Ah, Anyway, he always gives me the good sports smile. I'm always positive he knows it's best to just answer any question of mine with just, like, simple facts in the hopes that I'll get bored and leave. It's a smart move, if you ask me. Tarantino got it wrong. He should have cast Tatum in The Lovable Eight. Thurman, comma, Uma. Actress, mother, killed Bill. Quentin Tarantino's sense of humor is such that when he invited me to his non-televised Friars Roast in 2010, he purposely sat me next to Uma Thurman because he knew I would make fun of her. Because 
I already was making fun of her affectations, shall I say, in my act. The changing accent she seems to have makes her sound like she's from nebulous continental country, one that I call Europea. Anyway, Quentin knew I'd made that joke, and he sat me next to her. God love him for that. I was excited, of course. So excited that before the show, I banged on her dressing room door. Uma, Uma, it's Kathy Griffin. My dressing room doesn't have a bathroom. Big lie. And I have to use yours. So she let me in. I used her bathroom, and then I came out, and I just said, Woo, what's going on? A lot of pressure out there, huh? Sam Jackson's out there, Harvey Keitel. I mean, this thing is big time. Are you ready? You know what you're going to say? I just wanted to ramp her up. I mean, it was kind of fun. She was sitting at a vanity, a little slumped over, checking her Blackberry. I mean, maybe I had gotten her to cry already? Oh, damn. I didn't want to shoot my load this early. Not with Thurman. Then when we were seated next to each other at the long table that flanks the podium and faces the audience, and she realized she was basically stuck with me for a few hours, she mentioned a few times how nervous she was that she wouldn't be funny when she spoke. So I said... You're going to be hilarious. I mean, you are known for your rock-solid one-liners. Just get up there and do you, girl. She eyed me suspiciously and stated the obvious. I know you're making fun of me. Uh, what are you talking about? When I think funny, I think Thurman. Just give him that chunk you either do on uh, The Tonight Show or maybe the clubs. Do your bit about airplane food or dirty diapers or whatever. You're going to rock it. All right, mostly, though, she just kept checking her BlackBerry. Keep in mind, by the way, we're all on a dais and visible to the large ballroom audience. Uma, Uma, the whole audience can see you, you know. It's not about you today. It's about Quentin. So I turn to movie mogul Harvey Weinstein, who was on my other side. I go, Harvey, take care of your star. She's doing a little something called stealing focus. Ever hear of it? Get her off that BlackBerry. And then Uma goes, it's my kids she said, which, by the way, is everyone's excuse. And I go, are they dead? And she goes, oh, that's horrible. I go, yeah, exactly. Get off the phone. So I'm doing my thing. So of course, when her turn came, by the way, she very wisely was just charming and beautiful and spoke of how much she loved Quentin. So although her why do I have to sit next to Kathy Griffin material, you know, would have killed, she chose not to do it. Oh, hell, I have to tell you something else. While I've had a lot of fun recapping my Uma Thurman experience, I must, in the spirit of full disclosure, admit to you that when it was my turn to take the podium and deliver a truly hilarious roast to Quentin, I bombed. I mean, you guys, I bombed badly. When interviewers or anyone say things like, oh, I don't believe that you bomb anymore, that must have been from your early days of stand-up, I have to admit that if you ever uncovered a tape of this roast from 2010, you would see otherwise. Yeah, it still happens. And that's why every single day I try to get better. I try to get funnier. I try to get sharper, whatever it takes. So in this case, I can freely admit to you that I totally tanked my performance. But I just want you to know that I had very funny banter with Uma Thurman. So yeah, when I look back on that day, I don't even know why I choked when it was time for me to take the podium. It happens. But I just want to share this with you because sometimes the funniest bits are behind the scenes. Tomlin, comma, Lily. Chameleon, genius, loves cock. After I stalked the great Lily Tomlin to be on my life on the D-list, we actually became pals. I courted her properly, too. We were performing at the same casino in Canada on different nights, so I flew up early to see her show, then met her afterwards, and we instantly clicked. We filmed a scene for my show where the two of us sat on her bed in her hotel room and gossiped, and she was even kind enough to stay in Canada an extra day to film an extra scene where we sat in a restaurant and um, prank called celebrities. Look, as a performer, she is unparalleled. If you haven't seen her one-woman masterpiece, The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe, or any of her incredible movie roles from Nashville to Grandma, you got your homework. As long as she's been doing this, too, her timing is still as edgy as ever, and she's got it even when we just talk, you know? I feel like anything can happen at any moment with her. She's got this wry, naughty sense of humor that pops up when you least expect it. Yet, she does the thing where she always acts like I'm the one who's shocking her. 
It's as if we're trying to adjust our shockometers so that the other one is surprised. Just when I'm dialing mine down from 10 to 7, she's jacking hers up and vice versa. She knows what she's doing, and I love it. I asked her once if during the filming of Grandma, in which she plays a very vibrant, radical lesbian who once had an affair with Sam Elliott's character, if there was maybe one moment during the filming, one moment in which she maybe wanted to screw Sam Elliott. I said, come on, Lily, I know you. Lesbians say that their minds are made up, but you know, come on, maybe there was one minute where you thought, and then she goes, no, no, not for a minute. I wasn't attracted to him. Pause. I'm kidding. I would screw the shit out of him. I mean, come on. She's fun to talk to. And every time she lets me see her impish side, I am in heaven. Okay, my favorite story of hers is when she told me about the year she was nominated for an Oscar for Nashville. She said she always regretted something about that ceremony. It was the pre-Joan Rivers era when the red carpet wasn't even covered in those days the way it is now, or even considered important. So she would say, In those days, we just went to a department store and pulled something off the rack. I mean, the idea that anyone would ask what you were wearing, I mean, come on. So what she said that she wishes she had done, however, is shown up as either her five-and-a-half-year-old character, Edith Ann, or preferably her hilariously arrogant switchboard operator, Ernestine. So she told me one time, she goes, you don't know how much I wanted to show up like that. I wanted to go in full head-to-toe costume and just stay in character for the whole red carpet. I remember thinking, by the way, that would have been a lot of hours of holding that pinch face. She's talked often about how physically painful it was to do Ernestine for long periods of time. Of course. I have to tell you the other regret she had about that night, because I love it. She actually said, when I lost, I wish I would have been dressed in character and I could have flipped the bird of the camera. I thought I invented that bit. Top, comma, carrot. Prop Master General, malign comic. You realize he's insanely rich, right? He may be a punchline to some comedians, but he couldn't be nicer. He couldn't be a more hardworking dude. And he always, like, kills when he performs. Um, When I first met him, by the way, his real name is Scott, he had really mastered the college circuit. And let me say, if the kids love you, you're golden. So while a lot of other comics were making fun of him, he was raking it in. I appreciate that ability to tune out the hate and just do your thing. But when I look at Carrot Top, there's something I can't help but see. It's not what you think. Back in the late 90s, I had a small role in a movie called Intern, which was filming in New York City. Not to be confused with The Intern, starring Robert De Niro, although I would have loved to be in that film. I love that Nancy Myers. Anyway, one day the girl who was doing my hair and makeup said to me, You're a comedian. Do you know Carrot Top? And I go, yeah, I know, Scott. And she goes, you want to hear the craziest thing? I went out with him a few times. So then I said to her, you know, you're actually not the first girl I've met who's dated him. I mean, Carrot Top, like, I go, I think he gets laid all the time. And then she said, I know. But I have to say, not only was he amazing in bed, but he has a giant, giant dick. (laughs) So when I hear people say stuff about Carrot Top and how he needs props to be funny and stuff, She continued, I thought, well, he didn't need a prop when I fucked him because he was amazing and he had a huge dick. Um, so yeah, rich and well-endowed haters. Yeah, chew on that. So I'm going to be honest. Now when I see Carrot Top, I just stare at his crotch. Trainer, comma, Megan. Bass, not treble. Millennial, singer. What would I do without my assistant, John? Whenever I'm in a celebrity-rich environment, I'm looking for legends. But he is smartly, rightly, and shrewdly steering me to get photographed with anybody, I don't know, under 80. At the Jingle Ball concert in Los Angeles, John pushed me toward Megan Trainer and said, Get a selfie with her. That's going to help you. <laughs> so I went up to her and told her about how I'd seen her perform live. And in an era of lip-syncing pop stars, I appreciated that her voice was amazing and congratulated her on having actual good old-fashioned talent. I said, you blew me away when you sang Like I'm Gonna Lose You with John Legend. And then Trainer uh, corrected me slightly, and she showed me she had a sassy sense of humor. She told me that it was actually her song that she let John Legend be featured on. Oh, I loved her. 
Have I mentioned that on that night she was wearing an adorable but ridiculous Mrs. Claus-like Christmas outfit that lit up? Yeah, I want to reiterate here, her outfit actually had battery-powered bulbs on it that lit up. You can look it up. iHeartRadio had her doing the, like, hey, are you having fun tonight interviews with all the various acts, like One Direction, Joe Jonas, etc. So obviously she was both star and employee that night, but we ended up hanging out a lot, partly because she had a female relative in tow. It was like her sister or cousin or whatever, who was obsessed with me. Great. God, by the way, I love when that happens with the kids. I really do. So I designated myself as Megan Trainer's fun and naughty Aunt Kathy. As the evening wore on, bulbs kept going out in her getup, but she had this great, like, whatever attitude that, you know, may have been influenced a little bit by her having a drinky or two, possibly. Anyway, we made her dressing room party central, and we had the best time. We just took like a thousand selfies. Um, we were just goofing off, basically. Don't tell Ren Seacrest, because we didn't let him in that night. Anyway, it meant that when I ran into her again not long after that, at this Hollywood Reporter-sponsored breakfast, um, we were seated next to each other at the same table. And it was so cute. She comes up to me and she goes, dude, I'm so glad to be next to you. Um, so I now know that dude is a millennial endearment. So instead of correcting her and saying, I'm a lady, I'm a pretty, pretty thin lady, I just went, me too, bro. We had fun then. I mean, I was pointing out the legends she didn't know. And of course, I had to tease her. I was like, there's a lady over there. Her name is Barbara Streisand, and she's been singing songs for a very long time. Trainer, dude, I know who that dude is. It was cute because a lot of people wanted to take pictures with her and... You know, I got to take the picture sometimes. The point is, I was starting to feel like I was maybe the pop culture mentor for young Ms. Trainer. It all culminated in her big Grammy win in 2016. She was very emotional during her acceptance speech, which was directed at her father in the audience. And so naturally, I had to immediately text her seconds later, congratulations on your Grammy, but please stop crying. You're embarrassing me. She immediately hits me back. Ha ha ha. Fuck you, Kathy. Ha ha. I love you. So when she's saying her famous, like, I'm going to lose you, she certainly can't be talking about me because I have proof that she loves me. Dude. Trump, comma, the Donald. President or loser? Pick one. This book went to press before the election. I'm I'm actually saying that with nervousness in my voice. All right, here's the deal. My relationship with... Donald Trump spans two decades, and it's completely shame-based. At least I'm ashamed. Here's the deal. When you've been in the game as long as I have, you just kind of end up rubbing elbows with everybody. I met Donald the first time when he was still married to Marla. I, uh, God, I sat next to him one time for hours at a Larry King birthday tribute celebration. I begrudgingly spent time with him on the set of uh, Apprentice um, when I happily supported my friend Joan Rivers in one of her challenges. And by the way, she went on to win the entire competition. I've had, you know, innocent run-ins with him. The reason I say innocent run-ins, because I honestly didn't know his character was what we have come to know now. Like, all the years I've known him, I just saw him as this over-the-top, fame-hungry, harmless blowhard. Like, I kind of saw him as an orange 80s and 90s version of, like, one of those dudes, like one of those fucking losers on Million Dollar Listing, right? You know how those guys, like, they look like they're doing something, but I don't think they really are. So that's how I think of him. But never in my wildest dreams did I think he would become the Republican nominee for president of the United States. So, in a story I've never told before, have I got a jaw dropper for you? Uh, okay. First of all, he wants you to call him the Donald, which I think is the weird. He's also one of those guys who, when he's asking a favor of you, acts like he's doing you a favor. Let me give you an example. All right, now this is my story and my story alone. So whether you're a fan of his, whatever side of the aisle you're on, you cannot deny that you're a little bit intrigued about the time I spent in a golf cart with Donald Trump and Liza Minnelli. All right, his, the team called me and asked if I would participate in the final challenge on a season of The Apprentice, which took place at one of his stupid golf courses in, like, Westchester or something. All right. Um, 
Does it sound, by the way, a little bit like the Donald was maybe using this as an opportunity to do a charitable deed while mostly promoting the Trump golf empire? Yeah, I think so, too. Anyway, oh, how I wish I could tell you I put the Donald in his place and told him to shove his non-paying offer that would only benefit his high-paying television show and shove it up his ass. Well, I can't. When I found out that I would be the host and the headliner would be the one and only Liza with a Z, well, I just blacked out and I found myself on a plane to New York because, damn it, it's Liza. Okay, so when the three of us were finally all together, he starts right in. Oh, he laid it on thick. It's going to be terrific. It's going to be huge. It'll be dynamite. This will be huge for you, too. And by the way, I love how he kept acting like it was going to help me and Liza. Okay, anyway. All right, um, I'm just me, but I'm pretty sure this isn't going to be the appearance that puts Liza over the top. You know, since she's already an EGOT and Sally Bowles and everything. All right, I don't know what he was thinking, but the Donald decided to hop in the driver's seat of his golf cart and put the Liza and the Kathy in the back seat for a whirlwind tour of his dumb golf course. Uh, Boy, he really knows two giant golf fans when he sees them. Liza, who looked terrified, held on to the railing of the golf cart for dear life because he's driving around way too fast. And then Liza's saying stuff to me like, honey, honey, he's going too fast. Honey, I'm getting the spins. And I'm starting back at him. I'm like, Donald, the Liza is getting the spins. Stop it. Slow down. Well, the Donald, who's like waving to all the famous golfers that are there, and he's really just showing us off. In particular, he's got freaking Liza in the back, right? So... He's, you know, talking about the design features of the green or something like we care. And he's like waving to a bunch of rich golf dudes like Liza cares, right? All right. I will say this, though. Um, oh, at one point, though, he wouldn't stop driving really fast. And um, he started saying to Liza and I, you know, if you gals ever want to come back, you know, I've got these great uh, casitas and uh, little... Uh, Cottages here you gals can stay at. So I have to get Liza ramped up, right? Because I can't resist. So then um, I say to Liza, you know, Liza, I think he thinks we're a couple. He keeps saying, like, if you gals want to come golf and if you gals want to, like, come stay here together. So Liza, of course, is like, oh, honey, oh, honey, that's, why does he think that? What is he talking about? So then I, of course, make it worse. So while the Donald is still not even listening to us, but just rambling on and on about us gals, I got to fan the fires and I'm like, Yeah, the Donald, we'd love that. You know, Liza and I, we've been together for a while. We do a lot of golf trips, fishing. You know, we can cock a tub. And Liza wanted to kill me. All right, so I will be honest, though. The Donald is what I call accidentally funny. So I um, admit that it was funny to me that he was inviting, like, Liza and me back to his golf course. I mean, you couldn't find two people less interested in playing even one hole of golf unless all the caddies were the chorus boys from Cats. Uh, Liza started actually looking queasy. I remember her distinctly saying, like, get us off this golf court. And then I remember saying, the Donald, she's got to sing the New York, the New York. So she's doing you a giant favor. You shouldn't be driving around Liza Minnelli in a golf cart. Oh, I left this part out. Uh, It was a hot day and Liza was in a sequined cashmere uh, jumpsuit. And I believe it was by Halston. You can look up the picture. The point is, he didn't get it. All right, hours later, when it was time for the actual performance, the Donald, the Liza, and I were alone in this small, curtained-off, de facto dressing room. That alone was magical, right? Here I am, a little girl from Forest Park, Illinois, and I'm with the great Liza Minnelli and then the orange birther. Anyway, it was my chance to see if the Donald had any, what I like to call, room awareness. Because one of my arguments about the Donald is, I, I really don't think he's a bright person. Like, I think there's, you know, he's delusional, but... You know, I know he went to Wharton for two years, but he is just smart at, like, being a con man, I think, because I really watched him closely every time I've seen him. He doesn't, like, pick up on things. He doesn't listen to anything. I'm thinking if you're going to be president, you want to have, like, uh, globe awareness. He didn't even have room awareness. So, anyway, uh, that's kind of one of my favorite people to put my act, by the way, especially if you're well-known. So, you know, check and check. Also, someone who lacks a sense of humor about themselves— or even has the ability to share a laugh during a fun moment, uh, he doesn't have that either. So that's, I guess that's three checks. 
Anyway, at one point, Liza's right next to me sitting in a folding chair and doing her own hair and makeup, and this little, like, shoddy table using one of those $10 drugstore mirrors that has, like, a light ring on it, right? So I turn to Trump and I go, Jesus the Donald, how cheap can you be not giving a living legend like Liza freaking Nelly, like a fancy Manhattan hair and makeup team? Why is she doing this herself? Okay, so that alone, nothing. So he gives me this stare like, whoa, this is not my problem, what? So I'm like, oh, for God's sake, the Donald. So then Liza jumps in and she goes, oh, honey, I don't mind doing my own hair and makeup. I like it. It it gets me in the zone. I'm more comfortable doing it myself. All right, so I had basically just written Donald off at this point because it was way more fun to just watch Liza Minnelli do her hair and makeup. And, you know, this is iconic makeup, right? Like, think about her with the lashes and the whole thing. So clearly she'd been doing this herself for years. And if it helped her get in the zone, I was happy to watch. In a small curtained room of three people, no amazing moment should go unnoticed by any party. Least of all, me and one who's trying to get elected to the Oval. Okay, he didn't own a shit. Anyway, get ready, here it comes. So Liza finishes doing her own hair and makeup. In, by the way, a way that had suggested to me that she had been doing this in backstages all over the world forever, right? Like, think about it. It's pretty cool. But her final step in the makeup application was something I'll never forget. And let me just say, you know I have something called the Liza Pass, which is she can do no wrong. And if she does something that is in any way uh, foreign to you, then I say she's right and you're wrong. Okay. So what happened was as follows. (laughs) I'll never forget it. So she's doing her makeup. And then the final step is she leans forward, she casually reaches for her black Sharpie marker, takes the cap off, puts her mole on, and then puts the cap back on, puts the marker down. What? (sighs) Yeah. Let me just say, um, I think that Liza should be like the face of Sharpie. So if anyone out there is listening who works for Sharpie Corporate, you know, you've got your new spokesperson. That aside, I foolishly thought that witnessing this moment together would in some way bond the Donald and I. So this has just happened, right? And I I look back at the Donald, and I whisper to him with this glint in my eye. I go, hey, psst, the Donald, did you see that? The Liza just used a Sharpie to put her freaking famous mole on. And we were here to, like, witness this together. Huh, buddy? Right? Nothing. No reaction. I don't know if he saw it. He didn't want, you know, he saw my lips moving but not talking, which is what I think he does with all women. He didn't notice it. He didn't get it. And let me just say, that reason alone is reason enough for him to never be president, congressman, on the PTA. That's it. That reason alone. If you don't get Liza in that moment, you don't deserve to be in the Oval. Get out! Almond, comma, Tracy. Comedy goddess, dame somebody, surprise roommate. I had to actually Google British phrases and British puns, so get ready. If you don't already worship Tracy Ullman, then off with your head. All right, let's review for you kids who only know Tracy from Robin Hood Men in Tights, shall we? The Tracy Ullman Show on Fox debuted and exposed to the world a little animated short you may have heard of called The Simpsons. Tracy Takes On was on HBO for four seasons, and she had a top 10 hit called They Don't Know, in which Sir Paul McCartney was in the music video. Uh, She had a breakout dramatic role in the Academy Award-nominated film Plenty, Um, By the way, this is when um, networks were still letting women have uh, comedy shows that weren't 12. Anywho, (laughs) there are so many credits and accomplishments that if you don't get it by now, then I'm going to get very Femi furious. All right, before I get to the main event, I must say for some reason in particular, this run-in just makes me giggle. Now, she and I ran into each other at the BAFTA Awards in Beverly Hills. BAFTAs are the British version of the Oscars and the Emmys, and they have events all over the world. So I innocently asked Tracy if she was living in L.A. full-time now or splitting her time between the U.K. and America. I was just trying to make small talk, but um, you know me. I'm also trying to lead up to a possible lunch. She had this mini outburst that was super adorable and not hostile, but for some reason it just tickles me. 
I have lived in America for decades, but no matter where I go, people ask me if I live here or England. I live in Los Angeles. She may have said Los Angeles. Fine, I thought, geez, I'll rent out the damn Hollywood Bowl so we can have lunch at a very Los Angeles location and nobody will ever ask you where you live again. P.S. Tracy currently has a new series called Tracy Ullman Show, which currently is on in the U.K., and um, I don't know where she tapes it, but it's probably very American on Capitol Hill in D.C. Anyway, back to the main event. I saw her somewhat recently at a sit-down party, and as usual, I was fangirling out a bit. As we were sharing the same table, I couldn't resist confirming a juicy rumor I had heard about her from one of her former staff writers. I blurted out, I gotta ask you, is it true that when Meryl Streep comes to L.A., she stays with you and your family at your house? Unlikely duo, you might be thinking? Well, apparently the two have been really good friends since they co-starred in the 1985 movie Plenty, and I wanted to find out from Tracy herself if this was true. And she confirmed it! God, I love when that happens! I just loved the idea that super prestigious, Oscar-winning Meryl Streep, out of all the big movie people she knows, connected most with the groundbreaking chick comic that when Meryl goes to L.A., she's not about staying at this fancy hotel or that fancy hotel, the four seasons, five seasons, or even the six seasons. I'm picturing Tracy, who has hilariously depicted everyone from Dame Judi Dench to Dame Maggie Smith, fluffing the pillows of her guest house in preparation for the arrival of Dame Meryl Streep. Come on, they're both so rich, they have to have their own pads all over the world, but I love imagining these two genius pals sitting around, shooting the shit, probably breaking out into hilarious impressions of people they know, trading stories about being powerful women in a not-so-kind-to-us industry. Wouldn't you want to be a fly on the wall in that living room when the wine is flowing and the husbands ain't around? I mean, how cool is that? And by the way, where's my Streepy? Hey, how can I get Jimmy Carter to be my Meryl Streep? And then years later, some young comedian comes up to me and goes, is it true that former President Jimmy Carter always stays at your house? And I say something like, you mean Uncle Jimmy? I can dream. Usher, comma, Usher. R&B, great. Bieber discoverer, bad. I met the R&B superstar when he was a teenager and just coming into his own as a triple threat, singing, acting, dancing. Remember, this guy could do it all. The Michael Jackson moves and when he was earning his chops and he later even became friends with his idol. Okay, I remember watching him rehearse at an award show and being super dazzled by his professionalism, talent. He also laughed one time when I introduced him at an award show by saying, ladies and gentlemen, Usher me down the aisle. Obviously, I'm a sucker for a guy who laughs at my jokes. When I see him now, my favorite thing to do is completely assault him for unleashing Justin Bieber, or as I like to say, Justine Bieber, on the civilized world in the way the Kardashians can be and should be blamed on Ryan Seacrest. Bieber is Usher's doing because it was Team Usher who saw the YouTube video that gave that precocious pipsqueak, oh God, remember the innocent days with the lesbian here. Anyway, Usher gave him his big break. I'll never forgive him. Bieber is his crime, and I will attest to that in a court of law when Usher someday goes on trial for it. Sure, it may happen in the deep recesses of a Canadian small claims court, but damn it, I'll be there. I just can't resist this kind of loving confrontation whenever I run into Usher. You know, you owe the country some sort of apology. It's not too late. A statement, a press conference, Oprah confession, whatever, cash will do too. I always love that ever since Bieber has you know, gone on and off the rails, including some not-so-generous words about his mentor, Usher has done, like, a very careful distancing act. That'll happen, by the way, when one's protege assaults people, commits acts of vandalism, I think there's some dick pics, and uh, writes about believers in the guest book at the Anne Frank house, you know, that he wishes Anne would have been a believer. Anyway, so it's only natural, I would say to Usher in public, hey, how's your big protege? Pissed in any buckets lately? Look it up. But his response is always professional. Ha ha ha! And then he's gone. It's as if he's always in a state of dancing away from me. And he knows by now, if he spots me coming, my opening line is not going to be, hey, when is your new album dropping? It's going to be, so, Bieber, and then poof. Seriously, every time I see him, it's as if he's airborne. 
Or he's Flojo in the bottom position, and when he sees me, he hears a gun go off, and then he's gone. I'm that member of the press with the microphone who says, Bieber, nice work. Any comment? See, I'm that constant for him that way. Look, he'll always be incredibly talented and wonderful and loving and great and an inspiration for all, except Chili. But you know what? Nobody's perfect. Ford made the Edsel. Steve Jobs started next. And luckily, Usher can still always scream, yeah, featuring Lil John and Ludacris. Valderrama, comma, Wilmer. Actor, relationship saint, still number one Levotic. I've run into the handsome actor over the years since he hit it big on that 70s show, but in the years since he started dating Debbie Lovato, and I've been dealing with the Lovatics, we've uh, kind of steered clear of each other. But at one event that was being hosted by Emilio Estefan, well, I couldn't resist. He didn't say a word to me, but I still routinely teased him. He was gentlemanly about it. This is, by the way, when they were still going out. He, you know, chuckled at my little jokes, but it's not like he wanted to hang out, right? That was obvious. Finally, I told Emilio that I was going to steal Wilmer's gift bag just to piss off his then-girlfriend, Debbie. While holding Wilmer's gift bag in my hand, Emilio Estefan said to me, why do you do stuff like this? And I said, why? I like to see what happens. It's called science. So anyway, I took Wilmer's gift bag, removed all the chocolates for myself, and put in a cocktail napkin from the event on which I wrote, Dear Wilmer, now you know what it's like to have spent the evening with a real star. Love, Kathy Griffin. I handed it back to him and I said, Look, I'm going to come clean. I stole your gift bag. I stole your chocolates. But uh, give the cocktail napkin note to your girlfriend, Debbie. I'm realistic. If I know Wilmer and his then-girlfriend, they would have scoured that bag, found my note, and smartly not followed through on my request. But I do kind of hope he followed through. Hashtag confident. Van Dyke, comma, Dick. Sitcom legend, rubber band man. I could really name this book Six Degrees of Suzanne Summers or Lance Bass. I've met so many people through them. Summers is how I met the illustrious Dick Van Dyke, everyone's favorite chimney sweep and Ottoman tripping dad. So Suzanne had a dinner party and had hired a jazz trio to perform since she knew Dick Van Dyke loves jazz. So you could tell he was having the time of his life with that music filling up the room. He seemed, well, he is just incredibly youthful and we were making small talk about comedy and music. I referenced the Dick Van Dyke show being honored somewhere and he said very quietly, yeah, they always wanna go down memory lane. Hmm. It's one of those life lessons. Like, I've learned from a lot of my legend friends, they're, like, not down with that. So I try to be careful now about who's into sort of embracing certain parts of their career and who is, like, not into that anymore. But it struck me that Dick is one of the legends who doesn't really want to be seen as a walking monument to nostalgia. I mean, he certainly doesn't act like someone who isn't vital. He's got, you know, the young wife. He's cheated death a few times. One time he was rescued by a pod of porpoises that nudged him to shore after he fell asleep on his surfboard. He, that happened. He also survived a car fire in, in his, like, Jaguar one time. I mean, that's the kind of thing that sounds like it happens to reckless teens. And Dick Van Dyke was in his 80s for both of those incidents. Look, he's a bundle of energy, and that was never more evident than when I hosted a star-filled award show in 2016 where Dick was being asked by... Brian Cranston to give him his Best Actor Award for Trumbo. Their mutual appreciation society goes back to when Brian appeared on Dick's show Diagnosis Murder. All right, I was backstage with Dick Van Dyke, who was getting ready for his appearance. And while we were talking, Thelma Houston had gone on stage to sing Don't Lead Me This Way. So Dick, who couldn't sit still, says to me, I can't help it. I got a disco dance. And let me tell you, even though he had just turned 90, he was still made of rubber. Everyone around us, my gay assistant, the hair and makeup people, the producers, the stage manager, oh, and Bette Midler, who was also backstage rehearsing her presentation, were all so charmed by Dick's force of nature vivacity. I'll bet every one of us is like secretly thinking, I'm going to be like that when I'm 90. When Thelma finished her song, there must have been a snafu somewhere or something, because suddenly the stage manager turns to me and says, Vamp! 
which means I needed to go out and entertain the crowd until whatever problem it was was fixed. So in a panic, I just went, Dick. By the way, he's a little on the deaf side. Dick! He looked up. I cricked my finger, like in the come here gesture. And this is why I love the legends. He just shuffled right on over and walked out with me. And by the way, believe me, I would never even attempt that with Taylor Swift or any of the seconds from Five Seconds of Summer. I mean, they would probably just ignore me or their posses and squads would glare at me. But no, the legends, they know not to keep an audience waiting. Now, Dick actually thought it was his time to present, which is fine. The point is, when I needed him, he didn't flinch. There was no team to check with, no, oh, I didn't get my water, I have to do my exercises, or even just a, who's bothering me? So I screamed at the producers to cue the Thelma Houston track, and I dragged Dick Van Dyke on stage to do a dance break and kill time. And that resulted in one of the most adorable moments of the evening. Immediately, a sea of cell phone cameras popped up as the room erupted in applause and appreciation. Everyone was commenting later on how sprightly Dick still looked and how game he was. I mean, it was so inspiring, truly, and touching. Later on, he went out to present to Brian Cranston, and the way he lauded Brian, I mean, you'd have thought Brian was the legend and Dick was the admiring younger fan. So I just love how strolling down memory lane isn't nearly as exciting to Dick Van Dyke as proclaiming something like, I can't help it, I got a disco dance. Well, I'm not going to stop him. Although maybe, just maybe, someone might need to take away the car keys. Just a thought. Vanderbilt, comma, Gloria, my other mom. Legit pedigree. Anderson handed his phone to me on one New Year's Eve and said, it's my mom. She wants to say hi. Uh, holy shit. So suddenly I was talking to the one and only Gloria Vanderbilt, famous heiress, fashion maven, artist, author, and one-time lover of Marlon Brando and Frank Sinatra. <sighs> okay. Her deep, moneyed voice was like gold in my ear. Kathy, it's Gloria. I think you and Anderson are hilarious. I mean, the things you say, they're just out there. I just adore you and would love to meet you one day. I said, Wednesday? I, I don't dick around. And that's what started our friendship. And I have to say, it's a genuine bond that doesn't necessarily include Anderson. Because he's frankly uh, traumatized by her. So I like to think that Glow and I, I call her Glow. I actually call her Glow Vandy. I like to think that Glow and I are the only two women who are able to get him curled up into a ball and pulling his hair out like he does when he's anxious. I take pride in that. Anytime I bring up his mom around him, he usually responds with this very low, ugh, muttered like an embarrassed 12-year-old, followed with an exasperated, oh, she can be so inappropriate. He loves to tell the story about how he had to proofread his mother's romance memoir and balked at her description of one gentleman suitor as being, and I quote, the Nijinsky of Cunnilingus. Well, who wouldn't want their mom saying that? Andy. All right, she's invited me to countless dinner parties with authors and artists, and she's even thrown two dinner parties in my honor, and they are glorious. When I leave at the end of the night, I firmly have faith again in the art of conversation. Oh, by the way, Anderson doesn't go to them, though. Ugh, my dinner party days with my mother are long over. Trust me. <sighs> Whatever, girl. The first time I visited her at her apartment, I naturally said, So, where are the jeans? She said, What are you talking about? I said, Well, I'm sure you have the jeans somewhere, the famous jeans, at least one in every color. She had to think about it. And then she said, no, I, I don't think I do. How about that? She doesn't live in the past, that glow. And yet my bucket list includes buying a pair of her classic Vanderbilt jeans somehow on eBay and sending them to her so she can make them in a dream box. Um, let me explain, you pervert. I didn't mean dream. Hold on. Okay. Glow puts together a plexiglass work of art that can be either a wall-mounted piece or a freestanding structure. She puts together various items that bring together a theme inside these boxes. 
She actually created one for me, and she asked me to send her all of my mementos, like a hand-printed menu, a dinner plate, the invite from my evenings with the royals and Joan Rivers in England. And she made me like this super cool dream box. So anyway, I knew we were going to be close the first time I went to one of her dinners. I was nervous about not being up enough on literature or art for the other guests. In other words, not being smart enough. And I tried to do my homework, but I felt a little bit like I was barely keeping my head above water. But then Glow turns to me at the dinner table, and she said in her inimitable way, I mean, everybody was talking about things literary, esoteric. Everybody's talking over my head, right? And I'm trying to keep up and not look like a dumbass. And then Glow turns to me and she goes, Kathy, what's going on with the low hands? Now, that's a host, all right? Giving each of their guests a chance to shine with his or her particular specialty. And by the way, even New York Times theater critic Ben Brantley got a little bit giddy at that and turned to me and said, what do you really think of Dina? She is the epitome of unforced elegance in her blunt cut bangs and casual chic. I mean, I'll just look at a choker she'll be wearing, and I swear to God, I'll be like, oh, I bet Lagerfeld gave her that. And then she'll say something like, actually, it was Scavulo. I mean, she's always been incredibly gracious to me whenever she's given her time, and she has given me truly invaluable advice. So I asked her for the secret of youth, and she said, curiosity. If you're always curious, that's the fountain of youth. You'll never feel old. Another time, we'd been talking about the benchmarks of her life, from the sculpting and painting to her fashion line to the novels and memoirs and all those men. She had a wild sexual encounter with Brando in a cloakroom. She had an affair with Howard Hughes. And then I said something like, well, how do you keep going? And I swear to God, she said something, and I always think of it, I live by it. And I loved when she said it. And she goes, well, there's always more, and you're never done. She said it almost as if I had asked like a really silly question. I love that. And I do try to live it. And she did clarify, by the way, she slept with hot Brando, not fat Brando. Walters, comma, Barbara. Newswoman, groundbreaker, killer shark. I have two versions of Barbara Walters in my mind. You get to decide which one is real and which one is fantasy, because God knows I can't even tell anymore. I have a genuine and warm fondness for her. My favorite quote of hers is when one time I complimented her on her hair, and she said to me, female newscasters don't get older, they get blondo. Now, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time around her, and I love to try to make her laugh. She's a very tough cookie, because she's had to be. In fact, in her final couple of years on The View, you may recall, she wouldn't even be on the panel every day. So I would tell the producers that I would only come on the show if it was a Barbara day. In fact, I am such a scholar of Barbara's that even in this entry of this book, I'm clearly buttering all of you up, including you, Barbara, because I know you're reading this, and I'm about to go in for the kill. I always assumed that when Diane Sawyer got her big TV interview with Caitlyn Jenner, Barbara Walters was just holed up in the dark in her Doris Duke apartment with a feather boa, eye mask, eating a gallon of ice cream. That's because Barbara still has the eye of the tiger. All right? She's still got it when it comes to competitiveness in this news business. She broke all the barriers. It's ingrained in her. I will always love her for that, even though she hates me. Although, can't you just hear her watching the Caitlin Diane Sawyer? Look at the way Diane doesn't even know how to ask her the why questions. I would have said to Caitlin, have you ever met Dolce or Gabbana? I could make the introduction. All right, this is all in my head. It didn't even happen. But I can hear her now. Whenever I greet her with, hi, Barbara, remember me? You've loathed me for years, and I love you every minute of those years. She loves to respond with that cool broadcaster tone of hers. Why do you do this to me every time, Kathy? You have this portrayal of me as if we don't get along. I think you're adorable. I always have. Oh, who is this young gentleman? Yeah, she hits on my boyfriend Randy and has been for five years. Oh, she always does this. She always goes, oh, is it Wendy? And then she goes so far as to take his hand in both of hers, which, you know, I assume is some old school girl's way of like, slipping a boy her number, and uh, 
Sometimes, by the way, I'll make Wandy empty his pockets because I'm pretty sure she did slip him a number, and I'm going to catch both of them. Now, granted, it's probably a very secured landline, but still, you know, I don't need her taking my man. She also brings her voice down to a very supple coo when her eyes are on, let's just say, my tiger. Oh, where did you get that wonderful suit, Wandy? You know you really have a build for a suit like that. And I have said to her on more than one occasion, back off, bitch. He's not Mort Zuckerman. Don't make me pop off. She just ignores me. She just keeps going. That's our shtick. I'm yelling at her. I mean, this happened one time at a Broadway theater. She's hitting on Randy. I'm yelling at her. And she just keeps going, it's a very nice suit on you. You know, what with your build. Anyway, I've known her for a long time now. And teasing her never gets old. She actually hates it for some reason when I follow her into the bathroom, which I used to do at The View, because it was a series of stalls open to everyone. One time she was actually leaving early when we had one more show to tape because The View does two shows on Thursday. So she said she had to leave early, even though I was doing the second show, because she had to go to the Oscar de la Renta fashion show. But I accused her of trying to get away from me. So I go into the bathroom at The View and I'm banging on her stall. I'm still here, Barbara. Why are you leaving? I could actually see her dress down around her ankles. And then she's yelling at me from behind the stall. It's Oscar's show. I have to go. And I go, you know what? I don't believe you. You think this is my first merry-go-round with you, lady? I'm checking online to see if there are photos of you really there. Go ahead. You will see me. I'll be in the front row. He's a very old friend. Um, Based on the fact that one of the quite high-level producers rushed into the ladies' room to rescue Barbara, I can almost imagine several staffers were just standing in the hall outside, sure that they were listening to, like, an old-timey catfight. And by the way, when I replay the scene in my head, it's eerily similar to the bathroom scene in Valley of the Dolls. And I admit, I do go back and forth on that one, deciding which one of us gets to be Neely O'Hara or Helen Lawson. Please submit your answers to www.kathygriffin.com. Williams, comma, Billy D. Malt liquor lover, actor, secret tailor. Who knew that there's a fabric store in Los Angeles called International Silks and Woolens? And no, I'm not a paid spokesperson. Where one can happen upon a coterie of celebrities on any given day. I was in the store filming a scene for my life on the D-list in early 2010 with Lauren Conrad. And the gag revolved around the Hills star showing me how to build a clothing empire. My director, Blake Webster, had seen someone who clearly brought out his heterosexual geek boy because he squealed in delight. Holy shit, you're not going to believe this, but Lando Calrissian is here. Who, I said? Billy D. Williams. And I said, you mean Brian Walker from Mahogany? The man who gave Tracy Chambers, beautifully played by Miss Diana Ross, a run for her money until she realized her money was no good without the true love that only Brian Walker could give her? That Billy D. Williams? Oh, and Dynasty? Sorry, space nerds. My references are better. Of course, uh, LC, by the way, didn't even know who he was. <laughs> but he walked over, and honestly, it was like a wondrous version of old school Depper. Perfectly coiffed, wavy hair, sporting a casual suit, and anchored by a full-on lame scarf. Very sparkly, with fringe, wrapped around his neck. If he'd had a can of Colt 45 in his hand... I might have been forgiven in thinking I'd stepped inside an actual television set in 1977. I mean, if he'd been wearing a cape, too, and he's rocked capes before, I may have fainted right then and there. Elsie probably thought some older gentlemen had followed me in the store, but I knew better. This was suave, smooth sex royalty of the they-don't-make-them-like-this-anymore variety. Then Billy D opened his mouth and that champagne baritone turned a fabric shop into a seduction chamber. Well, hello, young lady. What a treat it is to see such a humorous woman in person. May I have the pleasure of shaking your hand? Well, I looked around for the velvet-flocked wallpaper and round bed. Were the lights dimming? Is that Barry White song just in my head? Of course, then Blake had to come up to me and say, Billy Dee wouldn't sign a release to be in the episode. Damn. Win some, lose some. Well, I guess I didn't really win this charmer over this time. Well, once we had all caught our breaths, we were ready to get back to filming. And then, wait for it, Helen Mirren strode in. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I know her. You heard me. 
In fact, I met her in a quite fabulous way. She approached me at the Primetime Emmy Awards one time and volunteered that she thought my life on the D-list was hilarious. How about that? Okay, so Billy D is over there. Helen walks in, and Helen just turns to me. She goes, hello, Kathy. I go, hi, Helen. She had on a skirt and a blouse and was like scanning the aisles like she knew the place. I'll bet she even sews her own clothes, and they're probably fabulous. Oh, and Helen asks how my mom is. I find her so amusing, she said. And I said, hey, great. We're actually filming the D-list today. And she said, oh, you know, I love that show. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe Helen will be on it. So I, of course, asked her to sign a release so we could put her in the episode as a treat. And then she said, I'm sorry, dear, but I don't have any makeup on or my hair done. But it was great to see you. Oh, shit. So then I said to her, but guess who's here? Two aisles over. Billy D. Williams. And Helen Mirren goes, no, really? And I go, yeah, this place is like some crazy celebrity food court or something. Anyway, after our exchange, I went over to Elsie. Elsie turns to me and she goes, do I know that old lady from somewhere? Oh, boy. I felt like I was staring at a blank page before me. The rest is still unwritten. That's from the theme song to The Hills, if anyone doesn't get that. Extina. Aguilera, comma, Christina. Dirty burlesque, genie voice singer. Um, with certain divas, time is also a powerful decongestant. When I met the enormously talented Christina, who was in her first flush of genie in a bottle stardom, I was hosting the Billboard Awards at the MGM in Vegas, and she was frankly young and ridiculous. Okay, look, at a primetime award show like the Billboards back in the day, there were so many stars, backup dancers, and posses that shuttles were needed to ferry everyone between the MGM and their hotels. So no matter how famous you are, and I was the host, at some point you're just going to be on that shuttle and sitting next to, you know, a Backstreet Boy or a Lisa Loeb. Well, one time I was on the bus when Christina boarded. She had just finished her sound check, and I'll never forget her charging the entire length of a shuttle bus down the center aisle like it was, you know, effing Naomi Campbell doing a catwalk. Well, I thought it was funny, and nobody said a word. So I couldn't resist an opportunity to try to get a bus full of backup dancers to laugh. So she's doing this catwalk, and I just stop her in her tracks, and I go, it's a bus, honey! She stops and looks at me with this withering sneer that basically was like, ugh, is it talking? She probably had no idea who I was. And that's fine, because I thought it was funny. All right, over 10 years later, we had another exchange that indicated how much we'd both grown. Um, okay, one was at a Grammy nomination announcement event. So CBS turns these things into basically full-on televised concerts with a red carpet and everything. So fans can see their favorite singers perform and also find out who gets nominated. So I was doing the red carpet, and knowing I would run into Christina who I had seen off and on a little bit over the years, I actually did my homework, and I filed away in my brain that her kid's name is Max. So I see her on the red carpet, and when we have our exchange, there was none of that, like, artifice from when she was a teenager. You know, she was a working stiff pop icon, a star, a diva at that time, but with a much more mellow, like, been there, done that vibe. So I just see her. I go, hey, Christina, good to see you. Hey, Kathy, good to see you, too. I go, hey, I'm really hoping I get nominated for Best Comedy Album. Fingers crossed. She goes, oh, I hope you do. I'm pulling for you. I go, hey, how's Max? She goes, good. Pause. She goes, this is all on the red carpet. She goes, you don't really care about my kid, do you? I said, no, I just looked it up before I got here. And she laughed. Yes. The look on her face was priceless. The bus sneer had transformed over the years into a knowing, kind of between us smirk. And it was really sort of touching. She realized now, you know, she's a mom, that household name, a music fixture. She can laugh at the annoying, hilarious redhead. She's got nothing to lose. Look, I think when you're young and you're going places, maybe you believe you have to keep up the act every second. I don't know. But what I've learned is the real stars know how to turn that diva thing into a talent that excites the atmosphere rather than like makes it weird or poisons it. <laughs> anyway, my shtick with her now is that whenever I see her at a dinner party or any kind of a non-performance event, I love to go up to her and I love to just say, here's the thing. I don't want you to sing tonight. Okay, nobody here does. But if you feel like you have to trot out Jeannie in a bottle, I mean, I'll, I'm going to give you the pity clap. And she just laughs. That's all I ask. Triple X adult star Jeremy, comma, Ron. Human Plow, dear, dear friend. 
I first met porn legend Ron Jeremy in the 90s on a public access show called Colin's Sleazy Friends, which featured a friend of mine, Colin Malone, and he would interview porn stars. And then he would um, have an occasional comedian on hand as well, like Margaret Cho did it, Jeannie Garofalo, so of course I did it. During my appearance, I tried to change Ron's mind um, about his entire industry, which, by the way, I still refuse to believe is an elective one for the women involved. You know, anyway, I didn't really change his mind. Ron probably had to shoot later on that day, for all I know. But look, the point is, I was tough on him. Tougher than any vagina has ever been. I would say things to him like, um, I have a question. How many times have you guys had to stop filming because one of your female co-stars, who's probably an incest survivor with a really tragic childhood beyond anything you can imagine, you filthy pig, has broken down into tears and she couldn't even stop crying? I bet that's happened a lot, huh? I bet that happens a lot, don't you? But you don't think about that part. These young women are human beings. You will never convince me that these women have won in life in any way or that they make more money than their male counterparts and therefore, oh, they're the ones in charge. Something like that. Once again, I was behaving perfectly appropriately for a comedically driven public access talk show with at least tens of viewers. Well, I noticed that Ron had to catch his breath in kind of that, oh boy, we got a live one here way. But the way he bit back at my criticism told me that Ron, at heart, is really a frustrated comedian, even if he does tell like really hokey, Henny Youngman type of one liners. And Sometimes I've known him to do his own rim shots. Trust me, Ron has at least 20 of those rim shot jokes he can insert right here. Oh God, he probably has 20 like insert jokes as well. Anyway, the point is he loves the funny. He's really nice. And because of that, believe it or not, we're pals. We hit it off. We've hung out many times and we've even appeared in a Foo Fighters video together. I've always enjoyed his company. And let me just add, while it's hard to believe any woman ever let him and his penis near her, Ron remains maybe one of the most recognized celebrities I have ever appeared with in public. Everybody knows him. One time we were doing a scene for My Life on the D-List, we were walking down Hollywood Boulevard together. And, you know, I've worked with many celebrities and I've even, whatever, had dinner or something. I don't think I've ever walked down the street with a famous person that more people recognized. Like, I mean, homeless people, uh, the people dressed in costume on Hollywood Boulevard, foreign tourist families. Everybody knew Ron. Uh, I'll tell you who didn't know who he was, my dad. Yeah. All right. One year, I put out the word to friends that I was hosting a, quote, orphan Thanksgiving, and Ron said he would love to come. So he brought one of his uh, lady friends from uh, his job, and she was sporting some kind of heavy emo makeup, a biker jacket, and a vibe that... uh, told me for her that voting was maybe a very recently acquired right. He also brought that guy Dennis Hoff, the bald bordello mogul from HBO's Cat House. He's the one, by the way, who had to recently deal with um, Lamar Odom in a way that Chloe never really has. It's, it's on tape. Anyway, it was a great Thanksgiving. It was a real mix of celebrities and civilians, which I love even though Ron was kind of pushing it with his plus ones. At a certain point, the gregarious and late and missed every day, my dad, John Griffin, was carving off a piece of turkey when he casually said, so Ron, what line of work you in? Ron goes, I do films. My dad replied, oh, that's terrific. How long have you been doing films? Ron said, as a matter of fact, I've done over 2,000 films. My dad gave back a, oh, good for you, that is... Quite an impressive body of work in a very competitive industry. Have you ever attended one of those large film festivals, such as Cannes or Sundance? Ron really knew how to play this game. Yes, Mr. Griffin, I have actually attended several film festivals. And then I pivoted and just turned to another guest. And till the day my father passed away, he thought Ron Jeremy was my friend in the film industry. Which, by the way, is true. Yankovic, comma, Weird Al. Parodist? Accordionist? Great perm. I have great respect for guys who not only stay in their lane, but also keep rolling strikes. Weird Al's kind of like that. I'm not 
limiting him. I'm trying to say he has carved out a very successful niche for himself in the worlds of comedy and music. Um, the look's mostly the same, save the missing mustache and glasses from the early 80s days. The parodies keep coming. And then he puts out an album in 2014 that becomes the first comedy album to hit number one on the Billboard charts since the 60s. Then he wins a Grammy for it. He has four, by the way, and he's been nominated countless times over the years. That's somebody who's built a brand and maintained it with care. I find it especially funny that he's outlasted some of the artists he's actually parodied. I'm looking at you, Gerardo, Tiffany, and DeBarge. He's also incredibly nice. We were once both Grammy nominated the same year, and at the ceremony, he actually said to me, I swear I want you to win. I've already won. Uh, nobody ever says that. He's also one of those funny guys who exudes sweetness also and doesn't seem tortured on the inside. And believe me, he's been through some really heavy stuff. One thing that's always stuck with me was something you may not be aware of. This man has suffered real tragedy. In 2004, his parents were found dead in their home, the victims of accidental carbon monoxide poisoning from their fireplace. Several hours after his wife notified him of his parents' passing, Yankovic went on with his concert that night saying, quote, since my music had helped many of my fans through tough times, maybe it will work for me as well. And he also said that doing the show that night would at least give him a break from sobbing all the time. So some of you may know that I too took the stage very soon after my father's passing for the very same reason. A lot of comics look at him maybe with the sense like, oh, what he's doing is like too specialized or it's not connected to them. But when I think about the time and effort it takes to pick the right songs to parody and then get the permission from the artist, he doesn't really have to, I don't think, under fair use laws, but he does, to maintain good relationships in the whole music world and then find the right tone, riffing on it. I mean, I think he's got to be like one of the smartest entertainers out there. His family Christmas cards, by the way, are just so classically silly and yet somehow heartfelt that they just put the easiest smile on my face. One of them was this oversized photo of his dog looking at a tiny slow globe with the Yankovics floating around merrily. Come on, you fucking cynics. Admit it. That's adorable. And I don't know, maybe I feel kinship with him because our humor involves what celebrities do. In this case, their art. and In my case, their behavioral patterns. When a Michael Jackson or a Madonna claims that they find the parody funny, Lady Gaga called it a rite of passage to be spoofed by Weird Al when he did uh, perform this way. It's probably as gratifying for him as when the people I make fun of turn out to be like good sports about it. So to me, comedy needs the Weird Al's to help us all remember that everyone needs to lighten up. I use profanity. He uses polka. But we're in the same racket. Zellweger, Renee, Academy Award winner, A Friendship Evolution, oh, Bridget Jones. Lay off my pal Zellweger. You heard me. Okay, you may know that in the past I may have referred to her um, maybe one time as a sweaty, puffy cocor. And after that, she sent me flowers with a card that simply said, best wishes. But you know what? That doesn't mean we're not friends now, you weirdo. Enough time has passed so that she actually laughs at my jokes. We talk on the phone. She lets me call her Bridget, even though I think her official name is still Renee. Don't you get it, people? In my act, I'm a celebrity flip-flopper. One day I'm making fun of the best and the brightest. Then I just kind of change my mind. Happens all the time. Well, I've always been a fan of Renee's work, of course. And when I saw a paparazzi picture of her, by the way, sitting in an airport reading a Jimmy Carter book... Well, I thought I might have to fall in love with her now. Um, another time, she was on Oprah and blushing over the story that Hugh Grant was telling about her and Jack White. And um, then a weird feeling in me emerged. Was I developing a protective feeling for Zellweger? Okay. A few years ago, I was scheduled to participate in a children's charity event in San Francisco. A great organization called Painted Turtle. It was actually started by Paul Newman. And they said to me, so you're sharing a dressing room with Annette Benning, Amber Riley, and Renee Zellweger. I gulped back, um, wait, what was the uh, last name? I had ample time to prepare for our dressing room hello, and yet 
I was still a little intrigued because this was weeks after that super unflattering photo of Zellweger had gotten out that appeared to show a very changed face. Okay, as I am someone who's had a bit of experience with changed faces, I wanted to take a good hard look at her. Well, the moment arrived, I walked in, looked right at her, and I thought, uh, she's gorgeous. In fact, she didn't even resemble that unflattering photo at all that had been making the rounds online. She didn't just look beautiful, and you know I would not say this lightly, she actually looked like she hadn't even had any work done. Go figure. Whatever she had done was like a hundredth of what people thought. After spending the day with her, I quickly realized she's super smart, she's a great laugher, and she actually seemed to understand I was just a comic doing my job. So that was probably helped when I said to her, uh, look, Zellweger, I'm not guaranteeing you'll ever be out of my act because we're buds now, but, you know, you have to take it because I'm just a comic doing my job. Sometimes you have to be really literal with these A-listers. So we become texting buddies, and we talk on the phone occasionally. I'm proud of this because it's rare that someone I have given a hard time to in my act actually gets over it. I was especially excited one night when, in the middle of a live performance— I happened to bring my actual phone on stage with me for this bit that I was going to do. So I'm on stage doing, I can't remember where I was, but let's say I was in front of 2,000 people during the show. And by the way, I almost never bring my phone on stage with me. I get a voicemail from my new bestie, Academy Award winner Renee Zellweger. So without even screening it, I tell the audience, oh my gosh, Zellweger is so in love with me. She's like calling me constantly. So I go, let's listen in. The audience goes crazy. I put it on speaker, I held the phone up to the microphone, and told the audience we should all just listen to this voicemail from Bridget Jones together. This was my moment to prove to thousands of audience members that I am such a pro. I am able to walk the high wire act to furiously make fun of whomever I like and yet still garner the love and friendship of those very people. God love Renee. I mean, not only... <laughs> was her message to me hilarious. But, and you know, this is why she's got those awards. She even delivered it in like this Meryl Streep level, really thick foreign accent. Oh my God, it was priceless. The audience loved it. They ate it up. They roared with laughter, hearing Renee in character. The message was so funny. It was like, I'm going to do a bad Renee doing whatever accent, but it was like, hello, um, I know who you are. You keep text me. And then I think you got wrong number. Please don't call this number again. Don't text me. Okay, please. Thank you. And God bless you. Bye. I mean, come on. Is she good or what? I must have played this voicemail for at least like my next 10 shows, you know, because I, I, that's some good shit. So anyway, I get off the road for two seconds and I'm thinking I got to call her and thank her. So um, days later, my assistant handed me his work phone and told me that Renee was on the line. You know, I'm used to it. A lot of celebrities calling me night and day. So anyway, um, I congratulated her on figuring out a new and exciting way to get into my act without me making fun of her. She was giggling. You know, I couldn't wait to tell her about what a big hit the message was. And I also said, look, that's no easy thing to get into my act, but have it go your way. And I asked her, you know, what it's like to be in my act, knowing that her awesome voicemail gets, like, uproarious laughter every show. And yet, I don't have to say anything bad about her. I just get to play her message, and everyone loves it. She laughed again. And then she informed me that the voicemail wasn't from her. What? Yeah. This whole time, I thought I'd been texting and leaving messages for my new bestie, Bridget Jones. It turns out my assistant had her real number. My assistant. And they've been communicating and, like, getting a friendship going. And I apparently have been reaching out to some poor woman who had probably just escaped the oppression of some Eastern Bloc dictator. I'm not kidding. Uh, I did my hilarious in-character voicemail from the supposedly real live Bridget Jones bit for thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands. Naturally, I immediately blamed Zelliger. She laughed so hard, I knew deep down inside she realized there was a little karma going on there, you know, from the old days. Anyway, she actually said, I wish I was that committed to come up with a character and call you like that. She said, but I think you should just keep playing it. I mean, I'll play along. I love it. And so you should, Bridge. 
Zivon, comma, Warren. Musician, Werewolf of London, Excitable Boy. In 1999, singer-songwriter Warren Zevon was a guest star on Suddenly Susan. <laughs> he was on for an episode playing himself alongside fellow guest star Rick Springfield. And it was weird and wonderful and inspiring. Um, by the way, my beloved millennial assistant John admitted he didn't even know who Warren Zevon was. So if you need a sec to go Google him, you know, go ahead. I'll wait. Anyway, that was three years before he was diagnosed with the cancer that would very quickly take his life. And his diagnosis led to um, a special hour-long Letterman appearance in which he was the only guest. And it made for like a shattering public goodbye because he and Letterman were buddies. It was a whole thing. Okay. So anyway, what I remember about him from his time on Suddenly Susan is that he was one of the rare musical icons who was naturally really, really funny. Um, he brought his guitar to set every day. I remember during a rehearsal one time um, watching him just sit on like one of the set sofas singing Lawyers, Guns, and Money. <laughs> his sense of humor was incredibly wry, and I just thought, I just want to hang out with this guy as long as I can. This guy is freaking funny, and I just, you know, like he had that thing where you want to be around him. So I think he really just took the gig for fun because he didn't uh, really seem to know Brooke Shields or Rick Springfield or anything. <laughs> and it wasn't as if he um, was some professed fan of workplace sitcoms starring Calvin Klein models. Oh, who cares? He might have thought it was a new experience, just worth checking out. I also wondered if this was one of those situations where four other well-known musicians like maybe turned down the gig, and then we luckily ended up with somebody really, really great instead of somebody like more famous. That would happen sometimes. It did lend a strangeness to his scenes because his humor was delightfully dry. And though he delivered his lines with professionalism and superb timing, I also detected in his respectfulness a belief that he was in a comedic environment that wasn't like totally in his wheelhouse. <laughs> anyway, during the tapings, he joked around with the audience between takes, which I'm sure for, you know, the 10% of them who knew who he was, really loved it. And it was definitely a great experience that they're going to all remember. Like, my brother Gary was a giant Warren Zevon fan. So the people that got him really, really got him. Now, a lot of musicians, you know, they don't bring the guitar. They don't want to sing the song. They don't want to be bothered. But he really was the perfect guest. I mean, he did the work. He made friends. He wasn't demanding. He made us all laugh. And it taught me a lesson. On Suddenly Susan, I was incredibly happy to have that job. And yet, I knew that on Saturday nights, I could go to a theater somewhere in America or somewhere and really say what I wanted and be completely uncensored. I felt as if Warren Zevon was kind of in that frame of mind. You know, instead of acting like, oh, he had better things to do or complaining that nobody got him, his vibe was more like, eh, life is short. Let's do something fun. You know, let's do something off the grid and be silly and have fun. So, I always thought about that because considering the incredible grace and dignity and artistry he brought to living the last year of his life, it's a memory I will always cherish and a life lesson. So keep him in your heart for a while. <laughs>